Book 3 1. The Lord Balerion On a day of September of the year of our Lord 1409, a dust-laden horseman clattered into the courtyard of a palace near the Bridge of the Trinity in Florence, and announced himself a courier with letters for the noble Lord Balerion. He was consigned by a man-at-arms to an usher, by the usher to a chamberlain, and by the chamberlain to a slim young secretary. From this you will gather that access to the Lord Balerion was no longer a rough-and-ready business, and, from this again, that he had travelled far since detaching himself from the Lord Ficino Cain a year ago. At the head of the condotta which he had raised, he had fought in the course of that year a half-score of engagements, now in this service, now in that, and in all but one he had won easy triumphs. Even his single failure, which was at Veruno in the pay of the Estes of Ferrara, was such as to enhance his reputation. Forced by overwhelming numbers to admit defeat, yet by sheer skill he had baffled the great Pandolfo's attempt to surround him, and had brought off his condotta with such little loss that Pandolfo's victory was a barren one. His condotta, now known as the Company of the White Dog, from the device he had adopted, had grown to the number of twelve hundred men, with a heavy preponderance of infantry, his handling of which was giving the other great captains of Italy food for thought. In fame he was the rival of Piccinino, almost the rival of Sforza himself, under whose banner he had served in the war against his old opponent Buonterzo. And Fra Serafino di Imola tells us unequivocally in his chronicle that the ambush in which Buonterzo ended his turbulent life in March of that year was of Balerian's planning. Since then he had continued in the service of the Florentine Republic at a monthly stipend which had gradually been raised with the growth of his condotta to 20,000 gold florins. Like all famous men, he was not without detractors. He was charged with a cold ruthlessness, which brought, it was claimed, an added horror into warfare, shocking adversaries, as it had shocked Buonterzo on the Trebia, into ordering that no quarter should be given. So opposed, indeed, was this ruthlessness to the accepted canons of Italian warfare, that it was said Balerion could enlist only Swiss mercenaries who notoriously were not queasy in these matters. The probable truth, however, is that he employed only Swiss because they were the best infantry in the world, and further so as to achieve in his following a solidarity and cohesion not to be found in other companies, made up of a medley of nationalities. Lastly he was found lacking in those spectacular qualities of leadership, in that personal knightly prowess by which such men as Carmagnola took the eye. Never once had he led a charge, stimulating his followers by his own heroical example, never had he taken part in an escalade, or even been seen at work in a melee. At Sabriso, where he had routed the revolted Pisans, it was said that he had never left the neighbourhood of his tent and never mounted his horse until the engagement was all but over. Hence, whilst his extraordinary strategic talents were duly respected, it began to be put about that he was lacking in personal courage. Careless of criticism, he had pursued the course he prescribed himself, gathering laurels as he went. On those laurels he was momentarily resting in the city of the lilies when that courier rode into the courtyard of his palace with letters from the Count of Byandrate. The Lord Balerion, as men now called this leader grown out of the erstwhile nameless waif, in a pleated full-sleeved tunic of purple satin gripped about his loins by a golden girdle and with a massive chain of gold about his neck, stood in a window embrasure to decipher the crabbed untidy characters, indicted from Alessandria on the feast of Saint Antony. My dear son, Ficino wrote, I need you. So come to me at once with every man that you can bring. The Duke has called in the French. Boussacourt is in Milan with six thousand men, and has been appointed ducal governor. Unless I strike quickly before I am myself stricken, Milan will be made a fief of France and the purblind duke a vassal of the French king. It is the duke's subjects themselves who summon me. The gout, from which I have been free for months, is troubling me again infernally. It always seizes me just when I most need my strength. Send me word by the bearer of these that you follow at speed. Valerian lowered the letter and gazed out across the spacious sunlit courtyard. There was a ghost of a smile on his bronzed face, which had gained in strength and virility during the year that was sped. He was faintly, 
disdainfully amused at the plight into which John Maria's evil blundering must have placed him before he could take the desperate step of calling in the French. The Molotesta domination had not been long-lived. Their Guelphic grip had been ruthlessly crushing the city, where every office, even that of Podesta, was given into the hands of Guelphs. And that same grip had been crushing the Duke himself, who discovered belatedly that, in throwing off the yoke of Ficino for that of the Molotesta, he had exchanged King Log for King Stork. Then, in his shifty, vacillating way, he sent ambassadors to beg Ficino to return. But the ambassadors fell into the hands of the Molotesta spies, and the Duke was constrained to shut himself up in the fortress of Porta Giovia to evade their fury. Whereupon the Molotesta had drawn off to Brescia, which they seized, Pandolfo loudly boasting that he would not rest until he was Duke of Milan, so that John Maria Visconti should pay the price of breaking faith with him. Terror now drove the Duke to lengths of viciousness and inhumanity unprecedented even in his own vile career. Issuing from the castle of Porta Giovia to return to his palace so soon as the immediate menace was removed, he found himself beset by crowds of his unfortunate people, distracted by the general paralysis of industry and menaced by famine. Piteously they clamoured about him. Peace, Lord Duke, peace. Give us Ficino for our governor, and give us peace. Peace, Lord Duke, peace. His fair face grimly set, his bulging eyes glaring venomously, he had ridden ahead with his escort, closing his ears to their cries, and more than one unfortunate was trampled under the horse's hooves as they passed on. But the cries continuing, that evil boy suddenly reigned in his bravely caparisoned charger. You want peace, you dogs. You'll deafen me with hellcat cries of peace. What peace do you give me, you filthy rabble? But you shall have peace. Oho! You shall have it. He stood in his stirrups, and swung round to his captain. Ho, there, you! His face was inflamed with fury, a wicked mockery, and evil mirth hung about his swollen purple lips. So terrible, indeed, was his aspect that Della Torre, who rode beside him, ventured to set upon his arm a restraining hand. But the duke flung the hand off, snarling like a dog at his elderly mentor. He backed his horse until he was thigh to thigh with his captain. Give them what they ask for, he commanded. Clear me away through this dung heap. Use your lances. Give them the peace they want. A great cry arose from those who stood nearest, held there by the press behind. Lord Duke! Lord Duke! they wailed. And he laughed at them, laughed aloud in maniacal mockery, in maniacal anticipation of the gratification of his unutterable bloodlust. On! On! he commanded. They are impatient for peace. But the captain of his guard, a gentleman of family, Bettino Mantegazza, sat his horse appalled, and issued no such order as he was bidden. Lord Duke he began, but got no further, for the Duke, catching the appealing note in his voice, seeing the horror in his eyes, suddenly crashed his iron glove into the young man's face. God's blood! Will you stay to argue when I command? Mantegazza reeled under that cruel blow, and with blood suffusing his broken face would have fallen but that one of his men caught and supported him in the saddle. The duke laughed to see what he had done, and took command himself. Into them. Charge, he commanded in a shout on which his voice shrilled up and cracked. And the Bavarian mercenaries who composed the guard, to whom the Milanese were of no account and all civilians contemptible, lowered their lances and charged as they were bidden. Two hundred of those poor wretches found in death the peace for which they clamoured. The others fled in panic, and the duke rode on to the broletto through streets which terror had emptied. That night he issued an edict forbidding under pain of death the utterance of the word peace in his city of Milan. Even from the mass must that accursed word be expunged. If they had not also clamoured for Ficino, it is probable that to Ficino fresh ambassadors would have been sent to invite him to return. But the duke would have men know that he was duke, that he was not to be coerced by the wishes of his subjects, and so, out of perversity so blind that it took no account of the pit he might be digging for himself, the duke invited Boucicault to Milan. When Boucicault made haste to answer, 
then the appeal to Ficino which should have gone from the duke went, instead, from the duke's despairing subjects. Hence Ficino's present summons to Balerion. There was no hesitation in Balerion's mind and fortunately no obstacle in his present employment. His agreement with the Florentine Republic had been determined in the last few days. Its renewal was at present under consideration. He went at once to take his leave of the seniory, and, four days ahead of his army, he was in Alessandria being affectionately embraced by Ficino. He arrived at the very moment at which, in council with his captains and his ally the Marquis Theodore, who had come over from Vercelli, Ficino was finally determining the course of action. I planned in the sure belief that you would come, bringing at least a thousand men. I bring twelve hundred, all of them well seasoned. Good lad, good lad. Ficino patted his shoulder. Come you in and let them hear it from you. Leaning heavily upon Balerion's arm, for the gout was troubling him, he led his adoptive son up that winding stone staircase which Balerion so well remembered ascending on that morning when, as a muleteer, he went to fool Vignate. So Master Theodore is here, said Balerion. And glad to come. He's been restive in Vercelli, constantly plaguing me to place him in possession of Genoa. But I've held him off. I do not trust Master Theodore sufficiently to do all my part before he has done any of his. A sly fox that and an unscrupulous. And the young Marquis? Balerion inquired. Ficino laughed. You will not recognize him, he has grown so demure and staid. He thinks of entering holy orders. He'll yet come to be a man. Balerion stared. That he was well your letters told me. But this. How did you accomplish it? By driving out his tutor and the others who came with him. A foul crew. He paused on the stairs. I took their measure at a glance, and I had your hint. When one night Fenestrella and the tutor made the boy drunk and themselves drunk with him, I sent them back to Theodore with a letter in which I invited him to deal with them as their abuse of trust deserved. I dismissed at the same time the physician and the body servants, and I informed Theodore that I would place about the Marquis in future none but persons whom I could trust. Perforce he must write to thank me. What else could he do? You laugh. Faith, it's laughable enough. I laughed, too, which didn't prevent me from being watchful. They resumed the ascent, and Balerion expressed the hope that the Lady Beatrice was well. Common courtesy demanded that he should conquer his reluctance to name her to Ficino. He was answered that she was at Casole, Ficino having removed her thither lest Alessandria should come to be besieged. Thus they came to the chamber where the council sat today. It was the same stone chamber with its vaulted ceiling and Gothic windows open to the sky in which Vignate had given audience to Bellarion. But it was no longer as bare as when the austere tyrant of Lodi had inhabited it. The walls were hung with arras, and rich furnishings had been introduced by the more sybaritic Ficino. About the long oaken table sat five men, four of whom now rose. The one who remained seated, as if in assertion of his rank, was the regent of Montferrat. To the newcomer's bow he returned a short nod. Ah! The Lord Bellarion! His tone was languid, and Ficino fancied that he sneered. Wherefore he made haste to snap, and he brings twelve hundred men to the enterprise, my lord. That should ensure him a welcome, the regent admitted, but without cordiality. He seemed, Bellarion observed, out of humour and disgruntled, shorn of his habitual suavity. The others came forward to greet Bellarion. First the magnificent Carmagnola, taking the eyes ever by the splendour of his raiment, the dignity of his carriage, and the poise of his handsome fair head. He was more cordial than Bellarion had yet known him. But there was something of patronage, of tutorial commendation in his congratulatory allusions to Bellarion's achievements in the field. He may yet be as great a soldier as yourself, Francesco, Ficino growled, as he sagged into the chair at the table's head to ease his leg. Missing the irony, Carmagnola bowed. You'll make me vain, my lord. My god, said Ficino. K. 
came the brawny, bearded, red-faced Königshofen, grinning honest welcome and taking Balerion's hand in a grip that almost hurt. Then followed the swarthy, mercurial little Piedmontese captain, Gisone Trotter, and lastly there was a slight, graceful, sober, self-contained boy in whom Balerion might have failed to recognize the John Giacomo Paleologo of a year ago but for the increased likeness he bore to the Princess Valeria. So strong was that likeness grown that Balerion was conscious of a thrill as he met the solemn, searching gaze of those dark and rather wistful eyes. Place at the table was found for Balerion, and he was informed of the situation and of the resolve which had been all but reached. With his own twelve hundred, and with three thousand men that Montferrat would send after leaving a sufficient force to garrison Vercelli, Ficino could put eight thousand men into the field, which should be ample for the undertaking. They were well mounted and well equipped, the equipment including a dozen cannon of three hundred pounds apiece and ten bombards throwing balls of two hundred pounds. And the plan of campaign? Balerion asked. It was expounded to him. It was extremely simple. They were to march on Milan and reduce it. All was in readiness, as he would have seen for himself, for as he rode into Alessandria he had come through the great encampment under the walls, where the army awaited the order to march. When Ficino had done, Valerian considered a moment before speaking. There is an alternative, he said, at last, which you may not have considered. Boussicourt is grasping more than he can hold. To occupy Milan, whose people are hostile to a French domination, he has drawn all his troops from Genoa, where he has made himself detested by his excessive rigours. You are confusing the issues here. You plan under the persuasion that Milan is the enemy, whereas the only real adversary is Boussicult. To cover himself at one point, he has uncovered at another. Why aim your blow at his heart which is protected by his shield? when you may aim it at his head which is unguarded by so much as a helmet. They made him no answer save with their eyes which urged that he, himself, should answer the question he propounded. March, then, not on Milan, but on Genoa, which he has so foolishly left open to attack a folly for which he may have to answer to his master, the King of France. The Genos themselves will offer no resistance, and you may take possession of the city almost without a blow. Approval came warm and eagerly from the Marquis Theodore, to be cut short by Ficino. Wait, wait, he rasped. The notion of Theodore's ambitions being entirely gratified before Theodore should have carried out any of his own part of the bargain was not at all in accordance with Ficino's views. How shall the possession of Genoa bring us to Milan? It will bring Boussicourt to Genoa. Balerion answered. It will draw him from his stronghold into the open, and his strength will be reduced by the fact that he must leave some force behind to keep the Milanese in subjection during his absence. So strategically sound did the plan appear to Ficino upon consideration that it overcame his reluctance to place the regent of Montferrat at this stage in possession of Genoa. That reluctance he afterwards expressed to Balerion, when they were alone. You do it, not for Theodore, but for yourself, he was answered. As for Theodore, Balerion smiled quietly, you need not grudge him any advantages. They will prove very transient. Payday will come for him. Ficino looked sharply at his adoptive son. Why, boy, said he, at last, in a voice of wonder. What is there between you and Theodore of Montferrat? Only my knowledge that he's a scoundrel. If you mean to make yourself the scourge of scoundrels you'll be busy in Italy. Why, it's sheer knight errantry. You may call it that, said Balerion, and became thoughtful. 2. The Battle of Novi The rest of this affair, this campaign against the too ambitious vicar of the King of France, is a matter of history, which you may read in the chronicles of Messer Corio and elsewhere. With a powerful army numbering close upon 12,000 men, Ficino descended upon Genoa, which surrendered without a blow. At first there was alarm at the advance of so large an army. The fear of pillage with its attendant violence ran through the Genos, who took the precaution of sending their women and their valuables to the ships in the harbour. Then the representatives of the people went out to meet Ficino, 
and to assure him that they would welcome him and the deliverance from the French yoke provided that he would not bring his troops into the city. The only purpose for which I could wish to do so, Ficino answered from the litter to which he was confined by the gout, grown worse since he had left Alessandria, would be to enforce the rightful claims of the Marquis of Montferrat. But if you will take him for your prince, my army need advance no nearer. On the contrary, I will withdraw it towards Novi to make of it a shield against the wrath of the Marshal Boussacourt when he returns. And so it befell that, attended only by five hundred of his own men, Theodore of Montferrat made his state entry into Genoa on the morrow, hailed as a deliverer by the multitude, whilst Ficino fell back on Novi, there to lie in wait for Boussacourt. Nor was his patience tried. Upon Boussacourt confidently preparing for Ficino's attack, the news of the happenings in Genoa fell like a thunderbolt from a clear sky. Between fury and panic he quitted Milan, and by his very haste destroyed what little chance he may ever have had of mending the situation. By forced marches he reached the plains about Novi to find the road held against his jaded men. And here he piled error upon error. Being informed that Ficino himself, incapacitated by the gout, had been carried that morning into Genoa, and that his army was commanded in his absence by his adoptive son Balerian, the French commander decided to strike at once before Ficino should recover and return to direct the operations in person. The ground was excellent for cavalry, and entirely of cavalry some 4,000 strong was Boussacourt's main battle composed. Leading it in person, he hurled it upon the enemy centre in a charge which he thought must irresistibly cleave through. Nor did the mass of infantry of which Balerian's centre was composed resist. It yielded ground before the furious onslaught of the French lances. Indeed, as if swayed by panic, it began to yield long before any contact was established, and the French in their rash exultation never noticed the orderliness of that swift retreat, never suspected the trap, until they were fast caught in it. For whilst the centre yielded, the wings stood firm, and the wings were entirely composed of horse, the right commanded by the Piedmontese trotter, the left by Carmagnola, who, sulky and disgruntled at his supersession in a supreme command which he deemed his right, had never wearied of denouncing this disposition of forces as an insensate reversal of all the known rules. Back and back, ever more swiftly fell the foot. On and on pressed the French, their lances couched, their voices already claimantly mocking these opponents, who were being swept away like leaves by the mere gust of the charge. Balerian, riding in the rear of his retreating infantry with a mounted trumpeter beside him, uttered a single word. A trumpet blast rang out, and before its note had died the retreat was abruptly checked. Königshofen's men, who formed the van of that centre, suddenly drove the butts of their fifteen-foot German pikes into the ground. Each man of the two front ranks went down on one knee. A terrible hedge of spears suddenly confronted the men-at-arms of France, riding too impetuously in their confidence. Half a hundred horses were piked in the first impact. Then the impetus of those behind, striking the leading ranks which sought desperately to check, drove them forward onto those formidable German points. The entire charging mass was instantly thrown into confusion. That, said Balerian grimly, will teach Boussacourt to respect infantry in future. Sound the charge. The trumpeter wound another blast, thrice repeated, and in answer, as Balerian had preconcerted, the right and left wings, which had gradually been extending, wheeled about and charged the French on both flanks simultaneously. Only then did Boussacourt perceive whither his overconfident charge had carried him. Vainly did he seek to rally and steady his staggering followers. They were enveloped, smashed, ridden down before they could recover. Boussacourt, himself, fighting like a man possessed, fighting, indeed, for very life, hewed himself away out of that terrible press, and contrived to join the other two of the three battles into which he had divided his army and which were pressing forward now to the rescue. But they arrived too late. There was nothing left to rescue. The survivors of the flower of Boussacourt's army had thrown down their arms and accepted quarter, and the reserves ran in to meet a solid enemy front, which drove wedges into their ranks and mercilessly battered them, 
until Boussacourt routed beyond redemption drew off with what was left. A swift action, which was a model of the harmonious collaboration of the parts. Thus did Balerion describe the Battle of Novi which was to swell his ever-growing fame. Boussacourt, as Balerion said, had sought to grasp more than he could hold when he had responded to John Maria's invitation, and at Novi he lost not only Milan, but Genoa as well. In ignominy he took the road to France, glad to escape with his life and some battered remnants of his army, and Italy knew him no more after that day. In the Fragoso Palace at Genoa, overlooking the harbour, where Theodore of Montferrat had taken up his quarters, and where the incapacitated Ficino was temporarily lodged, there was a great banquet on the following night to celebrate at once the overthrow of the French and the accession of Theodore as Prince of Genoa. It was attended by representatives of the twelve greatest families in the state as well as by Ficino, hobbling painfully on a crutch, and his captains, and whilst the official hero of the hour was Theodore, the new prince, the real hero was Balerion. He received without emotion, without any sign either of pride or of modesty, the tribute lavishly paid him by illustrious men and distinguished women, by the adulatory congratulatory speech of Theodore, or the almost malicious stress which Carmagnola laid on his good fortune. You are well named Bellerion Fortunato, that splendid soldier had said. I am still wondering what would have happened if Boussacourt had perceived the trick in time. Bellerion was coldly amiable in his reply. It will provide you with healthy mental exercise. Consider at the same time what might have happened if Buonterzo had fathomed our intentions at Travo, or Vignate had guessed my real purpose at Alessandria. Bellerion moved on, leaving Carmagnola to bite his lip and digest the laughter of his brother captains. His interview later with Prince Theodore was more serious. From its outset he mistrusted the fawning suavity of the courtly regent, so that, when at the end of compliments upon his prowess, the regent proposed to take him and his company into the pay of Montferrat at a stipend vastly in excess of that which Florence had lately paid him, Bellerian was not at all surprised. Two things became immediately clear. First, that Theodore desired greatly to increase his strength, the only reason for which could be the shirking, now that all his aims were accomplished, of his engagements towards Ficino. Second, that he took it for granted, as he had done before, that Bellerian was just a venal, self-seeking adventurer who would never permit considerations of honour to stand in the way of profit. And the cupidity and calculation now revealed in Bellerian's countenance assured Theodore that his skill in reading men had not been at fault on this occasion. You offer me. He broke off. Stealthily his glance swept the glittering groups that moved about the spacious white and gold room, to Ficino Cane where he sat at the far end in a great crimson chair. He lowered his voice a little. The loggia is empty, my lord. We shall be more private there. They sauntered forth to that covered balcony overlooking the great harbour where ranks of shipping drawn up against the mole were slumbering under the stars. A great towering galley was moving across the water with furled sails, her gigantic oar blades flashing silver in the moonlight. With his glance upon that craft, his voice subdued, Balerion spoke, and the close-set eyes of the tall, elegant regent strained to pierce the shadows about the young condottiero's face. This is a very noble offer, Lord Prince. I hope I shall never begrudge a man his worth. It was a speech true to the character he loved to assume. You are a great soldier, Balerion. That fact is now established and admitted. Valerian did not contradict him. I do not perceive at present your need for a great soldier, Highness. True, your proposal seems to argue plans already formed. But unless I know something of them, unless I may judge for myself the likely extent of the service you require, these generous terms may in effect prove an illusion. Theodore resumed his momentarily suspended breath. He even laughed a little now that the venal reason for Balerion's curiosity was supplied. But he deemed it wise to probe a little further. You are, as I understand, under no present engagement to the Count of Byandrate. Balerion's answer was very prompt. Under none. 
in discharge of past favors I engaged to assist him in the campaign against the Marshal Boussacourt. That campaign is now ended, and with it my engagement. I am in the market, as it were, my lord. That is what I assumed. Else, of course, I should not have come to you with my offer. I lose no time because soon you will be receiving other proposals. That is inevitable. For the same reason I name a stipend which I believe is higher than any condottiero has ever yet commanded. But you have not named a term. That was why I desired to know your plans so that for myself I might judge the term. I will make the engagement to endure for three years, said Theodore. The proposal becomes generous, indeed. Is it acceptable? Balerion laughed softly. I should be greedy if it were not. It will carry the usual condition that you engage for such service as I may require and against any whom circumstances may make my enemy. Naturally, said Balerion, but he seemed to falter a little. Naturally, he repeated. And yet, he paused, and Theodore waited, craftily refraining from any word that should curb him in opening his mind. And yet I should prefer that service against my Lord Ficino be accepted. You would prefer it, said Theodore, but do you make it a condition? Balerion's hesitation revealed him to the regent for a man torn between interest and scruples. Weakly, at last, he said, I would not willingly go in arms against him. Not willingly? That I can understand. But you do not answer my question. Do you make it a condition? Still Balerion avoided answering. Would the condition make my employment impossible? And now it was Theodore who hesitated, or seemed to hesitate. It would, he said at last. Very quickly he added, nothing is less likely than that Ficino and I should be opposed to each other. Yet you'll understand that I could not possibly employ a condottiero who would have the right to desert me in such a contingency. Oh, yes. I understand that. I have understood it from the first. I am foolish, I suppose, to hesitate where the terms are so generous. He sighed, a man whose conscience was in labor. My Lord Ficino could hardly blame me. He left the sentence unfinished and Theodore to end the rogue's hesitation threw more weight into the scales. And there will be guarantees, he said. Guarantees? Ah. The lands of Asti along the Tanaro from Revigliasco to Margaria to be made into a fief, and placed under your vicarship with the title of Count of Asti. Balerion caught his breath. He turned to face the Marquis, and in the moonlight his countenance looked very white. My lord, you promise something that is not yours to bestow. It is to make it mine that I require your service. I am frank, you see. Balerion saw more. He saw the infernal subtlety with which this tempter went to work. He made clear his intentions, which must amount to no less than the conquest and occupation of all those rich lands which lay between High and Low Montferrat. To accomplish this, Alessandria, Valenza, and a score of other cities now within the Duchy of Milan would pass under his dominion. Inevitably, then, must there be war with Ficino, who to the end of his days would be in arms to preserve the integrity of the duchy. And Theodore offered this condottiero, whose services he coveted, a dazzling reward to be gained only when those aims were fulfilled. On that seducer's arm Balerion placed a hand that shook with excitement. You mean this, my lord? It is a solemn undertaking. With difficulty Theodore preserved his gravity. How shrewdly had he not taken the measure of this greedy rogue. Your patent shall be made out in anticipation, and signed at the same time as the contract. Balerion stared out to sea. Count Balerion of Asti, he murmured, a man dazzled, dazed. Suddenly he laughed and laughing surrendered his last scruple as Theodore was already confident that he would. When do we sign, Lord Prince? Tomorrow morning, Lord Count, Theodore answered with a tight-lipped smile, and on that, the matter satisfactorily concluded, they quitted the loggia and parted company.
They met again for the signing of the documents early on the following morning in the regent's closet, in the presence of the notary who had drawn up the contract at Theodore's dictation, of two gentlemen of Montferrat, and of Werner von Stoffel, who accompanied Balerian, and who, as Balerian's lieutenant, was an interested party. The notary read first the contract, which Balerian pronounced correct in all particulars, and then the ennobling parchment whereby Theodore created him Count of Asti, anticipatorily detailing the lands which he was to hold in fief. This document already signed and sealed was delivered to Balerian together with the contract which he was now invited to sign. The notary dipped a quill and proffered it. But Balerian looked at the regent. Documents, he said, are perishable, and the matter contained in these is grave. For which reason I have brought with me a witness, who in case of need can hereafter testify to your undertaking, my lord. The Marquis frowned. Let Messer Stoffel examine them for himself then. Not Messer Stoffel. The witness I prefer waits in your antechamber, Highness. He stepped quickly to the door, followed by the regent's surprised glance. He pulled it open, and at once Ficino was revealed to them, grave of countenance leaning upon his crutch. The regent made a noise in his throat, as Ficino hobbled in to take the parchments which Balerian proffered him. Thereafter there was a spell of dreadful silence broken at last by the Lord Theodore who was unable longer to control himself. You miserable trickster, you lowborn, swaggering Judas, I should have known better than to trust you, I should have known that you'd be true to your false, shifty nature. You dirty fox. A trickster, a Judas, a fox. Balerian appealed mildly to the company against the injustice of these epithets. But why such violence of terms? Could I, in loyalty to my adoptive father, put my signature to this contract until it had received his approval? You mock me, you vile son of a dog. Ficino looked up. His face was stern, his eyes smouldered. Think of some fouler epithet, my lord, so that I may cast it at you. So far no term that you have used will serve my need. That gave Theodore pause in his reviling of another. But only for a moment. Almost at once he was leaping furiously towards Ficino. The feral nature under his silken exterior was now displayed. He was a man of his hands, this regent of Montferrat, and, beggared of words to meet the present case, he was prepared for deeds. Suddenly he found Balerian in his way, the bold, mocking eyes level with his own, and Balerian's right hand was behind his back, where the heavy dagger hung. Shall we be calm? Balerian was saying. There are half a dozen men of mine in the anteroom if you want violence. He fell back, and for all that his eyes still glared he made an obvious effort to regain his self-command. It was difficult in the face of Ficino's contemptuous laughter and the words Ficino was using. You treacherous slug. I place you in possession of Vercelli, I make you Prince of Genoa, before calling upon you to strike a single blow on my behalf, and you prepare to use this newfound power against me. You'll drive me from Alessandria, you'll seduce from me the best among my captains to turn his weapons against me in your service. If Balerian had been an ingrate like yourself, if he had not been staunch and loyal, whom you dare to call a Judas, I might have known nothing of this until too late to guard myself. But I know you now, you dastardly usurper, and, by the bones of God, your days are numbered. You'll prepare for war on Ficino Cain, will you? Prepare, then, for, by the passion, that war is coming to you. Theodore stood there white to the lips, between his two dismayed gentlemen, and said no word in answer. Ficino, with curling lip, considered him. I'd never have believed it if I had not read these for myself, he added. Then proffered the documents to Balerian again. Give him back his parchments, and let us go. The sight of the creature nauseates me. And without more, he hobbled out. Balerian lingered to tear the parchments across and across. He cast them from him, bowed ironically, and was going out with Stoffel when the regent found his voice at last. You kite-hearted trickster, what stipend have you wrung from Ficino as the price of this betrayal? Balerian paused on the threshold. 
No stipend, my lord, he answered equably. Merely a condition, that so soon as the affairs of Milan are settled, he will see justice done to your nephew, the Marquis John Giacomo, now of age to succeed, and put a definite end to your usurpation. His sheer amazement betrayed from him the sudden question. What is John Giacomo to you, villain? Something he is, or else I should never have been at pains to make him safe from you by demanding him as a hostage. I have been labouring for him for longer than you think, Highness. You have been labouring for him? You? In whose pay? Valerian sighed. You must be supposing me a tradesman, even when I am really that quite senseless thing, a knight errant. And he went out with Stoffel. 3. Ficino's Return A strong party of men at arms rode out of Genoa that morning, their corslets flashing in the sunshine, and took the upland road by the valley of the Scrivia towards Novi and Ficino's camp. In their midst went a mule litter wherein Ficino brooded upon the baseness and ingratitude of men, and asked himself whether perhaps his ambitious countess were not justified of her impatience with him because he laboured for purposes other than the aggrandizement of himself. From Novi he despatched Carmagnola with a strong escort to Casole to bring the Countess Beatrice thence to Alessandria without loss of time. He had no mind to allow Theodore to hold her as a hostage to set against John Giacomo who remained with Ficino. Three days after leaving Novi, Ficino's army, reduced by Theodore's contingent of 3,000 men which had been left behind, but still in great strength, reached Vigevano, and halted there to encamp again outside the town. Ficino's vanity was the main reason. He would not cross the Ticino until he could sit a horse again, so that he might ride lance on thigh into Milan. Already his condition was greatly improved under the ministrations of a Genos physician named Mombelli, renowned for his treatment of the pedagric habit, who was now in Ficino's train. A week passed, and Ficino now completely restored was only restrained from pushing on by the arguments of his physician. Meanwhile, however, if he did not go to Milan, many from Milan were coming to him. Amongst the first to arrive was the firebrand Pustola of Venegono, who out of his passionate vindictiveness came to urge Ficino to hang John Maria and make himself Duke of Milan, assuring him of the support of all the Ghibelline faction. Ficino heard him without emotion, and would commit himself to nothing. Amongst the last to arrive was the Duke himself, in a rash trustfulness which revealed the desperate view he must take of his own case and of the helplessness to which his folly and faithlessness had reduced him. He came accompanied by his evil genius Antonio della Torre, the fop Lonate, the captain of his guard Bettino Mantegazza, and a paltry escort of a hundred lances. With those three attending him he was received by Ficino in the house of the ducal prefect of Vigevano. Your Highness honours me by this proof of your trust in my integrity, said Ficino, bending to kiss the jewelled ducal hand. Integrity. The duke's grotesque face was white, his red eyebrows drawn together in a scowl. Is it integrity that brings you in arms against me, Ficino? Not against you, Lord Duke. Never yet have I stood in arms against your highness. It is upon your enemies that I make war. I have no aim but the restoration of peace to your dominions. Fine words on the lips of a mutinous traitor, sneered the duke. He flung himself petulantly into a chair. If your highness believed that, you would not dare to come here. Not dare. God's bones, man. Are these words for me? I am Duke of Milan. I study to remember it, highness, said Ficino, and the rumblings of anger in his voice drove Della Torre to pluck at his master's sleeve. Thus warned, John Maria changed the subject but not the tone. You know why I am here. To permit me, I hope, to place myself at your potence's commands. Ah, bah, you make me sick with your fair words. He grew sullen. Come, man, what is your price? My price, highness, what does your highness conceive I have to sell? A little patience with his magnificence, my lord, Della Torre begged. I thought I was displaying it, said Ficino. 
otherwise it might be very bad for everybody. He was really growing angry. And now the idiot duke must needs go prodding him into fury. What's that? Do you threaten me? Why, here's an insolent dog. Ficino turned livid with passion. A tall fellow among his captains, very noble-looking in cloth of silver under a blue hoopland, laughed aloud. The pale, bulging eyes of John Maria sought him out venomously. You laugh, knave, he snarled, and came to his feet, outraged by the indignity. What is here for laughter? Valerian laughed again as he answered, Yourself, Lord Duke, who in yourself are nothing. You are Duke of Milan at present by the grace of God and the favour of Ficino Cain. Yet you do not hesitate to offend against both. Quiet, Balerion, Ficino growled. I need no advocate. Balerion, the duke echoed, glaring malevolently. I remember you, and remember you I shall. You shall be taught. By God, it is your highness shall be taught. Ficino crashed into the threatening speech roaring like a thunder god. Get you hence, back to your Milan until I come to give you the lesson that you need, and thank God that you are your father's son and I have grace enough to remember it, for otherwise you'd never go hence alive. Away with you, and get yourself schooled in manners before we meet again or as God's my life I'll birch you with these hands. Terrified, cowering before that raging storm, the line of which had never yet broken about his ducal head, John Maria shrank back until his three companions were between himself and Ficino. Della Torre, almost trembling, sought to pacify the angry condottiero. My lord, my lord, this is not worthy. Not worthy. Is it worthy that I shall be called dog by a cross-grained brat to whom I've played the foster father? Out of my sight, sir, out of my sight, all of you, the door, Balerion, the Duke of Milan to the door. They went without another word, fearing, indeed, that another word might be their last. But they did not yet return to Milan. They remained in Vigevano, and that evening Della Torre came seeking audience again of Ficino to make the Duke's peace with him, and Ficino, having swallowed his rage by then, consented to receive His Highness once more. The young man came, this time well schooled in prudence, to announce that he was prepared to give Ficino peaceful entrance into Milan and to restore him to his office of ducal governor. In short, that he was prepared to accord all that which he had no power to refuse. Ficino's answer was brief and clear. He would accept the office again, provided that it was bestowed upon him for a term of three years, and the bestowal guaranteed by an oath of fealty to be sworn upon his hands by the syndics of the Grand Council. Further, the castle of Porta Giovia was to be delivered into his keeping absolutely, and not only the Guelphic Sanseverino, who now held the office of Podesta, but all other Guelphs holding offices of state must be dismissed. Lastly, Antonio della Torre, whom Ficino accused of being at the root of most of the trouble which had distracted Milan, must go into banishment together with Lonate. This last was the condition that John Maria would not swallow. He swore it was a vile attempt to deprive him of all his friends. Thus the conference ended inconclusively, and it was not until three weeks later that the Duke finally yielded, and accepted Ficino's terms in their entirety. On the evening of Wednesday, the 6th of November of that year, attended by a large company, Ficino Cain, Count of Biandrate, rode into Milan to resume his governorship, a governorship which he was resolved to render absolute this time. They entered the city in a downpour of rain, notwithstanding which the streets were thronged by the people who turned out to welcome the man in whom they beheld their saviour. And in the old broletto, the young duke, without a single friendly gelf at hand to comfort him, sat listening to that uproar, gnawing his fingernails and shuddering with rage and spite. It becomes necessary, however, to remember, lest we should be swept along by this stream of Viscontian history, that this present chronicle is concerned not with the fortunes of Milan, but with those of Balerion, and that in these Ficino Cain and John Maria Visconti are concerned only to the extent of the part they bore in moulding them. In the confused pages of Old Corio you may read in detail, 
though you may not always clearly understand, the events that followed upon Ficino's triumphant return to Milan. You will gather that the strength in which he was known to be gave pause to Molotesta's plans to seize the duchy, that in fact the Archgulf chose to content himself with his usurpation of the lordship of Brescia and Bergamo, and in Bergamo he remained until Ficino went to seek him there some two years later. If he did not go before, it was because other more immediate and active enemies of Milan claimed his attention. Vignate was in arms again, as were also Estor Visconti and his nephew Giovanni Carlo, and a host of lesser insurgents, chief of whom was the Duke's own brother, that Filippo Maria Visconti who was Count of Pavia. By the Ghibellines who had fled to him from Milan during the days of Molotesta and Boussacourt's domination, Filippo Maria had been flattered into believing that he was that party's only hope in northern Italy. His ambition thus aroused, he was ready to take advantage of the general distraction, and to appropriate for himself the ducal clamis. To this purpose was he arming when Ficino returned to Milan, and news of his preparations reached Ficino whilst he was suppressing the various rebellious outbreaks in the Milanese, stamping out the embers of revolt in such places as Digio and Gorgonzola. Only when he had restored order, established a proper administration, and so brought back tranquility to that harassed land, did he turn his attention to the menace of the enemies farther afield. And the first of these was Filippo Maria. He marched on Pavia, carried the city by assault and put it to sack, choosing of all nights in the year for that operation the night of Christmas. That sack of Pavia is one of the most unsparing and terrible in the terrible history of sacks, and the deed remains a blot upon the fame of a soldier who, although rough and occasionally even brutal in his ways, was yet a leader of high principles and a high sense of duty. Thereafter he dealt with Filippo Maria much as he had dealt with his ducal brother. He appointed himself governor of the young man's dominions, filled the offices of state with men in his own confidence and completely stripped the count of authority. The fat, flabby young prince submitted in a singularly apathetic fashion. He was of solitary, studious habits, a recluse, almost savagely shy, shunning the society of men because of his excessive consciousness of his own grotesque ugliness. The spark of ambition that had been struck from him having been thus summarily quenched, he retired to his books again, and let Ficino have his way with the state nor complained so long as Ficino left him in the enjoyment of the little that was really necessary to his eremitic ways. Ficino made now of Pavia his headquarters, coming to dwell in the great castle itself, and bringing thither from Alessandria his countess. And with the countess of Biandrate came also the princess Valeria of Montferrat to rejoin at last her brother who had continued throughout in Ficino's train. The princess had left Casole with the countess when Carmagnola appeared there as Ficino's envoy with an escort. Her going had been in the nature of a flight, whose object had been first to rejoin her cherished brother, and second, to remove herself from the power of her uncle, which, in all the circumstances made clear by Carmagnola, seemed prudent. It is possible that she may also have hoped by her presence near Ficino to stimulate him into the fulfilment of the threat against the regent on which he had parted from him in Genoa. But Ficino had still more immediate matters to rectify before coming to the affair of the Lord Theodore. The regent must wait his turn. He moved against Cantorio in the following May, and made short work of it. The campaign against Crema followed, and meanwhile Balerian, with a condotta increased to 1500 men and supported by Königshofen, had marched out of Milan to deal with the rebellious Vignate, whom in the end he finally and definitely defeated. That done he returned to Milan, where, ever since Ficino's descent upon Pavia, he had held the position of Ficino's deputy, and had earned respect and even affection by the equable wisdom of his rule. All this in greater detail you will find set forth by Corio and F.R.A. Serafino of Imola, and it is F.R.A. Serafino who tells us that Ficino, determined that Balerian should not suffer by the loyalty which had made him refuse the county of Asti, had constrained John Maria to create him Count of Garvi, and the Commune of Milan to enlist the services of his condotta for two years at a stipend of 30,000 ducats monthly. 4. The Count of Pavia in the vast park of Pavia the trees stood leafless and black against the white shroud of snow that covered the chilled earth. The river Ticino gurgled and swirled about the hundred granite pillars which carried the great roofed bridge, 
500 feet in length, spanning its grey and turgid waters. Beyond this, Pavia the Learned reared above white roofs her hundred snow-capped towers to the grey December sky, and beyond the city, isolated, within the girdle of a moat that was both wide and deep, stood the massive square castle, pink as coral, strong as iron, at once impregnable fortress and unrivalled palace, one of the great monuments of Viscontian power and splendour, described by Petter Arch as the princeliest pile in Italy. The pride of the place was the library, a spacious square chamber in one of the rectangular towers that rose at each of the four corners of the castle. The floor was of coloured mosaics, figuring birds and beasts, the ceiling of ultramarine starflecked in gold, and along the walls was ranged a collection of some 900 manuscript parchment volumes bound in velvet and damask, or in gold and silver brocades. Their contents contained all that was known of theology, astrology, medicine, music, geometry, rhetoric, and the other sciences. This room was the favourite haunt of the lonely, morose, and studious boy, the great John Galizzo's younger son, Filippo Maria Visconti, Count of Pavia. He sat there now, by the log fire that hissed and spluttered and flamed on the cavernous hearth, diffusing warmth and a fragrance of pine throughout the chamber. And with him at chess sat the Lord Balerian Kane, Count of Garvey, one of the newfound friends who had invaded his loneliness, and broken through the savage shyness which solitude and friendlessness had set about him like a shell. The others, the dark and handsome Countess of Byandrate, the fair and now almost ethereal Princess of Montferrat, and that sturdier counterpart of herself, her brother, were in the background by one of the two light windows with trefoil arches springing from slender monials. The princess was bending low over a frame, embroidering in red and gold and blue an altar cloth for San Pietro in Sile di Oro. The countess was yawning over a beautifully illuminated copy of Petrarca's Triunfo de More. The boy sat idle and listless between them, watching his sister's white tapering fingers as they flashed to and fro. Presently he rose, sauntered across to the players, drew up a stool, and sat down to watch the game over which they brooded silently. A crutch lay beside Balerion, and his right leg was thrust out stiff and unbending, to explain why he sat here on this day of late December playing chess, whilst the campaign against Molotesta continued to rage in the hills of Bergamo. He was suffering the penalty of the pioneer. Having already demonstrated to his contemporaries that infantry, when properly organized and maneuvered, can hold its own in the field against cavalry, he had been turning his attention to artillery. Two months ago he had mounted a park of guns under the walls of Bergamo with the intention of breaching them. But at the outset of his operations a bombard had burst, killing two of his bombardiers and breaking his thigh, thus proving Ficino's contention that artillery was a danger only to those who employed it. The physician Mombelli, who still continued in Ficino's train, had set the bone, whereafter Balerian had been carefully packed into a mule litter, and by roads, which torrential rains had reduced to quagmires, he had been despatched to Pavia to get himself mended. His removal from the army was regretted by everybody with two exceptions. Carmagnola, glad to be relieved of a brother captain by comparison with whose military methods his own were constantly suffering in the general esteem, and Filippo Maria, when he discovered in Balerian a chess player who was not only his equal but his master, and who in other ways won the esteem of that very friendless boy. The Princess Valeria was dismayed that this man, who out of unconquerable prejudice she continued to scorn and mistrust, should become for a season her fellow inquiline. And it was in vain that John Giacomo, who in the course of his reformation had come to conceive a certain regard for Valerian, sought to combat his sister's deep-rooted prejudice. When he insisted that it was by Valerian's contriving that he had been removed from his uncle's control, she had been moved to vehement scorn of his credulity. That is what the trickster would have us think. He no more than carried out the orders of the Count of Byandrate. His whole life bears witness to his false nature. Nay, now, Valeria, nay. You'll not deny that he is what all Italy now proclaims him, one of the greatest captains of his time. And how has he made himself that? Is it by knightly qualities, by soldierly virtues? All the world knows that he prevails by guile and trickery. You've been listening to Carmagnola, said her brother. 
he would give an eye for Balerion's skill. You're but a boy, she reminded him with some asperity. And Carmagnola, of course, is a handsome man. She crimsoned at the sly tone. On odd visits to Pavia, Carmagnola had been very attentive to the princess, employing all a peacock's arts of self-display to dazzle her. He is an honest gentleman, she countered hotly. It is better to trust an upright, honest soldier than a sly schemer whose falsehood has been proven to us. If he schemes my ruin for my uncle's profit, he goes about it oddly, neglecting opportunities. She looked at him with compassion. Valerian never aims where he looks. It is the world says that of him, not I. And at what do you suspect that he is aiming now? Her deep eyes grew thoughtful. What if he serves our uncle to destroy us, only so that in the end he may destroy our uncle to his own advantage? What if he should aim at a throne? John Giacomo thought the notion fantastic, the fruit of too much ill-ordered brooding. He said so, laughing. If you had studied his methods, John Nino, you would not say that. See how he has wrought his own advancement. In four short years this son of nobody, without so much as a name of his own has become the Knight Balerian, the Lord Balerian of the Company of the White Dog, and now the Lord Count of Garvey holding the rich lands of Garvey in feud. One there was who might have told her things which would have corrected her judgment, and that was Ficino's Countess. For the Lady Beatrice knew the truth of those events in Montferrat which were at the root of the Princess Valeria's bitter prejudice, of which also she was aware. You hate him very bitterly, the Countess told her once when Balerion had been the subject of their talk. Would not you, if you were in my place? And the Countess, looking at her with those long indolent eyes of hers, an inscrutable smile on her red lips, had answered with languorous slowness, in your place it is possible that I should. The tone and the smile had intrigued the princess for many a day thereafter, but either she was too proud to ask what the countess had meant, or else afraid. When after some eight weeks abed, Balerion had begun to hobble about the castle, and it was impossible for the princess entirely to avoid him, she was careful never to be alone where he might so surprise her, using him when they met in the company of others with a distant, frigid courtesy, which is perhaps the most piercing of all hostility. If it wounded Balerion, he gave no sign. He was, and therein lay half the secret of his strength, a very patient man. He was content to wait for the day when by his contriving the reckoning should be presented to the Marquis Theodore, and she should know at last whose servant he really was. Meanwhile, he modelled his demeanour upon her own. He did not seek her company, nor indeed that of any in the castle save Filippo Maria, with whom he would spend long hours at chess or instructing him out of his own deep learning supported by one or another of the treatises in that fine library. Until the coming of Balerion, the Count of Pavia had believed himself a strong chess player. Balerion had made him realise that his knowledge of the game was elementary where against former opponents he had swept to easy triumphs, he now groaned and puffed and sweated over the board to lessen the ignominy of his inevitable defeats. Today, however, he was groaning less than usual. He had piled up a well-supported attack on Balerion's flank, and for the first time in weeks, for these games had begun whilst Balerion was still abed, he saw victory ahead. With a broad smile he brought up a bishop further to strengthen the mass of his attack. He saw his way to give check in three and checkmate in four moves. Although only in his twentieth year, he was of a hog-like bulk. Of no more than middle height, he looked tall when seated, for all the length of him was in his flabby, paunchy body. His limbs were short and shapeless. His face was as round as the full moon and as pale. A great dewlap spread beneath his chin, and his neck behind hung in loose fat folds upon his collar, so that the back of his head, which was flat, seemed to slope inwards towards the crown. His short black hair was smooth and sleek as a velvet cap, and a fringe of it across his forehead descended almost to the heavy black eyebrows, thus masking the intellectual depth of the only noble feature of that ignoble countenance. Of his father all that he had inherited physically was the hooked, predatory nose. 
His mouth was coarsely shaped and its lines confirmed the impression of cruelty you gathered from the dark eyes which were small and lackluster as a snake's. And the impression was a true one, for the soul of this shy, morose young prince was not without its share of that sadic cruelty which marked all the men of his race. To meet the bishop's move, Balerion advanced a knight. The prince's laugh rang through the silent room. It was a shrill almost womanish laugh, and it was seldom heard. High-pitched, too, was the voice that followed. You but delay the inevitable, Balerion, he said, and took the knight. But the move of the knight, which had appeared purely defensive to the prince in his intentness upon his own attack, had served to uncover the file of Balerion's queen. Supports had been previously and just as cunningly provided. Balerion advanced his hand, a long beautiful hand upon which glowed a great carved sapphire set in brilliance, the blue and white that were his colours. Forth flashed his queen across the board. Checkmate, Lord Prince, said Balerion quietly, and sank back smiling into the brocaded chair. Filippo Maria stared unbelieving at the board. The lines of his mouth drooped, and his great pendulous cheeks trembled. Almost he seemed on the point of tears. God rot you, Balerion, always, always is it the same, I plan and build and whilst you seem to do no more than defend, you are preparing a deathstroke in an unexpected quarter. Between jest and earnest he added, you slippery rogue, always you defeat me by a trick. The princess Valeria looked up from her embroidery on the word. Balerion caught the movement and the glance in his direction. He knew the thought behind and it was that thought he answered. In the field, my opponents use the same word to decry me, but those who are with me applaud my skill. He laughed. Truth is an elusive thing, Highness, as Pontius Pilate knew. The aspect of a fact depends upon the angle from which you view it. Filippo Maria sat back, his great chin sunk to his breast, his podgy white hands gripping the arms of his chair, his humour sullen. I'll play no more today, he said. The countess rose and crossed the room with a rustle of stiff brocade of black and gold. Let me remove the board, she said. A vile, dull game. I wonder that you can waste such hours upon it. Filippo Maria raised his beady eyes. They kindled as they observed her, raking her generous yet supple lines from head to foot. It was not the first time that the watchful Balerion had seen him look so at Ficino's lady, nor the first time that he had seen her wantonly display herself to provoke that unmistakable regard. She bent now to the board, and Filippo's smouldering glance was upon the warm ivory beauty of her neck, and the swell of her breast revealed by the low-cut gown. It is human to despise what we do not understand, Balerion was answering her. You would defend the game, of course, since you excel in it. That is what you love, Balerion, to excel, to wield mastery. Do we not all? Do not you, yourself, Madonna, glory in the power your beauty gives you? She looked at Filippo. Her heavy eyelids drooped. Behold him turned courtier, my lord. He perceives beauty in me. He would be blind else, said the fat youth, greatly daring and the next moment in a reaction of shyness a mottled flush was staining his unhealthy pallor. Lower drooped the lady's eyelids, until a line of black lashes lay upon her cheek. The game, John Giacomo interposed, is a very proper one for princes. Messer Bellerian told me so. He means, child, Filippo answered him, that it teaches them a bitter moral that whilst a state depends upon the prince, the prince himself is entirely dependent upon others, being capable in his own person of little more than his meanest pawn. To teach that lesson to a despot, said Balerion, was the game invented by an Eastern philosopher. And the most potent piece upon the board, as in the state, is the queen, symbolizing woman. Thus Filippo Maria, his eyes full upon the countess again. Balerion laughed. Aye, he knew his world, that ancient oriental. But he did not laugh as the days passed, 
and he observed the growing lechery in the beady eyes with which the Count of Pavia watched the Lady Beatrice's every movement, and the Lady Beatrice's provocative complacency under that vigilance. One day, at last, coming upon the Countess alone in that library, Valerian unmasked the batteries he had been preparing. He hobbled across to the arched window by which she was seated, and, leaning against its monial, looked out upon the desolate park. The snows had gone, washed away by rains, and since these had come a frost under which the ground lay now as grey and hard as iron. They will be feeling the rigours of the winter in the camp under Bergamo, he said, moving, as ever, obliquely to the attack. They will so. Ficino should have gone into winter quarters. That would mean recommencing in the spring a job that is half done already. Yet with his gout and the infirmities of age, it might prove wiser in the end. Each age has its own penalties, Madonna. It is not only the elderly among humanity who need compassion. Wisdom oozes from you like sweat from another. There was a tartness in her accents. If I were your biographer, Valerian, I should write of you as the soldier sage, or the philosopher at arms. Propped on his crutch and his one sound leg, Valerian considered her, his head on one side, and fetched a sigh. You are very beautiful, Madonna. She was startled. God save us, she cried. Does the soldier sage contain a mere man, after all? Your mouth, Madonna, is too sweetly formed for acids. The choicest fruits, sir, have an alloy of sharpness. What else about me finds favour in your eyes? In my eyes, my eyes, Madonna, are circumspect. They do not prowl hungrily over another's pastures. She looked at him between anger and apprehension, and slowly a wave of scarlet came to stain her face and bosom, to tell him that she understood. He lowered himself carefully to a chair, thrusting out his damaged leg, to the knee joint of which articulation was only just beginning to return. I was saying, Madonna, that they will be feeling the rigours of the winter in the camp under Bergamo. There was a hard frost last night, and after the frost there will be rains under which the hills thereabouts will melt in mud. He sighed again. You would regret, Madonna, to exchange for that the ease and comfort of Pavia. You have the fever again. I am not thinking of making that exchange. No, I am thinking of it for you. You, Saint Mary, and do you dispose of me? It will be cold up there, Madonna, but you need cooling. Coolness restores judgment. It will bring you back to a sense of duty to your Lord. She came to her feet beside him, quivering with anger. Almost he thought her intention was to strike him. Have you come here to spy upon me? Of course. Now you know why I broke my leg. She looked unutterable scorn. The Princess Valeria is right in her opinion of you, in her disdain of you. His eyes grew sad. If you were generous, Madonna, nay, if you were merely honest, you would not embrace her opinions, you would correct them, for you have the knowledge that would suffice to do so. But you are not honest. If you were, there would be no need for me to speak now in defence of the honour of your absent lord. Is it for you to say I am not honest? There was now more of sorrow than indignation in her voice, and tears were gathering in her eyes, to deepen their sapphire hue. God knows I have been honest with you, Valerian. It is this very honesty you abuse in your present misjudgment of me. Oh, me miserable. It was the cry of a wounded soul. She sank down again into her chair. Self-pity welled in her to drown all else. I am to be starved of everything. If ever woman was pitiable, I am that woman. And you, Valerian, you of all living men that know my heart, can find for me only cruelty and reproach. It moved him not at all. The plea was too inconsequent and illogical, and the display of a lack of reason repelled him like a physical defect. Your plaint, Madonna, is that Ficino will not make you a duchess. He may do so yet if you are patient. Her tears had suddenly ceased. You know something, she exclaimed in a hushed voice. The rogue fooled her with that illusion, 
whilst refraining from using words which might afterwards be turned against him. I know that you will lose the chance if meanwhile you should cease to be Ficino's wife. If you were so mad as to become the lemon of another, you know as well as I do that the Lord Ficino would put you from him. What should you be then? That is why I am your friend when I think of the camp at Bergamo for you. Slowly she dried her eyes. Carefully she removed all stains of tears. It consumed a little time. Then she rose and went to him, and took his hand. Thank you, Balerian, my friend. Her voice was hushed and tender. You need have no fear for me. She paused a moment. What, what has my lord said to you of his intent? Nay, nay, he laughed, I betray no confidences. The trickster's tone was a confidence in itself. He swept on. You bid me have no fear for you. But that is not enough. Princes are reckless folk. I'd not have you remain in jeopardy. Oh, but Bogumo, she cried out. To be encamped in winter. You need not go so far, nor under canvas. In your place, Madonna, I should retire to Malegnano. The castle is at your disposal. It is pleasanter than Pavia. Pleasanter. In that loneliness. It is the company here that makes it prudent. And you may take the Princess Valeria and her brother with you. Come, come, Madonna. Will you trifle with fate at such a time? Will you jeopardize a glorious destiny for the sake of an obese young lordling? She considered, her face fretful. Tell me, she begged again, what my lord has divulged to you of his intentions. Have I not said enough already? The entrance of Filippo Maria at that moment saved him the need of further invention. It perturbed him not at all that the prince's round white face should darken at the sight of them so close and fond. She was warned. Her greed of power and honor would curb her wantonness and ensure her withdrawal to Malegnino as he urged. Balerian glowed with the satisfaction of a battle won, nor troubled about the deceit he had practiced. V. Justice the Epiphany mummeries were long over past, the Iron Hand of Winter was withdrawn from the land, and in the great forest of Pavia, where John Galizo had loved to hunt, the trees were breaking into bud before Balerian's condition permitted him to think of quitting the ease of Filippo Maria's castle. His leg had mended well, the knee joint had recovered its suppleness, and only a slight limp remained. He spoke of returning to Bergamo. This lotus eating has endured too long already he told the prince in answer to the latter's remonstrances, for Filippo Maria was reluctant to part with one who in many ways had beguiled for him the tedium of his lonely life, rendered lonelier than ever before by the withdrawal of the Countess of Biandrate, who had gone with the Montferrin princess to Malegnano. But it was not written that Filippo Maria should be left alone, for on the very eve of Balerian's intended departure, Ficino himself was born into the castle of Pavia, Crippled by an attack of gout of a severity which had compelled him to leave his camp just as he was preparing to reap the fruits of his long and patient siege. He had lost weight, and his face out of which the healthy tan had departed was grey and drawn. His hair from fulvid that it had been was almost white. But the spirit within remained unchanged, indomitable, and intolerant of this enforced inertia of the flesh. He was put to bed immediately on his arrival, for he was in great pain and swore that the gout, which he called by all manner of evil names, had got into his stomach. Mombelli warned me there was danger of it. Where is Mombelli? Bellerian asked. He stood with Filippo Maria by the canopied bed in a spacious chamber in the northern tower, adjacent to the Hall of Mirrors. Mombelli, devil take his soul, left me a month ago when I seemed well, to go to Duke John Maria who desired to appoint him his physician. I've sent for him again to the Duke. Meanwhile some Pavis doctor will be required to give me ease. He groaned with pain. Then, recovering, rapped out his orders to Balerian. It's a mercy you are recovered, for you are needed at Bergamo. Meanwhile Carmagnola commands there, but he has my orders to surrender his authority to you on your arrival. It was an order which Carmagnola did not relish, as he plainly showed when Balerian reached the camp two days later. But he dared not disobey it. 
Valerian examined the dispositions, but changed nothing. He carried forward the plans already made by Ficino. The siege could be tightened no further, and, considering the straits to which Molotesta must be reduced, there could be little point in wasting lives on an assault. A week after Balerians coming their road into the great camp of green tents under the walls of Bogumo, a weary, excited fellow all splashed with mud from the fury of his riding. Brought, by the guards who had checked his progress, to Ficino's large and handsomely equipped pavilion, pitched beside the racing waters of the Sirios, this slight, swarthy, fierce-eyed man proved to be that stormy petrel, Giovanni Pustola of Venegono. Valerian rose from the couch, covered by a black bearskin on which he had been reclining, and closed the beautifully illuminated copy of Juvenal's satires, which had been a parting gift from Filippo Maria. His gesture dismissed the Swiss halberdiers, who had ushered in this visitor. The very name of Venegono was of ill omen, and ill omened was the man's haggard countenance now, and his own announcement. I bring evil tidings, Lord Count. You are consistent, said Balerian. A great quality. Venigono stared at him. Give me to drink, he begged. God, how I thirst. I have ridden from Pavia without pause save to change horse at Caravaggio. From Pavia. Balerian's tone and manner changed, apprehension showed in both. But not on that account was he neglectful of the needs of his guest. On an ample square table in mid-tent stood a jug of wine and some beautiful drinking cups, their bowls of beaten gold, their stems of choicely wrought silver, beside a dish of sweetmeats, bread, and a small loaf of cheese. Balerian poured a cup of strong red valteline. Venigono drained it. I, I am consistent, as you say. And so is that hellspawn John Maria Visconti. Of his consistency, mine. By your leave. He flung himself wearily into the cushioned foldstool by the table, and set down his cup. Balerian nodded, and resumed his seat on the bearskin. What has happened in Pavia? In Pavia nothing. Nothing yet. I rode there to warn Ficino of what is happening in Milan, but Ficino. The man is ill. He could do nothing if he would, so I come on to you. And now, leaning forward, and scarcely pausing to draw breath, he launched the news he had ridden so desperately to bring. Della Torre is back in Milan, recalled by John Maria. Balerian waited, but nothing further came. Well, man, he asked, is that all? All? Does it mean so little to you that you ask that? Don't you know that this damned Guelph, whom Ficino banished when he should have hanged him, has been throughout the inspirer of all the evil that has been wrought against Ficino and against all the Ghibellines of Milan? Don't you understand that his return bodes ill? What can he do? What can John Maria do? Their wings are clipped. They are growing fresh ones. Venigono came to his feet again, his weariness forgotten in his excitement. Since Della Torre's secret return a month ago, orators have been sent to Theodore of Montferrat, to the battered Vignetti, to the Esti, and even to Estor Visconti, to invite them into a league. Balerian laughed. Let them league. If they are so mad as to do so, Ficino will smash their league into shards when this Bogumo business is over. You forget that under his hand is the strongest army in Italy today. We muster over 12,000 men. My God! I seem to be listening to Ficino himself. Venigono slobbered in his excitement, his eyes wild. It was thus he answered me. Why, then, have troubled to come to me? In the hope that you would see what he will not. You talk as if the army were all. You forget that John Maria is a thing of venom, like the emblem of his accursed house. Where there is venom and the will to use it, beware the occasion. If anything should happen to Ficino, what hope will remain for the Ghibellines of Milan? What should happen to Ficino? At what are you hinting, man? Venigono looked at him between rage and compassion. Where is Mombelli? he asked. Why is he not with Ficino now that Ficino needs him? Do you know? But is he not with Ficino? Has he not yet arrived? 
Arrived. Why was he ever withdrawn? To be made physician to the duke. A pretext, my friend, to deprive Ficino of his healing services. Do you know that since his coming to Milan he has not been seen? There are rumours that he is dead, that the duke has murdered him. Balerion considered. Then he shrugged. Your imagination fools you, Venigono. If John Maria proposed to strike Ficino, he would surely attempt something more active and effective. It may be little, I confess. But it is a straw that points the way of the wind. A straw, indeed, Balerion agreed. But in any case, what do you require of me? You have not told me that. That you take a strong detachment of your men and repair at once to Milan to curb the Duke's evil intentions and to deal with Della Torre. For that my lord's orders would be necessary. My duty is here, Venegono, and I dare not neglect it. Nor is the matter so urgent. It can wait until Bergamo has been reduced, which will not be long. Too long, it may be. But not all the passionate pleading with which he now distressed Balerion could turn the latter from his clear duty, or communicate to him any of the vague alarms which agitated Venigono. And so, at last, he went his ways in despair, protesting that both Balerion and Ficino were beset with the blindness of those whom the gods wished to destroy. Balerion, however, saw in Venigono's warning no more than an attempt to use him for the execution of a private vengeance. Three days later he thought he had confirmation of this. It came in a letter bearing Ficino's signature, but penned in the crabbed and pointed hand of the countess, who had been summoned from Malegnano to minister to her lord. It informed Balerion that the physician Mombelli had come at last in response to Ficino's request, and that Ficino hoped soon to be afoot again. Indeed, there was already a perceptible improvement in his condition. So much for Venigono's rumours that Mombelli has been murdered, said Balerion to himself, and laughed at the scaremongering of that credulous hothead. But he thought differently when after another three days a second letter reached him signed by the countess herself. My lord begs you to come to him at once, she wrote. He is so ill that Messer Mombelli despairs of him. Do not lose a moment, or you may be too late. He was more deeply stirred by that summons than by anything he could remember. If those who accounted him hard and remorselessly calculating could have seen him in that moment, the tears filming his eyes at the very thought of losing this man whom he loved, they must have formed a gentler opinion of his nature. He sent at once for Carmagnola, and ordered a strong horse to be saddled and twenty lances to prepare to ride with him. Ride with him, however, they did not. They followed for he rode like one possessed of devils. In three hours he covered the forty miles of difficult road that lay between Bergamo and Pavia, leaving one horse founded and arriving on a second one that was spent by the time he reached Filippo Maria's stronghold. Down he flung from it in the great courtyard, and, staggering and bespattered, he mounted the main staircase so wide and of such shallow steps that it was possible to ascend it on horseback. Without pausing to see the prince, he had himself conducted straight to Ficino's chamber, and there under the damask hung canopy he found his adoptive father supine, inert, his countenance leaden-hued, looking as if he were laid out in death, save for his stertorous breathing and the fire that still glowed in the eyes under their tufted, fulvid brows. Balerion went down on his knees beside the bed, and took, in both his own that were so warm and strong, the cold, heavy hand that lay upon the coverlet. The grey head rolled a little on its pillow, the ghost of a smile irradiated the strong, rugged face, the fingers of the cold hand faintly pressed Balerion's. Good lad, you have lost no time, he said, in a weak, rasping voice. And there is no time to lose. I am sped. Indeed, my body's dead already. Mombelli says the gout is mounting to my heart. Balerion looked up. Beyond the bed stood the countess, fretful and troubled. At the foot was Mombelli, and in the background a servant. Is this so? he asked the physician. Can your skill avail nothing here? He is in God's hands, said Mombelli, mumbling indistinctly. Send them away, said Ficino, 
and his eyes indicated Mombelli and the servant. There is little time, and I have things to tell you. We must take order for what's to follow. The orders did not amount to very much. He required of Balerion that he should afford the Countess his protection, and he recommended to him also Filippo Maria. When John Galizzo died, he left his sons in my care. I go to meet him with clean hands. I have discharged my trust, and dying I hand it on to you. Remember always that John Maria is Duke of Milan, and whatever the shortcomings he may show, for your own sake if not for his, practice loyalty to him, as you would have your own captains be loyal to you. When at last, wearied, and announcing his desire to rest, Ficino bade him go, Valerian found Mombelli pacing in the Hall of Mirrors, and sent him to Ficino. I shall remain here within call, he said, and oblivious of his own fatigue he paced in his turn that curious floor whereon birds and beasts were figured in mosaics under the gaudy flashing ceiling of coloured glass, whence the place derived its name. There Mombelli found him a half hour later, when he emerged. He sleeps now, he said. The Countess is with him. It is not yet the end? Balerion asked. Not yet. The end is when God wills. He may linger for some days. Balerion looked sharply at the doctor, considered him, indeed, now for the first time since his arrival. This Mombelli was a man of little more than thirty-five. He had been vigorous of frame, inclining a little to portliness, rubicund if grave of countenance with strong white teeth and bright dark eyes. Balerion beheld now an emaciated man upon whose shrunken frame a black velvet gown hung in loose folds. His face was pale, his eyes dull, but oddest of all the very shape of his face had changed, his jaw had fallen in, so that nose and chin were brought closer like those of an old man, and when he spoke he hissed and mumbled indistinctly over toothless gums. By the host, man, what has happened to you? Mombelli shrank visibly from the questions and from the stern eyes that seemed to search his very soul. I, I have been ill, he faltered. Very ill. It is a miracle I am alive today. But your teeth, man? I have lost them as you see. A consequence of my disease. A horrible suspicion was sprouting in Balerion's mind, nourished by the memory of the rumour of this man's death which Venigono had reported. He took the doctor by the sleeve of his velvet gown, and drew him towards one of the double windows. His shrinking, his obvious reluctance to undergo this closer inspection, was so much added food to Balerion's suspicion. How do you call this disease? he asked. Clearly, from his hesitancy, Mombelli had been unprepared for the question. It, it is a sort of pedagric affection, he mumbled. And your thumb, why is that bandaged? Terror leapt to Mombelli's eyes. His toothless jaws worked fearfully. That, that is not an injury. Take off the bandage. Take it off, man. I desire to see this injury. Do you hear me? At last Mombelli with shaking fingers stripped the bandage from his left thumb, and displayed it naked. Balerion went white, and his eyes were dreadful. You have been tortured, Master Doctor. John Maria has subjected you to his Lent. This Lent of John Maria's invention was a torment lasting forty days, on each of which one or more teeth were torn from the patient's jaws, then day by day a fingernail, whereafter followed the eyes and finally the tongue, whereupon the sufferer being rendered dumb and unable to confess what was desired, he was shown at last the mercy of being put to death. Mombelli's livid lips moved frantically, but no words came. He reeled where he stood until he found the wall to steady him, and Balerion watched him with those dreadful, searching eyes. To what end did he torture you? What did he desire of you? I have not said he tortured me. It is not true. You have not said it. No, but your condition says it. You have not said it, because you dare not. Why did he do this? And why did he desist? Balerion gripped him by the shoulders. Answer me. To what did the torments undergone suffice to constrain you? Will you answer me? Oh God, groaned the physician, sagging limply against the wall, 
and looking as if he would faint. But there was no pity in Balerion's face. Come with me, he said, and it was almost by main force that he dragged the wretched doctor across that hall out to the gallery, and down the wide steps to the great court. Here under the arcade some men-at-arms of Ficino's bodyguard were idling. Into their hands Balerion delivered Mombelli. To the question chamber, he said shortly. Mombelli, shattered in nerve and sapped of manhood by his sufferings, cried out, piteously inarticulate. Pitilessly Balerion waved him away, and the soldiers bore him off, screaming, to the stone chamber under the northeastern tower. There, in the middle of the uneven stone floor, stood the dread framework of the rack. Balerion, who had followed, ordered them to strip him. The men were reluctant to do the office of executioners, but under the eyes of Balerion, standing as implacable as the god of wrath, they set about it, nevertheless, and all the while the broken man's cries for mercy filled that vaulted place with an ever-mounting horror. At the last, half-naked, he broke from the men's hands and flung himself at Balerion's feet. In the name of the sweet Christ, my lord, take pity on me, I can bear no more. Hang me if you will, but do not let me be tortured again. Balerion looked down on the groveling, slobbering wretch with an infinite compassion in his soul. But there was no sign of it on his countenance or in his voice. You have but to answer my question, sir, and you shall have your wish. You shall be hanged without further suffering. Why did the duke torture you, and why did the torture cease when it did? To what importunities did you yield? Already you have guessed it, my lord. That is why you use me so, but it is not just. As God's my witness, it is not just. What am I but a poor man caught in the toils of the evil desires of others? As long as God gave me the strength to resist, I resisted. But I could bear no more. There was no price at which I would not have purchased respite from that horror. Death I could have borne had that been all they threatened. But I had reached the end of my endurance of pain. Oh, my lord, if I were a villain there would have been no torture to endure. They offered me bribes, bribes great enough to dazzle a poor man, that would have left me rich for the remainder of my days. When I refused, they threatened me with death unless I did their infamous will. Those threats I defied. Then they subjected me to this protracted agony which the Duke impiously calls his Lent. They drew my teeth, brutally with unutterable violence, two each day until all were gone. Broken and most starved as I was, distracted by pain, which for a fortnight had been unceasing, they began upon my fingernails. But when they tore the nail from my left thumb, I could bear no more. I yielded to their infamy. Valerian made a sign to the men, and they pulled Mombelli to his feet. But his eyes dared not meet the terrible glance of Balerion. You yielded to their demands that, under the pretense of curing him, you should poison my lord Ficino. That is the thing to which you yielded. But when you say they whom do you mean? The Duke John Maria and Antonio della Torre. Balerion remembered Venigono's warning, he is a thing of venom, like the emblem of his house. Poor wretch, said Balerion. You deserve some mercy, and you shall have it, provided you can undo what you have done. Alas, my lord, Mombelli groaned, wringing his hands in a passion of despair. Alas, there is no antidote to that poison. It works slowly gradually corroding the intestines. Hang me, my lord, and have done. Had I been less of a coward, I would have hanged myself before I did this thing. But the duke threatened that if I failed him the torture should be resumed and continued until I died of sheer exhaustion. Also he swore that my refusal would not save my lord Ficino, whom he would find other means of despatching. Balerion stood between loathing and compassion. But there was no thought in his mind of hanging this poor wretch, who had been the victim of that malignant duke. He uttered an order in cold, level tones, Restore him his garments and place him in confinement until I send for him again. On that he departed from that underground chamber, and slowly, thoughtfully made his way above. By the time he reached the courtyard his resolve was taken, though his neck should pay for it, John Maria should not escape. 
For the first and only time in those adventurous years of his did he swerve from the purpose by which he laid his course, and turn his hand to a task that was not more or less directly concerned with its ultimate fulfillment. And so, without pausing for rest or food, you behold him once more in the saddle, riding hard for Milan on that Monday afternoon. He conceived that he bore thither the first news of Ficino's moribund condition. But rumour had been ahead of him by a day and a half, and the rumour ran, not that Ficino was dying, but that he was already dead. In all the instances history affords of poetic justice to give pause to those who offend against God and man, none is more arresting than that of the fate of John Maria Visconti. Already on the previous Friday word had reached the Duke, not only from Mombelli, but from at least one of the spies he had placed in his brother's household, that the work of poisoning was done and that Ficino's hours were numbered. Gloating with Della Torre and Lonate over the assurance that at last the ducal neck was delivered from that stern heel under which so long it had writhed like the serpent of evil under the heel of Saint Michael, John Maria had been unable to keep the knowledge to himself. About the court on that same Friday night he spoke unguardedly of Ficino as dead or dying, and from the court the news filtered through to the city and was known to all by the morning of Saturday. And that news carried with it a dismay more utter and overwhelming than any that had yet descended upon Milan since John Maria had worn the ducal crown. Ficino, when wielding the authority of ducal governor, had been the people's bulwark against the extortions, brutalities, and criminal follies of their duke. When absent and deposed from power, he had still been their hope, and they had possessed their soul as best they could against the day of his return, which they knew must dawn. But Ficino dead meant an unbridling of the duke's bestiality, a free charter to his misrule, and for his people an outlook of utter hopelessness. It may be that they exaggerated in their own minds this calamity. It was for them the end of the world. Despair settled that morning upon the city. The duke would have laughed if it had been reported to him, because he lacked the wit to perceive that when men are truly desperate catastrophes ensue. And at once, whilst the great mass of the people were stricken by horror into a dull inertia, there were those who saw that the situation called for action. Of these were members of the leading Ghibelline families of Baggio, of Del Meno, Travolzi, Alaprandi, and others. There was that Bettino Mantegazza, captain of the ducal guard whose face the duke had one day broken with his iron gauntlet, and fiercest and most zealous of all there was that Giovanni Pustola of Venegono, whose family had suffered such deep and bitter wrongs at the duke's hands. There was no suspicion in the mind of any that the duke himself was responsible for the death of Ficino. It was simply that Ficino's death created a situation only to be met by the destruction of the duke. And this situation the duke himself had been at such hideous pains to bring about. And so, briefly to recapitulate here a page of Visconti history, it came to pass that on the Monday morning, which was the first day of the Litany of May, as John Maria, gaily clad in his colours of red and white, was issuing from his bedroom to repair to Mass in the church of San Gotthard, he found in the antechamber a score of gentlemen not latterly seen about his court. Mantagaza, who had command of the entrance, was responsible for their presence. Before the Duke could comment upon this unusual attendance, perhaps before he had well observed it, three of them were upon him. This from the pustola, cried Venigono, and with his dagger clove the duke's brow, slaying him instantly. Yet before he fell Andrea Baggio's blade was buried in his right thigh, so that presently that white-stockinged leg was as red as its fellow. As a consequence, Balerion reaching Milan at dusk that evening found entrance denied him at the Ticinese gate, which was held by Paolo del Baggio with a strong following of men-at-arms. Not until he had disclosed himself for Ficino's lieutenant was he admitted and informed of what had taken place. The irony of the event provoked in him a terrible mirth. Poor purblind fool, was his comment. He never guessed when he was torturing Mombelli that he was torturing him into signing his own death warrant. That, and the laugh with which he rode on into the city, left Baggio wondering whether his wits had turned. He rode through streets in uproar, where almost every man he met was armed. Before the broken door of a half-shattered house hung some revolting bleeding rags, what once had been a man. 
These were all that remained of Squasher Geramo, the infamous kennelmaster who had been torn into pieces that day by the mob, and finally hung there before his dwelling which on the morrow was to be razed to the ground. He came to the old Broletto and the church of St. Gotthard, and paused there to survey the duke's body where it lay under an apronful of roses which had been cast upon it by a harlot. Thence he repaired to the stables of the palace, and by making himself known procured a fresh horse. On this he made his way through the ever-increasing tumult of the streets, back to the Tissanese gate, and he was away through the darkness to cover for the second time that day the twenty miles that lie between Milan and Pavia. It was past midnight when, so jaded that he kept his feet by a sheer effort of the will, he staggered into Filippo Maria's bedchamber, ushered by the servant who had preceded him to rouse the prince. Filippo Maria sat up in bed, blinking in the candlelight, at that tall, swaying figure that was almost entirely clothed in mud. Is that you, Lord Balerion? You will have heard that Ficino is dead, God rest his soul. A harsh, croaking voice made him answer, I, and avenged, Lord Duke. A quiver crossed the pale fat face under its sleek black cap of hair. The coarse lips parted. Lord. Lord Duke, you said? The high-pitched voice was awe-stricken. Your brother John Maria is dead, my lord, and you are Duke of Milan. Duke of Milan? I am. The grotesque young face showed bewilderment, confusion, fear. And John Maria. Dead, do you say? Valerian did not mince matters. He was despatched to hell this morning by some gentlemen in Milan. Jesus Mary croaked the prince, and fell to trembling. Murdered. And you. He heaved himself higher in the bed with one arm, whilst he flung out the other in accusation. He did not love his brother. He profited greatly by his death. But a Visconti does not permit that others shall lay hands on a Visconti. Valerian laughed oddly. He had been forestalled. Perhaps it was as well. No need now to speak of his intentions. He was slain on his way to Mass this morning, at just about the hour that I arrived here from Bogumo. The accusing arm fell heavily to the prince's obese flank. The beady, lacklustre eyes still peered at the young condottiero. Almost I thought. And John Nino is dead murdered. God rest him. The phrase was mechanical. Tell me about it. Valerian recited what he knew, then staggered out, on the arm of the servant who was to conduct him to the room prepared for him. What a world! What a dunghill! he muttered as he went. And how well the old abbot knows it. Pax multa in cella, foris autumn plurima bella. 6. The Inheritance. Ficino Cain, Count of Biandrate, Lord of Novara, Dertona, Varese, Rosate, Valsassina, and of all the lands on Lake Maggiore as far as Vagogna, was buried with great pomp in the church of San Pietro in Sile d'Oro. His chief mourners were his captains summoned from Bergamo to do that last honour to their departed leader. At their head, as mourner-in-chief, walked Ficino's adoptive son Balerian Cain, Count of Garvi. The others included Francesco Buswan of Carmagnola, Giorgio Valperga, Nicolino Marzalia, Werner von Stoffel, and Vorjois the Burgundian. Konigshofen and the Piedmontese Gersone Trotter were absent, having remained at Bergamo with the army. Thereafter the captains assembled in the Hall of Mirrors to hear the will and last instructions of Ficino. To read them came Ficino's secretary, accompanied by the Pavis notary who had drawn up the testament three days ago. Thither also came the countess, robed entirely in black and heavily veiled. The rich and important fief of Valsassina was now disclosed to have been left by Ficino to his adoptive son Balerian, in earnest of my love and to recompense his loyalty and worth. Apart from that and a legacy in money for Carmagnola, the whole of his vast territorial possessions of cities, lands, and fortresses mostly acquired since he had been deposed in favour of Molotesta, besides the enormous sum of 400,000 ducats, were all bequeathed to his widow. He expressed the wish that Balerian should succeed him in the command of his condotta, and reminding his other captains that strength lies in unity he recommended them to remain united under Balerian's leadership, 
at least until the task of restoring order to the duchy should be fulfilled. To his captains also he recommended his widow, putting it upon them to see her firmly established in the dominions he bequeathed to her. When the reading was done, the captains rose in their places and turned to Madonna Beatrice where she sat like an ebony statue at the table's head. Carmagnola, ever theatrical, ever a man of attitudes, drew his sword with a flourish and laid it on the board. Madonna, to you I surrender the authority I held under my lord Ficino, and I leave it in your hands until such time as it shall please you to reinvest me in it. The ceremonious gesture caught the fancy of the others. Valperga followed the example instantly, and presently five swords lay naked on the oak. To these, Balerion, after a moment, a little scornful of this ritual, as he was of all unnecessary displays, added his own. The Countess rose. She thanked them in a voice that shook with emotion, and one by one restored their weapons to them, naming each as she did so. Balerion's, however, she left upon the board, wherefore Balerion, wondering a little, remained when she dismissed the others. Slowly then she resumed her seat. Slowly she raised and threw back her veil, disclosing a face, which beyond a deeper pallor resulting, perhaps, from contrast with her sable raiment, showed little trace of grief. Her feline eyes considered him, a little frown between their fine black brows. You were the last to offer me that homage, Balerion. Her voice was slow and softly attuned. Why did you hesitate? Are you reluctant? It was a gesture, Madonna, that becomes the Carmagnolas of this world. Sincerity requires no symbols, and it was only at the symbol that I boggled. My service and my life are unreservedly at your command. There was a pause. Her eyes continued to ponder him. Take up your sword, she said at last. He moved to do so, and then checked. Yourself you restored theirs to the others. The others are not as you. Upon you has fallen the mantle of Ficino. How much of that mantle will you wear, Valerian? As much of it as my lord intended. You have heard his testament, Madonna. But not your own interpretation of it. Have I not said that my life and services are at your command, as my lord, to whom I owe everything, enjoined upon me? Your life and services, she said slowly. Her breast heaved as if in repressed agitation. That is much to offer, Balerion. Do you ask nothing in return? I offer these in return for all that I have received already. It is I who make payment, Madonna. Again there was a baffled pause. She sighed heavily. You make it hard for me, Balerion. There was a pathetic break in her voice. What do I make hard? She rose, and in evident timidity came to stand before him. She set a white hand on the black velvet sleeve of his tunic. Her lovely face, with which time had dealt so mercifully, was upturned to his, and there was now no arrogance in its lines or in her glance. She spoke quietly, wistfully. You may think, Valerian, that with my lord scarce buried this is not the hour for what I have to say. And yet, by the very fact of my lord's death and by the very terms of his testament, this is the hour, because it must be the hour of decision. Here and now we must determine what is to follow. Tall and coldly stern he stood, looking down upon her who swayed a little there, so close to him that his nostrils were invaded by the subtle essences she used. I await your commands, Madonna. My commands, my commands, dear God, what commands have I for you? She looked away for an instant, then brought her eyes back to his face and her other hand to his other sleeve, so that she held him completely captive now. A faint colour stirred in the pale cheeks. My Lord has left me great possessions. They might serve as a footstool to help you mount to a great destiny. A little smile hovered about his lips as he looked down upon her who waited so breathlessly, her breast now touching his own. You are offering me, he said, and stopped. Can you be in doubt of what I am offering? It is the hour of great decisions, Valerian, for me and for you. Closer she pressed, so that her weight was against him. She was deathly pale again 
her eyes were veiled. In unity is strength. That was Ficino's last reminder to us. And in what unity could there be greater strength than in ours? Ficino's army, the strongest that ever followed him, is solidly behind us so that we stand together. With that and my resources you need set no bounds to your ambition. You may be Duke of Milan if you will. You may even realize Galizo's dream and make yourself king of Italy. His hovering smile settled and deepened. But the dark eyes grew sad. The world and you have never suspected, he said gently, that I am not really ambitious. You have witnessed my rise in four short years from a poor nameless, starveling scholar to knighthood, lordships, wealth, and fame, and, therefore, you imagine that I am one who has striven for the bounties of fortune. It is not so, Madonna. I have labored for ends that are nowise bound up with the hope of any of these rewards, which I hold cheap. They are hollow vanities, empty bubbles, gewgaws to delight the children of the world. Possessions come to me, titles, honors, which deceive me no more than I desired them. She drew away from him a little, and looked at him almost in awe. God, you talk like a monk. It is possible that I think like one, and very natural remembering how I was nurtured. There is one task, one purpose which has detained me in this world of men. When that is accomplished, I think I shall go back to the cell where there is peace. You. Her hands had fallen from his arms. She gasped now in her amazement. With the world at your feet if you choose. To renounce all. To go back to the chill loneliness and joylessness of monkhood. Balerian, you are mad. Or else sane, Madonna. Who shall judge? And love, Balerian. Is there no love in the world? Does that not lend reality to all these things that you deem shams? Does it heal the vanity of the world? He cried. It is a great power, as I perceive. For love men will go mad, they will become beasts, they will murder and betray. Heretic. That startled him a little. Once before he had been dubbed heretic for beliefs to which he clung with assurance, and experience had come to lay bare his heresy to his own eyes. Upon occasion, Madonna, we have talked of love, you and I. Had I given heed, had your beauty beglamoured me. What a treacherous thing should I not have been in Ficino's eyes. Do you wonder that I mistrust love as I mistrust all else the world can offer me? While Ficino lived, that. She broke off. Her eyes were on the ground, her hands now folded in her lap. She had drawn away from him a little and leaned against the table's edge. Now. She parted her hands and held them out, leaving him to guess her mind. Now his behests are upon me and they shall be obeyed as if he still lived. What is there in his behests against, against what I was offering? Am I not commended to you by his testament? Am I not a part of his legacy to you? The service of you is, and your loyal servant, Madonna, you shall ever find me. She turned aside with a little gesture of irritation, and remained silent, thoughtful. A sleek secretary broke in upon them. The Count of Pavia commanded the Lord Balerian's presence in the library. A courier had just arrived from Milan with grave news. Say to his highness that I come. The secretary withdrew. You give me leave, Madonna? She stood leaning sideways against the heavy table, her face averted. Aye, you may go. Her voice rasped. But he waited yet a moment. The sword, Madonna, will you not arm me with your own hands for your service? She turned her head to look at him again, and there was now a curl of disdain on her pale lips. I thought you looked askance on symbols. Was not that your profession? She paused, but, without waiting for his answer, added, Take up your sword, yourself, you that are so fully master of your own destinies. And on that she turned and went, trailing her funereal draperies over the gay mosaics of that patterned floor. He remained where she left him until she had passed out of that great hall and the door had closed. Then, at last, he fetched a sigh and went to restore his blade to its scabbard.
His thoughts were on Ficino hardly cold in the grave, on this widow who had so shamelessly wooed him, yet in terms which demanded as a condition the satisfaction of her inordinate ambition, and lastly on that obese young prince who waited for him. And in the mirror of his mind he saw a reflection of a scene now some months old. He saw again the glance of those beady, lecherous eyes lambent about Ficino's countess. Inspiration came to him of how best he might gratify her vast ambition, her greed of greatness. Her suggestion to him had been that he should make her Duchess of Milan, and Duchess of Milan he would make her yet. On that half-ironic thought he came to the library where the prince waited. Filippo Maria was seated at a table near one of the windows. Spread before him were some parchments, writing materials, and a horn of unicorn that was almost a yard long, of solid ivory, one of the library's most treasured possessions. The prince was more than usually pallid, his glance unsteady, his manner nervous and agitated. Perfunctorily he made the inquiries concerning the obsequies of Ficino which courtesy demanded. He reiterated excuses already made for his own absence from the ceremony, an absence really based on resentment of the yoke which Ficino had imposed upon him. That done, he picked up a parchment from the table. Here's news, he said, and his voice trembled. Estor Visconti has been created Duke of Milan. He paused, and the little dark eyes blinked up at the tall Balerian standing composed at his side. You knew already? Not so, Highness. And you show no surprise. It is a bold step, and it may cost Messer Estor his head. But it was to be expected from what had gone before. The beady eyes returned to the parchment, which shook in the podgy fingers. Fra Berto Cacchia, the Bishop of Piacenza, preached a sermon to the people lauding the murder of my brother, and promising in Estor's name a golden age for Milan, with immunity from taxation. Thereupon they laid at his bastard feet the keys of the city, the standard of the Republic, and the ducal scepter. He dropped the parchment, and sat back folding plump, white hands across his paunch. This calls for action, speedily. We can provide action enough to surfeit Messer Estor. Ha! Huh. The great flabby face grew almost kindly, the little eyes beamed upon the condottiero. Serve me well in this, Balerian, and you shall know gratitude. Balerian's gesture seemed to wave the notion of reward aside. He came straight to facts. We can withdraw 8,000 men from Bergamo. The place is at the point of surrender, and 4,000 will well suffice to tighten the last grip upon the Molotesta vitals. Perhaps the Lord Estor has not included that in his calculations. With 8,000 men we can sweep him out of Milan at our pleasure. And you'll give orders. You'll give orders at once. The army, they tell me, is now in your control. Ficino's authority has descended to you, and has been accepted by your brother captains. And now this arch-dissembler went to work. Hardly so much, Highness. Ficino's captains have sworn fealty, not to me, but to the Lady Beatrice. But, but you, then? The news dismayed him a little. What place is yours? At your Highness's side, if your Highness commands me. Yes. Yes. But whom do you command? Where, exactly, do you stand now? At the head of the army in any enterprise into which the Countess sends her captains. The Countess. The Prince shifted his bulk uneasily in his chair, slewing round so as to face the soldier more fully. What then if? What if the Countess should not? He waved his fat hands helplessly. It is not likely that the Countess should oppose your own wishes, Highness. Not likely, but, Lord of Heaven, it's possible. He heaved himself up, nervous, agitated. I must know. I must. I'll send for her. He reached for a handbell on the table. But Balerion's hand closed over his own before he could ring. A moment, Lord Prince. Before you send for the Lady Beatrice, had you not best consider precisely what you will say to her? What is to say beyond discovering her disposition towards me? Can you entertain a doubt upon that, Lord Prince? Balerion was smiling. 
Their hands came away together from the bell, and fell apart. Her disposition towards your potency is, to my knowledge, of the very kindliest. Such, indeed, that I'll be frank with you, I found it necessary once to remind her of her duty to her lord. Ah, the fat pale face quivered into something akin to malevolence. The prince remembered a sudden coolness in the countess and her removal to Malegnano, and perceived in this meddler's confession the explanation of it. By Saint Ambrose, that was bold of you. I am accounted bold, Valerian reminded him, deeming it necessary. I, I, the shifty eyes fell away uncomfortably under his glance. But if she is kindly disposed, then. I know that she was, Highness, and may be rendered so again, though perhaps less easily now than heretofore. Less easily? Why so? As for Sino's widow, she is in wealth and power the equal of many a prince in Italy. She has considerable dominions. Torn by Ficino from the great heritage left by the Duke my father. In that rare burst of indignation his whole bulk quivered like a great jelly. They might be restored to the ducal crown by peaceful arts. Peaceful arts? What arts? Will you be plain? But the time for direct answers was not yet. And not only has the Countess lands, but the control of a vast fortune. Some 400,000 ducats. You will need money, Highness, for the pay of this great army now under Bergamo, and your own treasury will hardly supply it. There is taxation. But your Highness knows the ills that wait on that for a prince newly come into his own. And not only the lands and money of which your Highness stands in need, but the men also does the Countess bring. You but repeat yourself. Balerion looked at him, and smiled. Never, do I believe, did a prince find a bride more richly dowered. A bride? The youth was startled, terrified almost. A bride? Would less content your highness? Would you be satisfied to receive the assistance of the countess's possessions, when you may make them your own and wield them at your pleasure? He stared, his jaw fallen. Then slowly he brought his lips together again, and licked them thoughtfully, screwing up his mean eyes. You are proposing that I should take to wife Ficino's widow, who is twice my age? He asked the question very slowly, as if pondering each word of it. Valerian laughed. Not proposing it, Highness. It is not for me to make such proposals. I do not even know what the lady will say. But if she is willing to become Duchess of Milan, she can provide the means to make you Duke. Filippo Maria sat down suddenly. The sweat broke from his pale brow. He mopped it with his hand, disturbing the black fringe that disfigured it. Then, lost in thought, he stroked the loose folds of his enormous chin, and gradually his eyes kindled. At long length he put forth his hand again to the bell. This time Balerion did not interfere. He perceived in the act the young prince's surrender to the forces of greed and lust which Balerion himself had loosed against him. He took his leave, and went out with the sad knowledge that greed and wantonness would make of the woman, too, a ready prey. His work was done. She should have the thing she coveted, and find in it her punishment. 7. Prince of Valsassana As Balerion had calculated and disposed, so things fell out, and Filippo Maria Visconti in the twenty-second year of his age led to the altar the widowed Countess of Biandrate who was thirty-nine. As a young girl, she had married, at the bidding of ambition, a man who was twenty years her senior, as a middle-aged woman now, and for the same reason, she married one who was almost as much her junior. She had not the foresight to perceive that the grievance on the score of disparity of years which she had nursed against Ficino would be nursed against herself to her ultimate destruction by this sly, furtive, and cruel prince to whom now she gave herself and her vast possessions. That, however, is no part of the story I have set myself to tell. Estor Visconti defended in vain his usurped dominion against John Maria's legitimate successor. Filippo Maria, with Carmagnola in command of some 7,000 men, laid siege to Milan, whilst Balerion went north to make an end of the Bergamo resistance. Because in haste to have done, he granted Molatesta easy terms of surrender, 
permitting him to ride out of the city with the honours of war, lance on thigh. Thereafter, having restored order in Bagamo and left there a strong garrison under an officer of trust, he marched with the main army to join Filippo Maria who was conducting operations from the mills on Monte Lupario, three miles from Milan. Some four weeks already had he spent there, with little progress made. Estor had enrolled and constrained to the defence of the city almost every man of an age to bear arms. It was necessary to make an end, and Balerion himself with a few followers entered the castle of Porta Giovia which was being held against a store by Vimercati, the Castellan. From its walls, having attracted the people by trumpet blast, he published Filippo Maria's proclamation, wherein the prince solemnly undertook that if the city were at once surrendered to him it should have nothing to fear, that there should be no pillage, executions, or other measures punitive of this resistance to the state's legitimate lord. The news flew in every direction, with the result that before nightfall all those whom Astor had constrained to follow him had fallen away, and he was left with only his mercenaries. With these, next morning, he hacked a way out through the Comicina gate as the people were throwing open to the new duke the gates of the city on the other side. Filippo Maria entered with a comparatively small following and in the wake of a train of breadcarts sent ahead to relieve the famine which already was beginning to press upon the inhabitants. The acclamations of Live the Duke quieted his natural timidity as he rode through the streets to shut himself up in the castle of Porta Giovia, which remained ever afterwards his residence. Not for Filippo Maria the palace of the old broletto or the gaiety of courts. His dark, scheming, yet pusillanimous nature craved the security of a stronghold. For assisting him to the ducal throne, and no doubt to ensure their continued support, he rewarded his captains generously, and none more generously than Balerion to whom he considered that he owed everything. Balerion was not only confirmed in the lordship of Valsassana in feud, for himself and his heirs forever, but the duke raised the fief into a principality. Valerian remained the duke's marshal in chief and military adviser, and it was by the dispositions which he made during that summer and autumn of 1412 that the lands of the duchy were finally cleared of the insurgent brigands who had renewed their depredations. Peace being restored at home, and industry being liberated at last from the trammels that had lain upon it since the death of John Galizo, prosperity flowed swiftly back to the state of Milan, and the people heaped blessings upon the shy, furtive ruler of whom they saw so little. It is possible that Filippo Maria would have been content to rest for the present upon what was done, to leave the frontiers of the duchy as he found them, and to dismiss the greater part of the costly condottas in his employ. But Balerion at his elbow goaded him to further enterprise, and met his sluggish reluctance with a culminating argument that shamed him into action. Will you leave, in tranquil possession, the brigands who have encroached upon the glorious patrimony built up by your illustrious father, will you dishonour his memory and be false to your name, Lord Duke? Thus, and similarly, Balerion, with a heat that was purely histrionic. He cared no more for the integrity of John Galizo's patrimony than he cared for that of the Kingdom of England. What he cared for was that the order to dispossess those tyrants would sound the knell of Theodore of Montferrat. Thus, at last, should he be enabled to complete the service, to which five years ago he had dedicated himself, and to which unfalteringly, if obscurely and tortuously, he had held. Very patiently had he waited for this hour, when, yielding at last to his bold importunities, the duke summoned a council of the officers of state and the chief condottieri to determine the order in which action should be taken. At once Balerion urged that a beginning should be made by recovering Vercelli, than which few strongholds were of more importance to the safety of the duchy. It provoked a protest from Beccaria, who was the duke's minister of state. An odd proposal this from you, Lord Balerion, remembering that it was by your own action in concert with the Count of Biandrate that the Marquis Theodore was placed in possession of Vercelli. Balerion crushed him with his logic. Not odd, sir, natural. Then I was on the other side. And if, being on the other side, I conceived it important that Theodore should hold Vercelli, now that I am opposed to him I conceive it equally important that he should be driven from it. There was a pause. 
Filippo Maria, somnolent in his great chair, looked round the group. What is the military view? he asked. He had noticed that not one of the captains had voiced an opinion. He was answered now by the burly Königshofen. I have no views that are not Balerians. I have followed him long enough to know that he's a safe man to follow. Gisone Trotter, uninvited, expressed the same sentiment. Filippo Maria turned to Carmagnola, who sat silent and thoughtful. And you, sir, he asked. Carmagnola reared his blonde head, and Balerian braced himself for battle. But to his amazement, for once, for the first time in their long association, Carmagnola was on his side. I am of Balerian's mind, magnificent. We who were with my lord Ficino when he made alliance with Theodore of Montferrat, no Theodore for a crafty, daring man of boundless ambition. His occupation of Vercelli is a menace to the peace of the duchy. After that the other captains, Valperga and Marsilio, who had been wavering, threw in their votes, so that the military opinion was solidly unanimous. Filippo Maria balanced the matter for a moment. You are not forgetting, sirs, that for Theodore's good behaviour I have in my hands a precious hostage, in the person of his nephew, the Marquis John Giacomo, in whose name Theodore rules. You laugh, Balerian. That hostage was procured to ensure, not the good faith of Theodore, but the safety of the real Prince of Montferrat. Carmagnola has told your magnificence that Theodore is crafty, daring, and ambitious. It is a part of his ambition to make himself absolute sovereign where at present he is no more than regent. Let your magnificence judge if the thought of harm to the hostage you hold would be a deterrent to him. A while still they debated. Then Filippo Maria announced that he would take thought and make known his decision when it was reached. On that he dismissed them. As they went from the council chamber the captains witnessed the phenomenon of a yet closer unity between Balerian and Carmagnola. The new prince of Valsassina linked arms with Francesco Buswan and drew him away. You will do a service in this matter, Sir Francesco, if you send word to Lady Valeria and her brother urging them to come at once to Milan and petition the duke to place John Giacomo upon his throne. He is of full age and only his absence from Montferrat enables Theodore to continue in the regency. Carmagnola looked at him suspiciously. Why do you not send that message, yourself? Balerian shrugged and spread his hands a little. I have not the confidence of the princess. A message from me might be mistrusted. Carmagnola's fine blue eyes pondered him still with that suspicious glance. What game do you play? he asked. I see that you mistrust me, too. I ever have done. It's a compliment, said Balerian. If it is, I don't perceive it. If you did, you wouldn't pay it. You are direct, Carmagnola, and for that I honour you. I am not direct, and yet you may come to honour me for that too when you understand it, if you ever do. You ask what game I play. A game which began long ago, in which this is the last move. The alliance I brought about between Ficino and Theodore was a move in this game, the securing of the person of John Giacomo of Montferrat as a hostage was another, to make it possible for Theodore to occupy Vercelli and make himself Lord of Genoa, yet another. My only aim was to unbridle his greed so that he should become a menace to the duchy, against such a day as this, when on the duke's side it is my duty to advise his definite destruction. Carmagnola's eyes were wide, Amazement overspread his florid handsome face. By the bones of St. Ambrose, you play mighty deep. Balerian smiled. I am frank with you. I explain myself. It is tedious but necessary so as to conquer your mistrust and procure your cooperation. To make me a pawn in this game of yours. That is to describe yourself unflatteringly. Francesco Buswan of Carmagnola is no man's pawn. No, by God, I am glad you perceive that. Should I have explained myself if I did not, said Balerian to assure him of a fact of which clearly he was far from sure. Tell me why you so schemed and plotted. Balerian sighed. To amuse myself, perhaps. 
It interests me. Ficino said of me that I was a natural strategist. This broader strategy upon the great field of life gives scope to my inclinations. He was thoughtful, chin in hand. I do not think there is more in it than that. And abruptly he asked, you'll send that message? Carmagnola too considered. There was a dream that he had dreamed, a game that he could play, making in his turn a pawn of this crafty brother captain who sought to make a pawn of him. I'll go to Malegnino in person, he announced. He went, and there dispelled the fretful suspense in which the Princess Valeria waited for a justice of which she almost despaired. He dealt in that directness which was the only thing Valerian found to honour in him. But the directness now was in his manner only. Lady, I come to bid you take a hand in your own and your brother's reinstatement. Your petition to the Duke is all that is needed now to persuade him to the step which I have urged, to march against the usurper Theodore and cast him out. It took her breath away. You have urged this. You, my lord. Let me send for my brother that he may thank you, that he may know that he has at least one stout brave friend in the world. His friend and your servant, Madonna. He bore her white hand to his lips, and there were tears in her eyes as she looked upon his bowed handsome head. My hopes, my plans, my schemes for you are to bear fruit at last. Your schemes for me. Her brows were knit over her moist dark eyes. He laughed. A jovial, debonair, and laughter-loving gentleman, this Francesco Buswan of Carmagnola. So as to provide a cause disposing the Duke of Milan to proceed against the Regent Theodore. The hour has come, Madonna. It needs but your petition to Filippo Maria, and the army marches. So that I command it, I will see justice done to your brother. So that you command it. Who else should? Carmagnola's bright face was overcast. There is Balerian Cain. That knave. She recoiled, her countenance troubled. He is the regent's man. It was he who helped the regent to Vercelli and to the lordship of Genoa. Which he never could have done, Carmagnola assured her, but that I abetted him. I saw that thus I should provide a reason for action against the regent when later I should come to be on the duke's side. Ah, that was shrewd, to feed his ambition until he overreached himself. Carmagnola strutted a little. It was a deep game. But we are at the last move in it. If you mistrust this Balerian. Mistrust him. She laughed a bitter little laugh, and she poured forth the tale of how once he had been a spy sent by Theodore to embroil her, and how thereafter he had murdered her one true and devoted friend Count Spigno. Feeding her mistrust and bringing John Giacomo fully to share it, Carmagnola conducted them to Milan and procured audience for them with the Duke. Filippo Maria received her in a small room in the very heart of the fortress, a room to which he had brought something of the atmosphere of his library at Pavia. Here were the choicely bound manuscripts, and the writing table with its sheaves of parchment, and its horn of unicorn, which as all the world knows is a prophylactic against all manner of ills of the flesh and the spirit. Its double window looked out upon the court of San Donato where the October sunshine warmed the red brick to the colour of the rose. He gave her a kindly welcome, then settled into the inscrutable inertia of an obese eastern idol whilst she made her prayer to him. When it was done he nodded slowly, and dispatched his secretary in quest of the Prince of Valsassana. The name conveyed nothing to her, for she had not heard of Balerian's latest dignity. You shall have my decision later, Madonna. It is almost made already, and in the direction you desire. When I have conferred with the Prince of Valsassana upon the means at our command, I will send for you again. Meanwhile the Lord of Carmagnola will conduct you and your brother to my Duchess, whom it will delight to care for you. He cleared his throat. You have leave to go, he added in his shrill voice. They bowed, and were departing, when the returning secretary, opening the door, and holding up the arras that masked it, announced, the Prince of Valsassana. He came in erect and proud of bearing, for all that he still limped a little. His tunic was of black velvet edged with dark brown fur, a heavy gold chain hung upon his breast, 
a girdle of beaten gold gripped his loins and carried his stout dagger. His hose were in white and blue stripes. From the threshold he bowed low to the prince and then to Madonna Valeria, who was staring at him in sudden panic. She curtsied to him almost despite herself, and then made haste to depart with Carmagnola and her brother. But there was a weight of lead in her breast. If action against Theodore depended upon this man's counsel, what hope remained? She put that question to Carmagnola. He quieted her fears. After all, he is not omnipotent. Our fealty is not to him, but to the Duchess Beatrice. Win her to your side, and things will shape the course you desire, especially if I command the enterprise. And meanwhile this man whom she mistrusted was closeted with the Duke, and the Duke was informing him of this new factor in their plans against Montferrat. She desires us to break a lance in her brother's behalf. But Montferrat is loyal to Theodore. They have no opinion there of John Giacomo, and to impose by force of arms a prince upon a people is perhaps to render that people hostile to ourselves. If that were so, and I confess that I do not share your potency's apprehensions, it would still be the course I should presume to advise. In Theodore you have a neighbor whom ambition makes dangerous. In John Giacomo you have a mild and gentle youth, whose thoughts, since his conversion from debauchery, turn rather to religion than to deeds of arms. Place him upon the throne of his fathers, and you have in such a man not only a friendly neighbor but a grateful servant. Ha! Huh. You believe in gratitude, Valerian? I must, since I practice it. There followed that night a council of the captains, and since they were still nominally regarded as in the service of Ficino's widow, the Duchess herself attended it, and since the fortunes of the legitimate ruler of Montferrat was one of the issues, the Marquis John Giacomo and his sister were also invited to be present. The Duke, at the head of the long table, with the Duchess on his right and Balerion on his left, made known the intention to declare war immediately upon the regent of Montferrat upon two grounds, his occupation of the Milanese stronghold and lands of Vercelli, and his usurpation of the regency beyond the Marquis John Giacomo's attainment of full age. Of his captains now he desired an account of the means at their disposal, and afterwards a decision of those to be employed in the undertaking. Carmagnola came prepared with a computation of the probable forces which Theodore could levy and they were considerable, not less than 5,000 men. The necessary force to deal with him was next debated, having regard also to certain other enterprises to which Milan was elsewhere committed. At length this was fixed by Balerian. It was to consist of the Germans under Königshofen, Stoffel's Swiss, Gisone Trotter's Italian mercenaries, and Marsilio's Condotta, amounting in all to some 7,000 men. That would leave free for other eventualities the condottas of Valperga and of Carmagnola with whom were Ursiole Belluno and Ugolino D.A. Tender. Against this, and on the plea that the duke might require the services of the prince of Valsassina at home, Carmagnola begged that the enterprise against Montferrat should be confided to his leadership, his own condotta taking the place of Balerians, but all else remaining as Balerian disposed. The duke, showing in his pale face no sign of his surprise at this request, looked from Carmagnola to Balerian, appearing to ponder, what time the princess Valeria held her breath. At length the duke spoke. Have you anything to say to that, Valsassina? Nothing if your highness is content. You will remember that Theodore of Montferrat is one of the most skillful captains of the day, and if this business is not to drag on unduly, indeed if it is to be brought to a successful issue, you would do well to send against him of your best. A sly smile broke upon that sinisterly placid countenance. By which you mean yourself. For my part, said Königshofen, I do not willingly march under another. And for mine, said Stoffel, whilst Balerian lives I do not march under another at all. The duke looked at Carmagnola. You hear, sir? Carmagnola flushed uncomfortably. I had set my heart upon the enterprise, Lord Duke. The Princess Valeria interposed. By your leave, Highness, does my vote count for anything in this matter? Assuredly, Madonna. Your own and your brother's. 
Then, Lord Duke, my vote, indeed my prayer, is that my Lord of Carmagnola be given the command. The Duchess raised her long eyes to look at her in wonder. Balerion sat inscrutable. The request wounded without surprising him. He knew her unconquerable mistrust of him. He had hoped in the end which was now approaching to prove to her its cruel injustice. But if occasion for that were denied him, it would be no great matter. What signified was that her own aims should be accomplished, and, after all, they were not beyond the strength and skill of Carmagnola, who had his talents as a leader when all was said. The Duke's lacklustre eyes were steadily upon Valeria. He spoke after a pause. Almost you imply a doubt of the prince of Valsassana's capacity. Not of his capacity. Oh, not of that. Of what, then? The question troubled her. She looked at her brother, and her brother answered for her. My sister remembers that the prince of Valsassana was once the Marquis Theodore's friend. Was he so? When was that? The duke looked at Balerion, but it was John Giacomo who answered the question. When, in alliance with him, he placed him in possession of Vercelli and Genoa. The alliance was the Lord Ficino's, not Valsassana's. Balerion served under him, but so also did Carmagnola. Where is the difference between them? My lord of Carmagnola acted then with a view to my brother's ultimate service, the princess answered. If he was a party to the Marquis Theodore's occupation of Vercelli, it was only so that in that act the Marquis might provide a cause for the action that is now proposed against him by the Duke of Milan. Valerian laughed softly at the light he suddenly perceived. Do you mock that statement, sir? Carmagnola challenged him. Do you dare to say what was in my mind at the time? I have honoured you for directness, Carmagnola, but it seems you can be subtle too. Subtle? Carmagnola flushed indignantly. In what have I been subtle? In the spirit in which you favoured Theodore's occupation of Vercelli, said Balerion, and so left him gaping foolishly. What else did you think I had in mind? He smiled almost ingenuously into the other's face. The duke rapped the table. Sirs, sirs, we wander. And there is this matter to resolve. Balerion answered him. Here, then, is a solution your highness may be disposed to adopt. Instead of Valperga and his troops, I take with me Carmagnola and his own condotta which is of a similar strength, and, like Valperga's, mainly horse. Thus we march together, and share the enterprise. But unless Balerion commands it, Lord Duke, your highness will graciously consider sending another condotta in the place of mine, said Königshofen, and Stoffel was about to add his own voice to that, when the duke losing patience broke in. Peace, peace, I am Duke of Milan, and I give orders here. You are summoned to advise, not to browbeat me and say what you will and will not do. Let it be done as Valsassana says, since Carmagnola has set his heart upon being in the campaign. But Valsassana leads the enterprise. The matter is closed on that. You have leave to go. 8. Carmagnola's Bridges Dissensions at the very outset between Carmagnola and Balerion protracted by some days the preparations for the departure of the army. This enabled Theodore of Montferrat fully to make his dispositions for resistance, to pack the granaries of Vercelli and otherwise victual it for a siege, and to increase the strong body of troops already under his hand, with which he threw himself into the menaced city. Further, by working furiously during those October days, he was enabled to strengthen his bastions and throw up fresh earthworks, from which to shatter the onslaught when it should come. Upon these very circumstances of which Balerion and his captains were duly informed followed fresh dissensions. Carmagnola advocated that operations should be begun by the reduction of Mortara, which was being held for Theodore, and which, if not seized before they marched upon Vercelli, would constitute, he argued, a menace upon their rear. Balerion's view was that the menace was not sufficiently serious to merit attention, that whilst they were reducing it, Theodore would further be strengthening himself at Vercelli and that, in short, they should march straight upon Vercelli, depending that, 
when they forced it to a capitulation, Mortara would thereby be scared into immediate surrender. Of the captains some held one view, some the other. Königshofen, Stoffel, and Trotter took sides with Balerian. Ursiole Belluno, who commanded the foot in Carmagnola's condotta, took sides with his leader as did also Ugolino D.A. Tender who captained a thousand horse. Yet Balerian would have overruled them but for the Princess Valeria who with her brother entered now into all their councils. These were on the side of Carmagnola. Hence a compromise was effected. A detachment under Königshofen including Trotter's troops was to go against Mortara, to cover the rear of the main army proceeding to Vercelli. To Vercelli that army, now not more than some 4,000 strong, yet strong enough in Balerian's view for the task in hand, made at last a speedy advance. But at Borgo Vercelli they were brought to a halt by the fact that Theodore had blown up the bridge over the seizure, leaving that broad, deep, swift-flowing river between the enemy and the city which was their goal. At Carpignano, twenty miles higher up, there was a bridge which Balerian ascertained had been left standing. He announced that they must avail themselves of that. Twenty miles there, and twenty miles back, snorted Carmagnola. It is too much. A weariness and a labour. I'll not dispute it. But the alternative is to go by way of Casole, which is even farther. The alternative, Carmagnola answered, is to bridge the seizure and the server above their junction where the seizure is narrower. Our lines of communication with the army at Mortara should be as short as possible. You begin to perceive one of the disadvantages of having left that army at Mortara. It is no disadvantage if we make proper provision. And you think that your bridges will afford that provision. Balerian's manner was almost supercilious. Carmagnola resented it. Can you deny it? I can do more. I can foresee what will happen. Sometimes, Francesco, you leave me wondering where you learnt the art of war, or however you came to engage in it. They held their discussion in the kitchen of a peasant's house which for the Princess Valeria's sake they had invaded. And the princess and her brother were its only witnesses. When Carmagnola now moved wrathfully in great strides about the dingy chamber, stamping upon the earthen floor and waving his arms as he began to storm, one of those witnesses became an actor to calm him. The Princess Valeria laid a hand upon one of those waving arms in its gorgeous sleeve of gold-embroidered scarlet. Do not heed his taunts, Messer Carmagnola. You have my utter trust and confidence. It is my wish that you should build your bridges. Valerian tilted his chin to look at her between anger and amusement. If you are to take command, Highness, I'll say no more. He bowed, and went out. One of these days I shall give that upstart dog a lesson in good manners, said Carmagnola between his teeth. The princess shook her head. It is not his manners, sir, that trouble me, but his possible aims. If I could trust him. If you could trust his loyalty, you should still mistrust his skill. Yet he has won great repute as a soldier, put in John Giacomo, who instinctively mistrusted the thrasonical airs of the swaggering Carmagnola, and mistrusted still more his fawning manner towards Valeria. He has been fortunate, Carmagnola answered, and his good fortune has gone to his head. Meanwhile Balerian went straight from that interview to despatch Werner von Stoffel with 500 arbalesters and 600 horse to Carpignano. There was a fresh breeze with Carmagnola when the latter discovered this. He demanded to know why it should have been done without previous consultation with himself and the princess, and Valeria was beside him when he asked the question. Valerian's answer was a very full one. You will be a week building your bridges. In that time it may occur to Theodore to do what he should have done already, to destroy the bridge at Carpignano. And what do I care about the bridge at Carpignano when I shall have bridges of my own here? When you have bridges of your own here, you need not care, but I have a notion that it will be longer than you think before you have these bridges, and that we may have to go by way of Carpignano in the end. I shall have my bridges in a week, said Carmagnola. 
Valerian smiled. When you have them, and when you have put two thousand men across to hold them, I'll bid Stoffel return from Carpignano. But in the meantime... Valerian interrupted him, and suddenly he was very stern. In the meantime you will remember that I command. Though I may choose to humour you and Her Highness, as the shortest way to convince you of error, yet I do not undertake to obey you against my better judgment. By God, Valerian, Carmignola swore at him, I'll not have you gay with me, you'll measure your words, or else you'll eat them. Very coldly Valerian looked at him, and observed Valeria's white restraining hand which again was upon Carmignola's sleeve. At the moment I have a task in hand to which I belong entirely, while it is doing if you forget that I command, I shall remove you from the army. He left the swaggerer fuming. Only my regard for you, Madonna, restrains me, he assured the princess. He takes that tone when he should remember that, if it came to blows between us, the majority of the men here would be upon my side, now that he has sent nearly all his own away. He clenched his hands in anger. Yet for your sake, lady, I must suffer it. There can be no quarrel between his men and mine until we have placed you and your brother in possession of Montferrat. These and other such professions of staunch selfless loyalty touched her deeply, and in the days that followed, whilst the troopers, toiling like woodmen, were felling trees and building the bridges above the junction of the rivers, Carmignola and Valeria were constantly together. She was driven now to the discomfort of living under canvas, sharing the camp life of these rude men of war, and Carmignola did all in his power to mitigate for her the hardships it entailed, hardships which she bore with a high gay courage. She would go with him daily to watch the half-naked labourers in the river, bundling together whole trees as if they were mere twigs, to serve as pontoons. And daily he gave her cause to admire his skill, his ingenuity, and his military capacity. That Balerion should have sneered at this was but another proof of Balerion's worthlessness. Either he could not understand it, or else of treacherous intent he desired to deprive her of its fruits. Meanwhile Carmignola beglamoured her with talk of actions past, in all of which he played ever the heroic part. The eyes of her mind were dazzled by the pictures his words drew for her. Now she beheld him leading a knightly charge that shattered an enemy host into shards, now she saw him at the head of an escalade, indomitably climbing enemy walls under a hail of stones and scalding pitch, now she saw him in council, wisely planning the means by which victory might be snatched from overwhelming opposition. One day when he spoke of these things, as they sat alone watching the men who swarmed like ants about the building of his bridge, he touched a closer note. Yet of all the enterprises to which I have set these rude, soldier hands, none has so warmed me as this, for none has been worthier a man's endeavour. It will be a glorious day for me when we set you in your palace at Casole. A glorious day, and yet a bitter. A bitter? Her great dark eyes turned on him in question. His countenance clouded, his own glance fell away. Will it not be bitter for me to know this service is at an end, to know that I must go my ways, resume a mercenary's life, and do for hire that which I now do out of enthusiasm and love? She shifted her own glance, embarrassed a little. Surely you do yourself less than justice. There is great honour and fame in store for you, my lord. Honour and fame? He laughed. I would gladly leave those to tricksters like Balerion, who rise to them so easily because no scruples ever deter them. Honour and fame? Let who will have those, so that I may serve where my heart bids me. Boldly now his hand sought hers. She let it lie in his. Above those pensive, mysterious eyes her fine brows were knit. Aye, she breathed, that is the great service of life. That is the only worthy service, as the heart bids. His second hand came to recruit the first. Lying almost at her feet, he swung round on his side upon the green earth, looking up at her in a sort of ecstasy. You think that, too. You help me to self-contempt, Madonna. To self-contempt. It is the only contempt that you will ever know. But why should you know that? Because all my life, until this moment, 
I have served for hire. Because, if this adventure had not come to me by God's grace, in such worthless endeavors would my life continue. Now, now that I know the opinion in which you must hold such service, it is over and done for me. When I shall have served you to your goal, I shall have performed my last. There fell a long pause between them. At last, when my brother is crowned in Casole, he will need a servant such as you, Messer Carmagnola. I, but shall you, Madonna? Shall you? She looked at him wistfully, smiling a little. He was very handsome, very splendid, and very brave, a knight to win a lady's trust, and she was a very lonely, friendless lady in sore need of a stout arm and a gallant heart to help her through the trials of this life. The tapering fingers of her disengaged hand descended gently upon his golden head. Shall I not? she asked with a little tremulous laugh. Shall I not? Why, then, Madonna, if you will accept my service, it shall be yours for as long as I endure. It shall never be another's. Valeria, my Valeria. That hand upon his head, overheating its very indifferent contents, drove him now to an excessive precipitancy. He carried the hand he held almost fiercely to his lips. It was withdrawn, gently but firmly as was its fellow. His kiss and the bold use of her name scared her a little. Carmagnola, my friend. Your friend, and more than your friend, Madonna. Why, how much more can there be than that? All that a man may be to a woman, my Valeria. I am your knight. I ever have been since that day in the lists at Milan, when you bestowed the palm on me. I joy in this battle that is to be fought for you. I would joy in death for you if it were needed to prove my worship. How glibly you say these things. There will have been queens in other lists in which you have borne off the palm. Have you talked so to them? O oh, cruelty, he cried out like a man in pain, that you should say this to me. I am swooning at your feet, Valeria, you wonder of the world. My nose, sir, is too long for that, she mocked him, but with an underlying tenderness, and tenderness there was too in her moist eyes. You are a whirlwind in your wooing as in the lists. You are reckless, sir. Is it a fault? A soldier's fault, then. But I'll be patient if you bid me. I'll be whatsoever you bid me, Valeria. But when we come to Casole. He paused for words, and she took advantage of that pause to check him. It is unlucky to plan upon something not yet achieved, sir. Wait, wait until that time arrives. And then, he asked her breathlessly, and then. Have I not said that to plan is unlucky? Boldly he read the converse of that statement. I'll not tempt fortune, then. I dare not. I will be patient, Valeria. But he let it appear that his confidence was firm, and she added nothing now to shake it. And so in ardent wooing whilst he waited for his bridge, Carmagnola spent most of the time that he was not engaged in directing the construction of it. Valerian in those days sulked like Achilles in his tent, with a copy of Vegetius which he had brought from Milan in his baggage. The bridges took, not a week, but eleven days to build. At last, however, on the eve of all saints, as F.R.A. Serafino tells us, Carmagnola accompanied by Valeria and her brother bore word himself to Valerian that the bridges were ready and that a party of fifty of his men were encamped on the peninsula between the rivers. He came to demand that Valerian should so dispose that the army should begin to cross at dawn. That, said Valerian, assumes that your bridges endure until dawn. He was standing, where he had risen to receive his visitors, in the middle of his roomy pavilion, which was lighted by a group of three lanterns hung at the height of his head on the tent pole. The book in which he had been reading was closed upon his forefinger. Endure until dawn? Carmagnola was annoyed by the suggestion. What do you mean? Valerian's remark had been imprudent. Still more imprudent was the laugh he now uttered. Ask yourself who should destroy them, he said. In your place I should have asked myself that before I went to the trouble of building them. How should Theodore know of it, shut up as he is in Vercelli, eight miles away? 
Part of his question was answered on the instant by a demoniac uproar from the strip of land across the water. Cries of rage and terror, shouts of encouragement and command, the sound of blows, and all the unmistakable din of conflict, rose fiercely upon the deepening gloom. He knows, it seems, said Balerion, and again he laughed. Carmagnola stood a moment, clenching and unclenching his hands, his face white with rage. Then he span round where he stood and with an inarticulate cry dashed from the tent. One withering glance Valeria flashed into Balerion's sardonically amused countenance, then, summoning her brother, she followed Carmagnola. Valerian set down his book upon the table by the tent pole, took up a cloak, and followed them at leisure, through the screen of bare trees behind which his pavilion had been pitched, and along the high bank of the swirling river towards the head of Carmagnola's bridge. There, as he expected, he found them, scarcely visible in the gloom, and with them a knot of men-at-arms and a half-dozen stragglers, all that had escaped of the party that Carmagnola had sent across an hour ago. The others had been surrounded and captured. Last of all to win across, arriving just as Balerion reached the spot, was Belluno, who had commanded them, an excitable Neapolitan who leapt up the bank from the bridge ranting by all the patrons of Naples that they had been betrayed. Over the river came a sound of tramping feet. Dimly reflected in the water they could see the forms of men who otherwise moved invisible on the farther bank, and presently came a sound of axes on timber. There goes your bridge, Francesco, said Balerion, and for the third time he laughed. Do you mock me, damn you? Carmagnola raged at him, and then raised his voice to roar for arbalesters. Three or four of the men went off vociferously, at a run, to fetch them, whilst Valeria turned suddenly upon Balerion, whose tall cloaked figure stood beside her. Why do you laugh? Her voice, sharp with disdain, resentment, and suspicion, silenced all there that they might hear his answer. I am human, I suppose, and, therefore, not entirely without malice. Is that all your reason? Is your malice so deep that you can laugh at an enemy advantage which may wreck the labour of days? And then with increasing sharpness and increasing accusation, you knew, she cried. You knew that the bridges would be destroyed tonight. Yourself, you said so. How did you know? How did you know? What are you implying, Madonna? cried Carmagnola, aghast. For all his hostility towards Balerion, he was very far from ready to believe that he played a double game. That I have no wits, said Balerion, quietly scornful. And now the impetuous Belluno, smarting under his own particular misadventure and near escape, must needs cut in. Madonna is implying more than that. She is implying that you've sold us to Theodore of Montferrat. Are you implying it, too, Belluno? His tone had changed. There was now in his voice a note that the princess had never heard, a note that made Belluno's blood run cold. Speak out, man. Though I give license for innuendo to a lady, I require clear speech from every man. So let us have this thing quite plainly. Belluno was brave and obstinate. He conquered his fear of Balerion sufficiently to make a show of standing his ground. It is clear, he answered sullenly, that we have been betrayed. How is it clear, you fool? Balerion shifted again from cold wrath with an insubordinate inferior to argument with a fellow man. Are you so inept at the trade by which you live that you can conceive of a soldier in the Marquis Theodore's position neglecting to throw out scouts to watch the enemy and report his movements? Are you so much a fool as that? If so, I shall have to think of replacing you in your command. Carmagnola interposed aggressively, and this partly to protect Belluno who was one of his own lieutenants, and partly because the sneer at the fellow's lack of military foresight was a reflection upon Carmagnola himself. Do you pretend that you foresaw this action of Theodore's? I pretend that any but a fool must have foreseen it. It is precisely what any soldier in his place would do, allow you to waste time, material, and energy on building bridges, and then promptly destroy them for you. Why, then, did you not say this ten days ago? Why? Balerion's voice sounded amused. 
His face they could not see, because I never spend myself in argument with those who learn only by experience. Again the princess intervened. Is that the best reason you can give? You allowed time, material, and energy, and now even a detachment of men to be wasted, merely that you might prove his folly to my lord of Carmagnola? Is that what you ask us to believe? He thinks us credulous, by God, swore Carmagnola. Balerion kept his patience. I had another reason, a military one with which it seems that I must shame your wits. To move the whole army from here to Carpignano would have taken me at least two days, perhaps three. A mounted detachment from Vercelli to destroy the bridge could reach Carpignano in a few hours, and once it was seen that I moved my army thither that detachment would have been instantly despatched. It was a movement I feared in any case, until your bridge-building operations here deceived Theodore into believing that I had no thought of Carpignano. That is why I allowed them to continue. Though your bridges could never serve the purpose for which you built them, they could excellently serve to disguise my own intention of crossing at Carpignano. Tomorrow, when the army begins to move thither, that detachment of Theodore's will most certainly be sent to destroy the bridge. But it will find it held by a thousand men under Stoffel, and the probable capture of that detachment will compensate for the loss of men you have suffered tonight. There was a moment's utter silence when he had done, a silence of defeat and confusion. Then came an applauding splutter of laughter from the group of men and officers who stood about. It was cut short by a loud crash from across the stream, and, thereafter, with a groaning and rending of timbers, a gurgling of swelling, momentarily arrested, waters, and finally a noise like a thunderclap, the wrecked bridge swinging out into the stream snapped from the logs that held it to the northern shore. There it goes, Carmagnola, said Balerion. But you no longer need bewail your labours. They have served my purpose. He cast his cloak more tightly about him, wished them good night almost gaily, and went striding away towards his pavilion. Carmagnola, crestfallen, swallowing his chagrin as best he could, stood there in silence beside the equally silenced princess. Belluno swore softly, and vented a laugh of some little bitterness. His deep, always deep, by Saint Januarius, never does he do the things he seems to do. Never does he aim where he looks. 9. Vercelli A letter survives which the Prince of Valsassina wrote some little time after these events to Duke Filippo Maria, in which occurs the following criticism of the captains of his day, they are stout fellows and great fighters, but rude, unlettered, and lacking culture. Their minds are fertile, vigorous soil, but unbroken by the plough of learning, so that the seeds of knowledge with which they are all too sparsely sown find little root there. At Carpignano, when they came there three days after breaking camp, they found that all had fallen out as Balerion calculated. A detachment of horse 100 strong had been sent in haste with the necessary implements to destroy the bridge. That detachment Stoffel had surrounded, captured, disarmed, and disbanded. They crossed, and after another three days marching down the right bank of the seizure they crossed the servo just above Quinto, where Balerion took up his quarters in the little castle owned there by the Lord Girolamo Proto, who was with Theodore in Vercelli. Here, too, were housed the princess and her brother and the Lord of Carmagnola, the latter by now recovered from his humiliation in the matter of his bridges to a state of normal self-complacency and arrogance. An 18th-century French writer on tactics, M. Devenequi, in his El Art Militaire A.U. Moyen Age, in the course of a lengthy comparison between the methods of Balerian Kane and the almost equally famous Sir John Hawkwood, offers some strong adverse criticisms upon Balerian's dispositions in the case of this siege of Vercelli. He considers that as a necessary measure of preparation Balerian when at Quinto should have thrown bridges across the seizure above and below the city, so as to maintain unbroken his lines of circumvallation, instead of contenting himself with ferrying a force across to guard the eastern approaches. This force, being cut off by the river, could, says M. Devinequi, neither be supported at need nor afford support. What the distinguished French writer has missed is the fact that, once engaged upon it, 
Valerian was as little in earnest about the siege of Vercelli as he was about Carmagnola's bridges. The one as much as the other was no more than a strategic demonstration. From the outset, that is to say, from the time when arriving at Quinto he beheld the strong earthworks Theodore had thrown up, he realized that the place was not easily to be carried by assault, and it was within his knowledge that it was too well victualled to succumb to hunger save after a siege more protracted than he himself was prepared to impose upon it. But there was Carmagnola, swaggering and thrasonical in spite of all that had gone, and there was the Princess Valeria supporting the handsome Condottiero with her confidence. And Carmagnola, not content that Balerion should girdle the city, arguing reasonably enough that months would be entailed in bringing Theodore to surrender from hunger, was loud and insistent in his demands that the place be assaulted. Once again, as in the case of the bridges, Balerion yielded to the other's overbearing insistence, went even the length of inviting him to plan and conduct the assaults. Three of these were delivered, and all three repulsed with ease by an enemy that appeared to Balerion to be uncannily prescient. After the third repulse, the same suspicion occurred to Carmagnola, and he expressed it, not, however, to Balerion, as he should have done, but to the princess. You mean, she said, that someone on our side is conveying information to Theodore of our intentions? They were alone together in the armory of the castle of Quinto whose pointed windows overlooked the river. It was normally a bare room with stone walls and a vaulted white ceiling up which crawled a troop of the rampant lions of the Prati crudely frescoed in a dingy red. Balerion had brought to it some furnishings that made it habitable, and so it became the room they chiefly used. The princess sat by the table in a great chair of painted leather, faded but comfortable. She was wrapped in a long blue gown that was lined with lynx fur against the chill weather which had set in. Carmagnola, big and gaudy in a suit of the color of sulfur, his tunic reversed with black fur, his powerful yet shapely legs booted to the knee, strode to and fro across the room in his excitement. It is what I begin to fear, he answered her, and resumed his pacing. A silence followed, and remained unbroken until he went to plant himself, his feet wide, his hands behind him, before the logs that blazed in the cavernous fireplace. She looked up and met his glance. You know what I am thinking, he said. I am wondering whether you may not be right, after all, in your suspicions. Gently she shook her head. I dismissed them on that night when your bridges were destroyed. His vindication was so complete, what followed proved him so right, that I could suspect him no longer. He is just a mercenary fellow, fighting for the hand that pays. I trust him now because he must know that he can win more by loyalty than by treachery. Aye, he agreed, you are right, my princess. You are always right. I was not right in my suspicions of him. So think no more of those. Standing as he did, he was completely screening the fire from her. She rose and crossed to it, holding out her hands to the blaze when he made room for her beside him. I am chilled, she said. As much, I think, by our want of progress as by these November winds. Nay, but take heart, Valeria, he bade her. The one will last no longer than the other. Spring will follow in the world and in your soul. She looked up at him, and found him good to look upon, so big and strong, so handsome and so confident. It is heartening to have such a man as you for company in such days. He took her in his arms, a masterful, irresistible fellow. With such a woman as you beside me, Valeria, I could conquer the world. A dry voice broke in upon that rapture, you might make a beginning by conquering Vercelli. Starting guiltily apart, they met the mocking eyes of Balerion who entered. He came forward easily, as handsome in his way as Carmagnola, but cast in a finer, statelier mould. I should be grateful to you, Francesco, and so would Her Highness, if you would accomplish that. The world can wait until afterwards. And Carmagnola, to cover his confusion and Valeria's, plunged headlong into contention. I'd reduce Vercelli tomorrow if I had my way. Who hinders you? You do. There was that night attack. Oh, that, said Valerian. Do you bring that up again? 
Will you never take my word for anything, I wonder? It is foredoomed to failure. Not if conducted as I would have it. He came forward to the table, swaying from the hips in his swaggering walk. He put his finger on the map that was spread there. If a false attack were made here, on the east, between the city and the river, so as to draw the besieged, a bold, simultaneous attack on the west might carry the walls. It might, said Balerion slowly, and fell to considering. This is a new thought of yours, this false attack. It has its merits. You approve me for once. What condescension. Balerion ignored the interruption. It also has its dangers. The party making the feint, and it will need to be a strong one or its real purpose will be guessed, might easily be thrust into the river by a determined sally. It will not come to that, Carmagnola answered quickly. You cannot say so much. Why not? The feint will draw the besieged in that direction, but before they can sally they will be recalled by the real attack striking on the other side. Balerion pondered again, but finally shook his head. I have said that it has its merits, and it tempts me, but I will not take the risk. The risk of what? Carmagnola was being exasperated by that quiet, determined opposition. God's death. Take charge of the feint yourself, if you wish. I'll lead the storming party, and so that you do your part, I'll answer for it that I am inside the town before daybreak and that Theodore will be in my hands. Valeria had remained with her shoulders to them facing the fire. Valerian's entrance, discovering her in Carmagnola's arms, had covered her with confusion, filled her with a vexation not only against himself but against Carmagnola also. From this there was no recovery until Carmagnola's words came now to promise a conclusion of their troubles far speedier than any she had dared to hope. You'll answer for it, said Valerian. And if you fail? I will not fail. You say yourself that it is soundly planned. Did I say so much? Surely not. To be frank, I am more afraid of Theodore of Montferrat than of any captain I've yet opposed. Afraid, said Carmagnola, and sneered. Afraid, Balerion repeated quietly. I don't charge like a bull. I like to know exactly where I am going. In this case, I have told you. Valeria slowly crossed to them. Make the endeavor, at least, Lord Prince, she begged him. He looked from one to the other of them. Between you, you distract me a little. And you do not learn, which is really sad. Well, have your way, Francesco. The adventure may succeed. But if it fails, do not again attempt to persuade me to any course through which I do not clearly see my way. Valeria in her thanks was nearer to friendliness than he had ever known since that last night at Casole. Those thanks he received with a certain chill austerity. It was to be Carmagnola's enterprise, and he left it to Carmagnola to make all the dispositions. The attempt was planned for the following night. It was to take place precisely at midnight, which at that time of year was the seventh hour, and the signal for launching the false attack was to be taken from the clock on San Vittor, one of the few clocks in Italy at that date to strike the hour. After an interval sufficient to allow the defenders to engage on that side, Carmagnola would open the real attack. Impanoplied in his armor, and carrying his peaked helm in the crook of his arm, Carmagnola went to ask of the princess a blessing on his enterprise. She broke into expressions of gratitude. Do not thank me yet, he said. Before morning, God helping me. I shall lay the state of Montferrat at your feet. Then I shall ask your thanks. She flushed under his ardent gaze. I shall pray for you, she promised him very fervently, and laid a hand upon his steel brassard. He bore it to his lips, bowed stiffly, and clanked out of the room. Balerion did not come to seek her. Lightly armed, with no more than back and breast and a steel cap on his head, he led out his men through the night, making a wide detour so that their movements should not be heard in Vercelli. Since mobility was of the first importance, he took with him only a body of some eight hundred horse. They filed along by the river to the east of the city, which loomed there a vast black shadow against the faintly irradiated sky. They took up their station, dismounted, 
unlimbered the scaling ladders which they had brought for the purposes of their demonstration, and waited. They were, as Balerion calculated, close upon the appointed hour when at one point of the line there was a sudden commotion. A man had been caught who had come prowling forward, and who, upon being seized, demanded to be taken at once before their leader. Roughly they did as he required of them, and there in the dark, for they dared kindle no betraying light, Valerian learnt that he was a loyal subject of the Duke of Milan who had slipped out of the city to inform them that the Marquis Theodore was advised of their attack and ready to meet it. Valerian swore profusely, a rare thing in him who seldom allowed himself to be mastered by his temper. But his fear of Theodore's craft drove him now like a fiery spur. If Theodore was forewarned, who could say what countermeasures Theodore had not prepared? This came of lending ear to that bellowing calf Carmagnola. Fiercely he gave the order to mount. There was some delay in the dark, and whilst they were still being marshalled the bell of San Vitor told the seventh hour. Some moments after that were lost before they were spurring off to warn and withdraw Carmagnola. Even then it was necessary to go cautiously through the dark over ground now sodden by several days of rain. Before they were halfway round the din of combat burst upon the air. Theodore had permitted Carmagnola's men to reach and faggot the moat, and even to plant some ladders, before moving. Then he had thrown out his army, in two wings, one from the gate to the north, the other from a gate on the opposite side, and these two wings had swept round to charge Carmagnola in flank and to envelop him. Two things only saved Carmagnola, in the first place, Theodore's counterattack was prematurely launched, before Carmagnola was sufficiently committed. In the second, Stoffel, taking matters into his own hands, and employing the infantry tactics advocated by Balerion, drew off his men, and formed them up to receive the charge he heard advancing from the north. That charge cost Theodore a score of piked horses, and it failed to break through the bristling human wall that rose before it in the dark. Having flung the charge back, Stoffel, formed his men quickly into the hedgehog, embracing within it all that he could compass of Carmagnola's other detachments, and in this formation proceeded to draw off, intent upon saving all that he could from the disaster that was upon them. Meanwhile the other battle, issuing from the gate on the south and led by Theodore himself, had crashed into Carmagnola's own body, which Carmagnola and Belluno were vainly seeking to marshal. They might have made an end of that detachment, which comprised the best part of Balerion's condotta, had not Balerion with his eight hundred horse at last come up to charge the enemy rear. That was the saving stroke. Caught now between two masses, realizing that his counter-surprise had failed, and unable in the dark to attempt a fresh maneuver, Theodore ordered his trumpeters to sound the retreat. Each side accounted itself fortunate in being able to retire in good order. X. The Arrest in the armory of the castle of Quinto, Carmagnola paced like a caged panther, the half of his armor still hanging upon him, his blonde head still encased in the close-fitting cap of blood-red velvet that served to protect it from the helmet. And as he paced, he ranted of treachery and other things to Valeria and John Giacomo of Montferrat, to the half-dozen captains who had returned to render with him the account of that galling failure. The princess occupied the big chair by the table, whilst her brother leaned upon the back of it. Beyond stood ranged Ugolino D.A. Tender, Ursiole Belluno, Stoffel, and three others, their armour flashing in the golden light of the cluster of candles set upon the table. Over by the hearth in another high-backed chair sat Balerion, still in his black corslet, his long legs in their mud-splashed boots stretched straight before him, his head cased in a close-fitting cap of peach-coloured velvet, disdainfully listening to Carmagnola's furious tirade. He guessed the bitterness in the soul of the boaster who had promised so much to achieve so little. Therefore he was patient with him for a while. But to all things there must be an end, and an end there was to Balerion's patience. Talking men's nothing, Francesco, he broke in at last. It may prevent a repetition. There can be no repetition, because there will be no second attempt. I should never have permitted this but that you plagued me with your insistence. And I should have succeeded had you done your part, roared Carmagnola in fury, a vain, humiliated man reckless of where he cast the blame for his own failure. By God's life, 
that is why disaster overtook us. Had you delivered your own attack as was concerted between us, Theodore must have sent a force to meet it. Valerian remained calm under the accusation, and under the eyes of that company, all reproachful save Stoffels. The Swiss, unable to contain himself, laughed aloud. If the Lord Valerian had done that, sir, you might not now be alive. It was his change of plan, and the charge he delivered upon Theodore's rear, that enabled us to extricate ourselves, and so averted a disaster that might have been complete. And whilst you are noticing that fact, said Balerion, it may also be worthy of your attention that if Stoffel had not ranged his foot to receive the charge from Theodore's right wing, and afterwards formed a hedgehog to encircle and defend you, you would not now be ranting here. It occurs to me that an expression of gratitude and praise for Stoffel would be not so much gracious as proper. Carmignola glared. Ah, yes, you support each other. We are to thank you now for a failure, which your own action helped to bring about, Balerion. Balerion continued unruffled. The accusation impugns only your own intelligence. Does it so? Does it so? Ha! Huh. Where is this man who came, you say, to tell you that Theodore was forewarned of the attack? Balerion shrugged. Do I know where he is? Do I care? Does it matter? A man comes to you out of the night with such a message as that, and you don't know what has become of him. I had other things to do than think of him. I had to think of you, and get you out of the trap that threatened you. And I say that you would have best done that by attacking on your own side, as we agreed. We never agreed that I should attack, but only that I should pretend to attack. I had not the means to push home an escalade. His suavity suddenly departed. But it seems to me that I begin to defend myself. He reached for his steel cap, and stood up. It becomes necessary, cried Carmagnola, who in two strides was at his side. Only that I should defend myself from a charge of rashness in having yielded to your insistence to attempt this night attack. There was a chance, I thought, of success and since the alternative of starving the place would entail a delay of months, I took that chance. It has missed, and so forces me to a course I've been considering from the outset. Tomorrow I shall raise the siege. You'll raise the siege. That ejaculation of amazement came in chorus. Not only of Vercelli, but also of Mortara. You'll raise the siege, sir? It was John Giacomo who spoke now. And what then? That shall be decided tomorrow in council. It is almost daybreak. I'll wish you a good repose, Madonna, and you, sirs. He bowed to the company and moved to the door. Carmagnola put himself in his way. Ah, but wait, Balerion. Tomorrow, Balerion's voice was hard and peremptory. By then your wits may be cooler and clearer. If you will all gather here at noon, you shall learn my plans. Good night. And he went out. They gathered there, not at noon on the morrow, but an hour before that time, summoned by messages from Carmagnola, who was the last to arrive and a prey to great excitement. Belluno, D.A. Tender, Stoffel, and three other officers awaited him with the princess and the Marquis John Giacomo. Balerion was not present. He had not been informed of the gathering, for reasons which Carmagnola's first words made clear to all. When Balerion did arrive, punctually at noon, for the council to which he had bidden the captains, he was surprised to find them already seated about the table in debate and conducting this with a vehemence which argued that matters had already gone some way. Their voices raised in altercation reached him as he mounted the short flight of stone steps, at the foot of which a half dozen men of Belluno's company were lounging. A silence fell when he entered, and all eyes at once were turned upon him. He smiled a greeting, and closed the door. But as he advanced, he began to realize that the sudden silence was unnatural and ominous. He came to the foot of the table, where there was a vacant place. He looked at the faces on either side of it, and lastly at Carmagnola seated at its head, between Valeria and John Giacomo. What do you debate here? he asked them. 
Carmagnola answered him. His voice was hard and hostile, his blue eyes avoided the steady glance of Balerians. We were about to send for you. We have discovered the traitor who is communicating with Theodore of Montferrat, forewarning him of our every measure, culminating in last night's business. That is something, although it comes at a time when it can no longer greatly matter. Who is your traitor? None answered him for a long moment. Saving Stoffel, who was flushed and smiling disdainfully, and the princess whose eyes were lowered, they continued to stare at him, and he began to mislike their stare. At last, Carmagnola pushed towards him a folded square of parchment bearing a broken seal. Read that. Balerion took it, and turned it over. To his surprise he found it superscribed to the magnificent Lord Balerion Cain, Prince of Valsassana. He frowned, and a little colour kindled in his cheeks. He threw up his head, stern-eyed. How? he asked. Who breaks the seals of a letter addressed to me? Read the letter, said Carmagnola, peremptorily. Balerion read. Dear Lord and friend, your fidelity to me and my concerns saved Vercelli last night from a blow that in its consequences might have led to our surrender, for without your forewarning we should assuredly have been taken by surprise. I desire you to know my recognition of my debt, and to assure you again of the highest reward that it lies in my power to bestow if you continue to serve me with the same loyal devotion. Theodore Paleologo of Montferrat Valerian looked up from the letter with some anger in his face, but infinitely more contempt and even a shade of amusement. Where was this thing manufactured? he asked. Carmagnola's answer was prompt. In Vercelli, by the Marquis Theodore. It is in his own hand, as Madonna here has testified, and it is sealed with his own seal. Do you wonder that I broke it? Sheer amazement overspread Valerian's face. He looked at the princess, who fleetingly looked up to answer the question in his glance. The hand is my uncle's, sir. He turned the parchment over, and conned the seal with its stag device. Then the amazement passed out of his face, light broke on it, and he uttered a laugh. He turned, pulled up a stool, and sat down at the table's foot, whence he had them all under his eye. Let us proceed with method. How did this letter reach you? Carmagnola? Carmagnola waved to Belluno, and Belluno, hostile of tone and manner, answered the question. A clown coming from the direction of the city blundered into my section of the lines this morning. He begged to be taken to you. My men naturally brought him to me. I questioned him as to what he desired with you. He answered that he bore a message. I asked him what message he could be bearing to you from Vercelli. He refused to answer further whereupon I threatened him, and he produced this letter. Seeing its seal, I took both the fellow and the letter to my lord Carmagnola. Balerian, himself, completed the tale, and Carmagnola perceiving that seal took it upon himself to break it, and so discovered the contents to be what already he suspected. That is what occurred. Balerian, entirely at his ease, looked at them with amused contempt, and finally at Carmagnola in whose face he laughed. God save you, Carmagnola, I often wonder what will be the end of you. I am no longer wondering what will be the end of you, he was furiously answered, which only went to increase his amusement. And you others, you were equally deceived. The letter and Carmagnola's advocacy of my falseness and treachery were not to be resisted. I have not been deceived, Stoffel protested. I was not classing you with those adult heads, Stoffel. It will need more than abuse to clear you, Tender warned him angrily. You, too, Ugolino, and you, Madonna, and even you Lord Marquis. Well, well, it may need more than abuse to clear me, but surely not more than this letter. Fossud is in every line of it, in the superscription, in the seal itself. How, sir, the princess asked him, do you insist that it is forged? I have your word that it is not, but read the letter again. He tossed it to them. 
The Marquis Theodore pays your wits a poor compliment, Carmagnola, and the sequel has justified him. Ask yourselves this, if I were, indeed, Theodore's friend and ally, could he have taken a better way than this of putting it beyond my power to serve him further? It is plainly superscribed to me, so that there shall be no mistake as to the person for whom it is intended and it bears his full signature, so that there shall be no possible mistake on the score of whence it comes. In addition to that, he has sealed it with his arms, so that the first person into whose hands it falls shall be justified in ascertaining, as you did, what Theodore of Montferrat may have occasion to write to me. It was expected that the soldiers who caught the clown would bear him straight to you, Carmagnola countered. Was it? Is there no ardness in the fact that the clown should walk straight into your own men, Carmagnola, on a section of the line that does not lie directly between Vercelli and Quinto? But why waste time even on such trifles of evidence? Read the letter itself. Is there a single word in that which it was important to convey to me, or which would not have been conveyed otherwise if it had been intended for any purpose other than to bring me under this suspicion? Almost has Theodore overreached himself in his guile. Out of his intentness to destroy me, he has revealed his true aims. The very arguments I used with them, said Stoffel. Valerian looked in amazement at his lieutenant. And they failed, he cried, incredulous. Of course they failed, you foul traitor, Carmagnola bawled at him. They are ingenious, but they are obvious to a man caught as you are. It is not I that am caught, but you that are in danger of it, Carmagnola, in danger of being caught in the web that Theodore has spun. To what end? To what end should he spin it? Answer that. Perhaps to set up dissensions amongst us, perhaps to remove the only one of the captains opposed to him whom he respects. You're modest, by God, sneered Carmagnola. And you're a purblind fool, Carmagnola, cried Stoffel in heat. Then are we all fools, said Belluno, for we are all of the same mind on this. Aye, said Balerion sadly, you're all of the same emptiness. That's clear. Well, let us have in this clown and question him. To what purpose? That we may wring from him his precise instructions, since the letter does not suffice. You take too much for granted. The letter suffices fully. You forget that it is not all the evidence against you. What? Is there more? There is your failure last night to make the false attack you undertook to make, and there is the intention you so rashly proclaimed here afterwards that you would raise the siege of Vercelli today. Why should you wish to do that if you are not Theodore's friend, if you are not the canker-hearted traitor we now know you to be? If I were to tell you, you would not understand. I should merely give you another proof that I am Theodore's ally. That is very probable, said Carmagnola with a heavy sneer. Fetch the guard, Ursiole. What's this? Balerion was on his feet even as Belluno rose, and Stoffel came up with him, laying hands on his weapons. But Ugolino D.A. Tender and another captain between them overpowered him, whilst the other two ranged themselves swiftly on Balerion's either hand. Balerion looked at them, and from them again to Carmagnola. He was lost in amazement. Are you daring to place me under arrest? Until we deliberate what shall be done with you, we shall not keep you waiting long. My God! His wits worked swiftly, and he saw clearly that they might easily work their will with him. Of the four thousand men out there, only Stoffel's eight hundred Switzers would be on his side. The others would follow the lead of their respective captains. The leaders upon whom he could have depended in this pass, Konigshofen and Jasone Trotter, were away at Mortara. Perceiving at last this danger, hitherto entirely unsuspected, he turned now to the princess. Madonna, he said, it is you whom I serve. Once before you suspected me, in the matter of Carmagnola's bridges, and the sequel proved you wrong. Slowly she raised her eyes to look at him fully for the first time since he had joined that board. They were very sorrowful and her pallor was deathly. There are other matters, sir, besides that, which I remember. There is the death of Enzo Spigno, for one. He recoiled as if she had struck him. 
Spigno, he echoed, and uttered a queer little laugh. So it is Spigno who rises from his grave for vengeance. Not for vengeance, sir. For justice. There would be that if there were not the matter that Messer Carmagnola has urged to convict you. To convict me. Am I then convicted without trial? None answered him, and in the pause that followed the men at arms summoned by Belluno clanked in, and at a sign from Carmagnola closed about Balerian. There were four of them. One of the captains deprived him of his dagger, the only weapon upon him, and flung it on the table. At last Balerian roused himself to some show of real heat. Oh, but this is madness. What do you intend by me? That is to be deliberated, but be under no delusive hope, Balerian. You are to decide my fate. You. From Carmagnola, he looked at the others. He had paled a little, but amazement still rode above fear. Stoffel, unable longer to contain himself, turned furiously upon Carmagnola. You rash, vainglorious fool. If Balerian is to be tried there is none under the duke's magnificence before whom he may be arraigned. He has been arraigned already before us here. His guilt is clear, and he has said nothing to dispel a single hair of it. There remains only to decide his sentence. This is no proper arraignment. There has been no trial, nor have you power to hold one, Stoffel insisted. You are wrong, Captain. There are military laws. I say this is no trial. If Balerian is to be tried, you'll send him before the Duke. And at the same time, put in Balerian, you'll send your single witness, this clown who brought that letter. Your refusal to produce him here before me now in itself shows the malice by which you're moved. Carmagnola flushed under that charge, and scowlingly considered the prisoner. If the form of trial you've received does not content you, and since you charge me with personal feeling, there is another I am ready to afford. He drew himself up, and flung back his handsome head. Trial by battle, Lord Prince. Over Balerian's white face a sneer was spread. And what shall it prove if you ride me down? Shall it prove more than that you have the heavier weight of brawn, that you are more practiced in the lists and have the stronger thews? Does it need trial by battle to prove that? God will defend the right, said Carmagnola. Will he so? Balerian laughed. I am glad to have your word for it. But you forget that the right to challenge lies with me, the accused. In your blundering stupidity you overlook essentials always. Your very dullness acquits you of hypocrisy. Shall I exercise that right upon the person in whose service I am carrying arms, upon the body of the Marquis John Giacomo of Montferrat? The frail boy named started, and looked up with dilating eyes. His sister cried out in very real alarm. But Carmagnola covered them with his answer. I am your accuser, sir, not he. You are his deputy, no more, Valerian answered, and now the boy came to his feet, white and tense. He is in the right, he announced. I cannot refuse him. Smiling, Valerian looked at Carmagnola, confused and awkward. Always you overreach yourself, he mocked him. He turned to John Giacomo. You could not refuse me if I asked it. But I do not ask it. I only desired to show the value of Carmagnola's offer. You have some decency still, Carmagnola told him. Whilst you cannot lay claim even to that, God made you a fool, and that's the end of the matter. Take him away. Already it seemed they had their orders. They laid hands upon him and, submitting without further words, he suffered them to lead him out. As the door closed upon him, Stoffel exploded. He raged and stormed. He pleaded, argued, and vituperated them, even the princess herself, for fools and dolts, and finally threatened to raise the army against them, or at least to do his utmost with his Swiss to prevent them from carrying out their evil intentions. Listen, Carmagnola commanded sternly, and in the silence they heard from the hall below a storm of angry outcries. That is the voice of the army, answering you, the voice of those who were maimed last night as a result of his betrayal. Saving yourself, 
there is not a captain in the army, and saving your own Swiss, hardly a man who is not this morning clamoring for Balerian's death. You are confessing that you published the matter even before Balerian was examined here. My God, you villain, you hellkite, you swaggering ape, who give a free rein to the base jealousy in which you have ever held Balerian. Your mean spite may drive you now to the lengths of murder. But look to yourself thereafter. You'll lose your empty head over this, Carmagnola. They silenced him and bore him out, whereafter they sat down to seal Balerian's fate. 11. The Pledge Unanimously the captains voted for Balerian's death. The only dissentients were the Marquis and his sister. The latter was appalled by the swiftness with which this thing had come upon them, and shrank from being in any sense a party to the slaying of a man, however guilty. Also not only was she touched by Balerian's forbearance in the matter of trial by battle against her brother, but his conduct in that connection sowed in her mind the first real doubt of his guilt. Urgently she pleaded that he should be sent for trial before the duke. Carmagnola, in refusing, conveyed the impression of a great soul wrestling with circumstances, a noble knight placing duty above inclination. It was a part that well became his splendid person. Because you ask it, Madonna, for one reason, because of the imputations of malice against me for another, I would give years of my life to wash my hands of him and send him to Duke Filippo Maria. But out of other considerations, in which your own and your brother's future are concerned, I dare not. Saving perhaps Stoffel and his Swiss, the whole army demands his death. The matter has gone too far. The captains one and all proved him right by their own present insistence. Yet I do not believe him guilty, the young Marquis startled them, and I will be no party to the death of an innocent man. Would any of us? Carmagnola asked him. Is there any room for doubt? The letter. The letter, the boy interrupted hotly, is, as Balerian says, a trick of my uncle's to remove the one enemy he fears. That touched Carmagnola's vanity with wounding effect. He dissembled the hurt but it served to strengthen his purpose. That vain boaster has seduced you with his argument, eh? No, not with his argument, but with his conduct. He could have challenged me to trial by combat, as he showed. What am I to stand against him? A thing of straw. Yet he declined. Was that the action of a trickster? It was, Carmagnola answered emphatically. It was a trick to win you over. For he knew, as we all know, that a sovereign prince does not lie under that law of chivalry. He knew that if he had demanded it, you would have been within your right in appointing a deputy. Why, then, did you not say so at the time? The princess asked him. Because he did not press the matter. Oh, Madonna, believe me, there is no man in Italy who less desires to have Balerian's blood on his hands than I. He spoke sorrowfully, heavily. But my duty is clear, and whether it were clear or not, I must be governed by the voice of these captains, all of whom demand, and rightly, this double-dealing traitor's death. Emphatically the captains confirmed him in the assertion, as emphatically John Giacomo repeated that he would be no party to it. You are not required to be, Carmagnola assured him. You may stand aside, my lord, and allow justice to take its course. Sirs, the princess appealed to them, let me implore you again, at least to send him to the duke. Let the responsibility of his death lie with his master. Carmagnola rose. Madonna, what you ask would lead to a mutiny. Tomorrow either I send Balerian's head to his ally in Vercelli, or the men will be out of hand and there will be an end to this campaign. Dismiss your doubts and your fears. His guilt is crystal clear. You need but remember his avowed intention of raising the siege, to see in whose interest he works. Heavy-eyed and heavy-hearted she sat, tormented by doubt now that she was face to face with decision where hitherto no single doubt had been. You never asked him what alternative he proposed, she reminded him. To what end? That glib dissembler would have fooled us with fresh fossils. Belluno got to his feet. He had been manifesting impatience for some moments. 
Have we leave to go, my lord? This matter is at an end. Ugolino D.A. Tender followed his example. The men below are growing noisier. It is time we pacified them with our decision. I, in God's name. Carmagnola waved them away, and himself strode off from the table towards the hearth. He stirred the logs with his boot and sent an explosion of sparks flying up the chimney. Bear him word of our decision, Belluno. Bid him prepare for death. He shall have until daybreak tomorrow to make his soul. O oh God! If we should be wrong, groaned the princess. The captains clanked out, and the door closed. Slowly Carmagnola turned, reproachfully he regarded her. Have you no faith in me, Valeria? Should I do this thing if there were any room for doubt? You may be mistaken. You have been mistaken before, remember. He did not like to remember it. And you? Have you been mistaken all these years? Are you mistaken on the death of your friend Count Spigno and what followed? Ah, I was forgetting that, she confessed. Remember it. And remember what he said at that table, which may, after all, be the truth. That Count Spigno has risen from the grave at last for vengeance. Will you not send for this clown, at least? cried John Giacomo. To what purpose now? What can he add to what we know? The matter, Lord Marquis, is finished. And meanwhile Belluno was seeking Balerion in the small chamber in which they had confined him on the ground floor of the castle. With perfect composure Balerion heard the words of doom. He did not believe them. This sudden thing was too monstrously impossible. It was incredible the gods should have raised him so swiftly to his pinnacle of fame, merely to cast him down again for their amusement. They might make sport with him, but they would hardly carry it to the lengths of quenching his life. His only answer now was to proffer his pinioned wrists, and beg that the cord might be cut. Belluno shook his head to that in silence. Balerion grew indignant. What purpose does it serve beyond a cruelty? The window is barred, the door is strong, and there is probably a guard beyond it. I could not escape if I would. You'll be less likely to attempt it with bound wrists. I'll pass you my parole of honor to remain a prisoner. You are convicted of treachery, and you know as well as I do that the parole of a convicted traitor is never taken. Go to the devil, then, said Balerion which so angered Belluno that he called in the guard, and ordered them to bind Balerion's ankles as well. So trust that he could move only by hops, and then at the risk of falling, they left him. He sat down on one of the two stools which with a table made up all the furniture of that bare chill place. He wagged his head and even smiled over the thought of Belluno's refusal to accept his parole, or rather over the thought that in offering it he had no notion of keeping it. I'd break more than my pledged word to get out of this, said he to himself. And only an idiot would blame me. He looked round the bare stone walls, and lastly at the window. He rose, and hopped over to it. Leaning on the sill, which was at the height of his breast, he looked out. It opened upon the inner court, he found, so that wherever escape might lie, it lay not that way. The sill upon the rough edge of which he leaned was of granite. He studied it a while attentively. The fools, he said, and hopped back to his stool, where he gave himself up to quiet meditation until they brought him a hunch of bread and a jug of wine. To the man at arms who acted as Gala, he held out his pinioned wrists. How am I to eat and drink? he asked. You'll make shift as best you can. He made shift and by using his two hands as one contrived to eat and to drink. After that he spent some time at the sill, patiently drawing his wrists backwards and forwards along the edge of it, with long rests between whiles to restore the blood which had flowed out of upheld arms. It was wearying toil, and kept him fully engaged for some hours. Towards dusk he set up a shouting which at last brought the guard into his prison. You're in haste to die, my lord, the fellow insolently mocked him. But quiet you. The stranglers are bidden for daybreak. 
And I am to perish like a dog? Balerion furiously asked him. With pinioned wrists and ankles he sat there by his table. Am I never to have a priest to shrive me? Oh, ah, a priest. The fellow went out. He went in quest of Carmagnola. But Carmagnola was absent, marshalling his men against a threatened attempt by Stoffel and the Swiss to rescue Balerion. The captains were away about the same business, and there remained only the princess and her brother. Messer Balerion is asking for a priest, he told them. Has none been sent to him? cried John Giacomo, scandalized. He'd not be sent until an hour before the stranglers. Valeria shuddered, and sat numbed with horror. John Giacomo swore under his breath. In God's name, let the poor fellow have a priest at once. Let one be sent for from Kinto. It would be an hour later when a preaching friar from the convent of St. Dominic was ushered into Balerion's prison, a tall, frail man in a long black mantle over his white habit. The guard placed a lantern on the table, glanced compassionately at the prisoner, who sat there as he had earlier seen him with pinioned wrists and ankles. But something had happened to the cords meanwhile, for no sooner had the guard passed out and closed the door than Balerion stood up and his bonds fell from him like cobwebs, startling the good monk who came to shrive him. Infinitely more startled was the good monk to find himself suddenly seized by the throat in a pair of strong, nervous hands whose thumbs were so pressed into his windpipe that he could neither cry out nor breathe. He writhed in that unrelenting grip, until a fierce whisper quieted him. Be still if you would hope to live. If you undertake to make no sound, tap your foot twice upon the ground, and I'll release you. Frantically the foot was tapped. But remember that at the first outcry, I shall kill you without mercy. He removed his hands, and the priest almost choked himself in his sudden greed of air. Why? Why do you assault me? He gasped. I come to comfort and... I know why you come better than you do, brother. You think you bring me the promise of eternal life. All that I require from you at present is the promise of temporal existence. So we'll leave the shriving for something more urgent. It would be a half hour later, when cowled as he had entered the hall, the bowed figure of the priest emerged again from the room, bearing the lantern. I've brought the light, my son, he said almost in a whisper. Your prisoner desires to be alone in the dark with his thoughts. The man-at-arms took the lantern in one hand, whilst with the other he was driving home the bolt. Suddenly he swung the lantern to the level of the cowl. This priest did not seem quite the same as the one who had entered. The next moment, on his back, his throat gripped by the vigorous man who knelt upon him, the guard knew that his suspicions had been well-founded. Another moment and he knew nothing. For the hands that held him had hammered his head against the stone floor until consciousness was blotted out. Balerion extinguished the lantern, pushed the unconscious man-at-arms into the deepest shadow of that dimly lighted hall, adjusted his mantle and cowl, and went quickly out. The soldiers in the courtyard saw in that cowled figure only the monk who had gone to shrive Balerion. The postern was opened for him, and with a murmured Pax Vobiscum, he passed out across the lesser bridge and gained the open. Thereafter, under cover of the night, he went at speed, the monkish gown tucked high, for he knew not how soon the sentinel he had stunned might recover to give the alarm. In his haste he almost stumbled upon a strong picket, and in fleeing from that he was within an ace of blundering into another. Thereafter he proceeded with more caution over ground that was everywhere held by groups of soldiers, posted by Carmagnola against any attempt on the part of the Swiss. As a result it was not until an hour or so before midnight that he came at last to Stoffel's quarters, away to the south of Vercelli, and found there everything in ferment. He was stopped by a party of men of Uy, to whom at once he made himself known, and even whilst they conducted him to their captain, the news of his presence ran like fire through the Swiss encampment. Stoffel, who was in full armour when Balerion entered his tent, gasped his questioning amazement whilst Balerion threw off his mantle and white woolen habit, and stood forth in his own proper person and garments. We were on the point of coming for you, Stoffel told him. 
A fool's errand, Werner. What could you have done against three thousand men, who are ready and expecting you? But he spoke with a warm hand firmly gripping Stoffel's shoulders and a heart warmed, indeed, by this proof of trust and loyalty. Something we might have done. There was a will on our side that must be lacking on the other. And the walls of Kinto, you'd have beaten your heads in vain against them, even had you succeeded in reaching them. It's as lucky for you as for me that I've saved you this trouble. And what now? Stoffel asked him. Give the order to break camp at once. We march to Mortara to rejoin the company of the White Dog from which I should never have separated. We'll show Carmagnola and those Montferrin princes what Balerion can do. Meanwhile they already had some notion of it. The alarm at his escape had spread through Kinto, and Carmagnola had been fetched from the lines to be informed of it in detail by a half-naked priest and a man-at-arms with a bandaged head. It had taken some time to find him. It took more for him to resolve what should be done. At last, however, he decided that Balerion would have fled to Stoffel, so he assembled his captains, and with the whole army marched on the Swiss encampment. But he came too late. At the last the Swiss had not waited to strike their camp, realizing the danger of delay, but had departed leaving it standing. Back to Kinto and the agitated princess went Carmagnola with the news of failure. He found her waiting alone in the armory, huddled in a great chair by the fire. That he will have gone to his own condotta at Mortara is certain, he declared. But without knowing which road he took, how could I follow in the dark? And to follow meant fulfilling that traitor's intention of raising the siege. He raged and swore, striding to and fro there in his wrath, bitterly upbraiding himself for not having taken better precautions knowing with what a trickster he had to deal, damning the priest and the sentry and the fools in the courtyard who had allowed Belarion to walk undetected through their ranks. She watched him, and found him less admirable than hitherto in the wildness of his ravings. Unwillingly almost her mind contrasted his behaviour under stress with the calm she had observed in Belarion. She fetched a weary sigh. If only Balerion had been true and loyal, what a champion would he not have been? Raging will not help you, Carmagnola, she said at last, the least asperity in her tone. It brought him, pained, to a halt before her. And whence, Madonna, is my rage? Have I lost anything? Do I strive here for personal ends? Ha! Huh? I rage at the thought of the difficulties that will rise up for you. For me? Can you doubt what will follow? Do you think that all that we have lost tonight is Belarion, with perhaps his Swiss? The men at Mortara are mostly of his own company, the company of the dog. A well-named company, as God lives. And those who are not serve under captains who are loyal to him and who, knowing nothing of his discovered treachery here, will be beguiled by that seducer. In strength he will be our superior, with close upon four thousand men. She looked up at him in alarm. You are suggesting that we shall have him coming against us. What else? Do we not know enough already of his aims? By all the saints. Things could not have fallen out better to give him the pretext that he needed. He was raging again. Had this sly devil contrived these circumstances himself, he could not have improved them. By these he can justify himself at need to the duke. Oh, he's turned the tables on us. Now you see why I meant to give him no chance. She kept her mind to the essence of the matter. Then if he comes against us, we are lost. We shall be caught between his army and my uncle's. His overweening vanity would not permit him to admit, or even to think, so much. He laughed, confident and disdainful. Have you so little faith in me, Valeria? I am no apprentice in this art of war. And with the thought of you to spur me on, do you think that I will suffer defeat? I'll not lay down my arms while I have life to serve you. I will take measures tomorrow. And I will send letters to the Duke, informing him of Balerion's defection and begging reinforcements. Can you doubt that they will come? Is Filippo Maria the man to let one of his captains mutiny and go unpunished? 
He laughed again full of a confidence by which she was infected. And he looked so strong and masterful, so handsome in the half-armor he still wore, a very god of war. She held out a hand to him. My friend, forgive my doubt. You shall be dishonored by no more fears of mine. He caught her hand. He drew her out of the chair, and towards him until she brought up against his broad mailed breast. That is the fine brave spirit that I love in you as I love all in you, Valeria. You are mine, Valeria. God made us for each other. Not yet, she said, smiling a little, her eyes downcast and veiled from his ardent glance. When then, was his burning question. When Theodore has been whipped out of Montferrat. His arms tightened about her until his armor hurt her. It is a pledge, Valeria. A pledge, she echoed on a questioning, exalted note. The man who does that may claim me when he wants me. I swear it. 12. Carmagnola's Duty my lord of Carmagnola had shut himself up in a small room on the ground floor of the castle of Quinto to indict a letter to the high and most potent Duke Filippo Maria of Milan. A heavy labour this of quill on parchment for one who had little scholarship. It was a labour that fell to him so rarely that he had never perceived until now the need to equip himself with a secretary. The princess and her brother newly returned from mass on that Sunday morning, four days after Balerion's escape, were together in the armory discussing their situation, and differing a good deal in their views, for the mental eyes of the young Marquis were not dazzled by the effulgence of Carmagnola's male beauty, or deceived by his histrionic attitudes. Into their presence, almost unheralded, were ushered two men. One of these was small and slight and active as a monkey, the other a fellow of great girth with a big, red, boldly humorous face, blue eyes under black brows flanking a beak of a nose, and a sparse fringe of grey hair straggling about a gleaming bald head. The sight of those two, who smirked and bowed, brought brother and sister very suddenly to their feet. Barbaresco, she cried on a note of gladness, holding out both her hands. And Casella. And, said Barbaresco, as he rolled forward, near upon another five hundred refugees from Montferrat, both Guelph and Ghibelline, whom we've been collecting in Piedmont and Lombardy to swell the army of the great Balerian and settle accounts with Master Theodore. They kissed her hands, and then her brothers. My Lord Marquis, cried the fire-eating Casella, his gimlet glance appraising the lad. You're so well grown I should hardly have known you. We are your servants, my lord, as Madonna here can tell you. For years have we laboured for you and suffered for you but we touch the end of all that now, as do you. Theodore is brought to bay at last. We are hounds to help you pull him down. At no season could their coming have been more welcome or uplifting than in this hour of dark depression, when recruits to the cause of the young Marquis were so urgently required. This she told them, announcing their arrival a good omen. Servants were summoned, and despatched for wine, and whilst the newcomers drank the hot spiced beverage provided they learnt the true meaning of her words. It sobered their exultation. This defection of Balerion and his powerful company amounting to more than half of the entire army altered their outlook completely. Barbaresco blew out his great cheeks, frowning darkly. You say that Balerion is the agent of Theodore, he cried. We have proof of it, she sadly assured him and told him of the letter. His amazement deepened. Does it surprise you, then, she asked. Surely it should be no news to you. Once it would not have been. For once I thought that I held proof of the same, that was on the night that Spigno died at his hands. Later, before that same night was out, I understood better why he killed Spigno. You understood? Why he killed him? She was white to the lips. John Giacomo was leaning forward across the table, his face eager. She uttered a fretful laugh. He killed him because he was my friend, mine and my brother's, the chief of all our friends. Barbaresco shook his great head. He killed him because this Spigno whom we all trusted so completely was a spy of Theodore's. What? Her world reeled about her, her senses battled in a mist. 
The thick, droning voice of Barbaresco came to deepen her confusion. It is all so simple, so very clear. The facts that Spigno was dressed as we found him and in the attic where we had imprisoned Balerion should in themselves have explained everything. How came he there? Balerion was all but convicted of being an agent of Theodore's. But for Spigno we should have dealt with him out of hand. Then at dead of night Spigno went to liberate him, and by that very act convicted himself in Balerion's eyes. And for that Balerion stabbed him. The only flaw is how one agent of Theodore's should have come to be under such a misapprehension about the other. Saving that the thing would have been clear at once. That I can explain, said Valeria breathlessly, if you have sound proof of Spigno's guilt, if it is not all based on rash assumption. Assumption, laughed Casella, and he took up the tale. That night, when we determined upon flight, we first repaired, because of our suspicions, to Spigno's lodging. We found there a letter addressed superscribed to Theodore, to be delivered in the event of Spigno's death or disappearance. Within it we found a list of our names and of the part which each of us had had in the plot to kill the regent, and the terms of that letter made it more than clear that throughout Spigno had been Theodore's agent for the destruction of the Marquis here. That letter, said Barbaresco, was a safeguard the scoundrel had prepared in the event of discovery. The threat of its despatch to Theodore would have been used to compel us to hold our hands. Oh, a subtle villain, your best and most loyal friend Count Spigno, and but for Balerion. He spread his hands and laughed. Then Casella interposed. You said, Madonna, that you could supply the link that's missing in our chain. But she was not listening. She sat with drooping head, her hands listlessly folded in her lap. It was all true. All true. Her tone seemed the utterance of a broken heart. And I have mistrusted him, and. Oh, God, she cried out. When I think that by now he might have been strangled and with my consent. And now. And now, cut in her brother almost brutally considering the pain she was already bearing, you and that swaggering fool Carmagnola have between you driven him out and perhaps set him against us. The swaggering fool came in at that moment with inky fingers and disordered hair. The phrase that greeted him brought him to a halt on the threshold, his attitude magnificent. What's this? he asked with immense dignity. He was told, by John Giacomo, so fiercely and unsparingly that he went red and white by turns as he listened. Then, commanding himself and wrapped in his dignity as in a mantle, he came slowly forward. He even smiled condescendingly. Of all this that you tell I know nothing. It may well be as you say. It is no concern of mine. What concerns me is what has happened here, the discovery that Balerion was in correspondence with Theodore, and his avowed intention to raise this siege. Add to this that he has slipped through our hands, and is now abroad to work your ruin, and consider if you are justified in using hard words to me but for whom your ruin would already have been encompassed. His majestic air and his display of magnanimity under their reproach imposed upon all but Valeria. It was she who answered him. You are forgetting that it was only my conviction that he had been Theodore's agent aforetime which disposed me to believe him Theodore's agent now. But the letter, then? Carmagnola was showing signs of exasperation. In God's name, where is this letter? growled the deep voice of Barbaresco. Who are you to question me now? I do not know your right, sir, or even your name. The princess presented him and at the same time Casella. They are old and esteemed friends, my lord, and they are here to serve me with all the men that they can muster. Let Messer Barbaresco see this letter. Impatiently Carmagnola produced it from the scrip that hung beside his dagger from a gold-embossed girdle of crimson leather. Slowly Barbaresco spelled it out, Casella reading over his shoulder. When he had done, he looked at Carmagnola, and from Carmagnola to the others, first in sheer amazement, then in scornful mirth. Lord of heaven, Messer Carmagnola, you've the repute of a great fighter, and, to be sure, you're a fine figure of a man, also I must assume you honest. But I would sooner put my trust in your animal strength than in your wits. Sir. 
Oh, I, to be sure, you can throw out your chest and roar and strut. But use your brains for once, man. The boldly humorous red face was overspread by a sardonic grin. Master Theodore took your measure shrewdly when he thought to impose upon you with this foxy piece of buffoonery, and, my faith, if Balerion had been less nimble, this trick would have served its purpose. Nay, now don't puff and blow and swell, read the letter again. Ask yourself if it would have borne that full signature and that superscription if it had been sincere, and considering that it imparts no useful information save that Balerion was betraying you, ask yourself if it would have been written at all had anything it says been true. The very arguments that Balerion used, cried the Marquis. To which we would not listen, said the princess bitterly. Carmagnola sniffed. They are the arguments any man in his case would use. You overlook that the letter is an incentive, an undertaking to reward him suitably if he. Barbaresco broke in, exasperated by the man's grandiose stupidity. To the devil with that, numbskull. Numbskull, sir? To me. By heaven. Sirs, sirs. The princess laid her hand on Barbaresco's great arm. This is not seemly to my lord Carmagnola. I know it. I know it. I crave his pardon. But I was never taught to suffer fools gladly. I. Sir, your every word is an offence. You. Valeria calmed them. Don't you see, Messer Carmagnola, that he but uses you as a whipping boy instead of me? It is I who am the fool, the numbskull in his eyes, for these deeds are more mine than any others. But my old friend Barbaresco is too courteous to say so. Courteous, snorted Carmagnola. That is the last term I should apply to his boorishness. By what right does he come hectoring here? By the right of his old affection for me and my brother. That is what makes him hot. For my sake, then, bear with him, sir. The great man bowed, his hand upon his heart, signifying that for her sake there was no indignity he would not suffer. Thereafter he defended himself with great dignity. If the letter had been all, he might have taken Barbaresco's views. But it was, he repeated, the traitor Balerian's avowed intention to raise the siege. That, in itself, was a proof of his double dealing. How did this letter come to you? Barbaresco asked. John Giacomo answered whilst Valeria added in bitter self-reproach, and this messenger was never examined, although Balerian demanded that he should be brought before us. Do you upbraid me with that, Madonna? Carmagnola cried. He was a poor clown, who could have told us nothing. He was not examined because it would have been waste of time. Let us waste it now, said Barbaresco. To what purpose, sir? Why, to beguile our leisure. No other entertainment offers. Carmagnola contained himself under that sardonic leer. Sir, you are resolved, it seems, to try my patience. It requires all my regard and devotion for Her Highness to teach me to endure it. The messenger shall be brought. At Valeria's request not only the messenger, but the captains who had voted Valerian's death were also summoned. Carmagnola demurred at first, but bowed in the end to her stern insistence. They came, and when they were all assembled, they were told by the princess why they had been summoned as well as what she had that morning learnt from Barbaresco. Then the messenger was brought in between the guards, and it was the princess herself who questioned him. You have nothing to fear, boy she assured him gently, as he cowered in terror before her. You are required to answer truthfully. When you have done so, and unless I discover that you are lying, you shall be restored to liberty. Carmagnola, who had come to take his stand at her side, bent over her. Is that prudent, Madonna? Prudent or not, it is promised. There was in her tone an asperity that dismayed him. She addressed herself to the clown. When you were given this letter you would be given precise instructions for its delivery, were you not? Yes, magnificent Madonna. What were those instructions? I was taken to the ramparts by a knight, to join some other knights and soldiers. 
They pointed to the lines straight ahead. I was to go in that direction with the letter. If taken I was to ask for the Lord Balerion. Were you bidden to go cautiously, to conceal yourself? No, Madonna. On the contrary. My orders were to let myself be seen. I am answering truthfully, Madonna. When you were told to go straight ahead into the lines that were pointed out to you, on which side of the ramparts were you standing? On the south side, Madonna. By the southern gate. That is truth, as God hears me. The princess leaned forward, and she was not the only one to move. Were you told or did you know what soldiers occupied the section of the lines to which you were bidden? I just knew that they were soldiers of the besieging army, or the Lord Balerion's army. I am telling you the truth, Madonna. I was told to be careful to go straight, and not to wander into any other part of the line but that. Ugolino D.A. Tender made a sharp forward movement. What are you saying? The truth, the truth, cried the lad in terror. May God strike me dumb forever if I have uttered a lie. Quiet, quiet, the princess admonished him. Be sure we know when you speak the truth. Keep to it and fear nothing. Did you hear mention of any name in connection with that section of the line? Did I? He searched his mind, and his eyes brightened. I, I, I did. They spoke amongst them. They named one Calmoldola, or Carmandola. Or Carmagnola, D.A. Tender cut in, and laughed splutteringly in sheer contempt. It's clear, I think that Theodore's letter was intended for just the purpose that it served. Clear? How is it clear? Carmagnola's contempt was in the question. In everything, now that we have heard this clown, why was he sent to the southern section? Do you suppose Theodore did not know that Valsassana himself and those directly under him, of whom I was one, were quartered in Quinto, on the western side? Then his voice swelled up in anger. Why was this messenger not examined sooner, or he checked and his eyes narrowed as they fixed themselves on Carmagnola's flushed and angry face or, was he? Was he? roared Carmagnola. Now what the devil do you mean? You know what I mean, Carmagnola. You led us all within an ace of doing murder. Did you lead us so because you're a fool, or a villain? Which? Carmagnola sprang for him, roaring like a bull. The other captains got between, and the princess on her feet, commanding, imperious, added her voice sharply to theirs to restore order. They obeyed that slim, frail woman, scarcely more than a girl, as she stood there straight and tense in her wine-coloured mantle, her red-gold head so proudly held, her dark eyes burning in her white face. Captain Ugolino, that was ill said of you, she reproved him. You forget that if this messenger was not examined before, the blame for that is upon all of us. We took too much for granted and too readily against the Prince of Valsassana. It is now that you take too much for granted, answered Carmagnola. Why did Valsassana intend to raise this siege if he is honest? Answer me that. His challenge was to all. Ugolino D.A. Tender answered it. For some such reason as he had when he sent his men to hold the bridge at Carpignano while you were building bridges here. Balerion's intentions are not clear to dull eyes like yours and mine, Carmagnola. Carmagnola considered him malevolently. You and I will discuss this matter further elsewhere, he promised him. You have used expressions I am not the man to forget. It may be good for you to remember them, said the young captain, no whit intimidated. Meanwhile, Madonna, I take my leave. I march my condotta out of this camp within an hour. She looked at him in sudden distress. He answered the look. I am grieved, Madonna. But my duty is to the Prince of Valsassana. I was seduced from it by too hasty judgment. I return to it at once. He bowed low, gathered up his cloak, and went clanking out. Hold there. Carmagnola thundered after him. Before you go I've an account to settle with you. Ugolino turned on the threshold, drawn up to his full height. I'll afford you the opportunity, said he, 
but only after I have the answer to my question, whether you are a villain or a fool, and only if I find that you're a fool. The captains made a barrier which Carmagnola could not pass. Livid with anger and humiliation, his grand manner dissipated, he turned to the princess. Will your highness suffer me to go after him? He must not be permitted to depart. But she shook her red gold head. Nay, sir, I detain no man here against his inclinations, and Captain Ugolino seems justified of his. Justified, dear God, justified, he apostrophized the groined ceiling, then swung to the other four captains standing there. And you, he demanded, do you also deem yourselves justified to mutiny? Belluno was prompt to answer, but then Belluno was his own lieutenant. My lord, if there has been an error we are all in it, and have the honesty to admit it. I am glad there is still some honesty among you. And you. His angry eyes swept over the others. One by one they answered as Belluno had done. But they were men of little account, and the defection of the four of them would not have reduced the army as did Ugolino's, whose condotta amounted to close upon a thousand men. We are forgetting this poor clown, said the princess. Carmagnola looked at him as if he would with joy have wrung his neck. You may go, boy, she told him. You are free. See that he leaves unhindered. He went with his guards. The captains, dismissed, went out next. Carmagnola, his spirit badly bruised and battered, looked at the princess, who had sunk back into her chair. However it has been achieved, she said, Theodore's ends could not better have been served. What is left us now? If I might venture to advise, quoth Barbaresco, smooth as oil, I should say that you could not do better than follow Ugolino D.A. Tender's example. What? Return to your fealty to Balerian. Return? Carmagnola leaned towards him from his fine height, and his mouth gaped. Return, he repeated. And leave Vercelli? Why not? That would no more than fulfill Balerian's intention to raise the siege. He will have an alternative. I care nothing for his alternatives, and let us be clear upon this, I owe him no fealty. My fealty was sworn not to him, but to the Duchess Beatrice. And my orders from Duke Filippo Maria are to assist in the reduction of Vercelli. I know where my duty lies. It is possible, said the princess slowly, that Balerion had some other plan for bringing Theodore to his knees. He stared at her. There was pain in his handsome eyes. His face was momentarily almost convulsed. And there was little more than pain in his voice when he spoke. Oh, Madonna, into what irreparable error is your generous heart misleading you? How can you have come in a breath to place all your trust in this man whom for years you have known, as many know him, for a scheming villain? Could I do less having discovered the cruelty of my error? Are you sure, can you be sure upon such slight grounds, that you were in error? That you are not in error now? You heard what Belluno said of him on the night my bridges were destroyed, that Balerian never looks where he aims. That, sir, is what has misled me, to my present shame. Is it not rather what is misleading you now? You heard what Messer Barbaresco had to tell me. I do not need to hear Messer Barbaresco or any other. I know what I can see for myself, what my wits tell me. She looked at him almost slyly, for one normally so wide-eyed, and her answer all considered was a little cruel. Are you still unshaken in your confidence in your wits? Do you still think that you can trust them? That was the death blow to his passion for her, as it was the death blow of the high hopes he is suspected of having centred in her, seeing himself, perhaps, as the husband of the Princess Valeria of Montferrat, supreme in Montferrin court and camp. It was a sword thrust full into his vanity, which was the vital part of him. He stepped back, white to the very lips, his countenance disordered. Then, commanding himself, he bowed, and steadied his voice to answer. Madonna, I see that you have made your choice. 
My prayer will be that you may not have occasion to repent it. No doubt the troops accompanying these gentlemen of Montferrat will be your sufficient escort to Mortara, or you may join forces with Ugolino D.A. Tender's condotta. Although I shall be left with not more than half the men the enterprise demands, with these I must make shift to reduce Vercelli, as my duty is. Thus, Madonna, you may yet owe your deliverance to me. May God be with you. He bowed again. Perhaps he hoped still for some word to arrest him, some retraction of the injustice with which she used him. But it did not come. I thank you for your good intentions, my lord, she said civilly. God be with you, too. He bit his lip, then turned, and threw high that handsome golden head which he was destined to leave, some few years later, between the pillars of the Piazzetta in Venice. Thus he stalked out. All considered, it was an orderly retreat, and that was the last she ever saw of him. As the door banged, Barbaresco smacked his great thigh with his open palm and exploded into laughter. 13. The Occupation of Casole when Balerion proclaimed his intention of raising the siege of Vercelli, he had it in mind, in view of the hopelessness of being able to reduce the place reasonably soon, to draw Theodore into the open by means of that strategic movement which Thucydides had taught him, and to which he had so often already and so successfully had recourse. His Swiss, being without baggage, travelled lightly and swiftly. They left their camp before Vercelli on the night of Wednesday, and on the evening of the following Friday, Valerian brought them into the village of Pavoni, where Königshofen had established himself in Ficino's old quarters of three years ago. There they lay for the night. But whilst his weary followers rested, himself he spent the greater part of the night in the necessary dispositions for striking camp at dawn. And very early on that misty November morning he was off again with Gisone Trotter, Königshofen, and all the horse, leaving Stoffel to follow more at leisure with the foot, the baggage, and the artillery. Before nightfall he was at San Salvatore, where his army rested, and on the following Sunday morning at just about the time that Barbaresco was reaching Vercelli, Bellerian, Prince of Valsassina, was approaching the Lombard Gate into Casole, by the road along which he had fled thence years before, a nameless outcast waif whose only ambition was the study of Greek at Pavia. He had travelled by many roads since then, and after long delays he had reached Pavia, no longer as a poor nameless scholar but as a condottiero of renown, not to solicit at the university the arms of a little learning, but to command whatever he might crave of the place, holding even its prince in subjection. Greek he had not learnt, but he had learnt much else instead, though nothing that made him love his fellow man or hold the world in high regard. Therefore, he was glad to think that here he touched the end of that long journey begun five years ago along this Lombard road, the mission upon which he had set out blindly that day was, after many odd turns of fortune, all but accomplished. When it was done, he would strip off this soldier's harness, abdicate his princely honours, and return on foot humbler than when he had set out, and cured of his erstwhile heresy, to the benign and peaceful shelter of the convent at Siliano. There was no attempt to bar his entrance into the Montferrin capital. The officer commanding the place knew himself without the necessary means to oppose this force which so unexpectedly came to demand admittance. And so, the people of Casole, issuing from Mass on that Sunday morning, found the great square before Lyotprand's Cathedral and the main streets leading from it blocked by outlandish men at arms Italians, Gascons, Burgundians, Swabians, Saxons, and Swiss, whose leader proclaimed himself Captain General of the Army of the Marquis John Giacomo of Montferrat. It was a proclamation that not at all reassured them of their dread at the presence of a rapacious and violent soldiery. The Council of Ancients, summoned by Balerian's heralds, assembled in the communal palace, to hear the terms of this brigand captain as they conceived him who had swooped upon their defenceless city. He came attended by a group of officers. He was tall and soldierly of bearing, in full armour, save for his helm, which was borne after him by a page, and his escort, from the brawny, bearded Königshofen to the fierce-eyed, Ferreti Gisone, was calculated to inspire dread in peaceful citizens. But his manner was gentle, and his words were fair. 
Sirs, your city of Casole has nothing to fear from this occupation, for it is not upon its citizens that we make war, and so that they give no provocation, they will find my followers orderly. We invite your alliance with ourselves in the cause of right and justice. But if you withhold this alliance we shall not visit it against you, provided that you do not go the length of actively opposing us. The high and mighty Lord Filippo Maria Visconti, Duke of Milan, weary of the encroachments upon his dominions resulting from the turbulent ambition of your Prince Regent, the Marquis Theodore, has resolved to make an end of a regency which in itself has already become an usurpation, and to place in the authority to which his majority entitles him your rightful prince, the Marquis John Giacomo Paleologo. I invite you, sirs, to perform your duty as representatives of the people by swearing upon my hands fealty to that same Marquis John Giacomo in the cathedral at the hour of Vespers this evening. That invitation was a command, and it was punctually obeyed by men who had not the strength to resist. Meanwhile a measure of reassurance had been afforded the city by Balerion's proclamation enjoining order upon his troops. The proclamation was in no equivocal terms. It reminded the men that they were in occupation of a friendly city which they were sent to guard and defend, and that any act of pillage or violence would be punished by death. They were housed, some in the citadel, and the remainder in the fortress palace of the Montferrin princes, where Balerion himself took up his quarters. In Theodore's own closet, occupying the very chair in which Theodore had sat and so contemptuously received the unknown Balerion on that day when the young student had first entered those august walls, Balerion that night penned a letter to the Princess Valeria, wherein he gave her news of the day's events. That letter, of a calligraphy so perfect that it might be mistaken for a page from some monkish manuscript of those days, is one of the few fragments that have survived from the hand of this remarkable man who was adventurer, statesman, soldier, and humanist. Most honoured and most dear lady, he addresses her reveritissima et carissima Madonna. The exordium is all that need concern us now. Ever since at your own invitation I entered your service that evening in your garden here at Casole, where today I have again wandered reviving memories that are of the fairest in my life, that service has been my constant study. I have pursued it, by tortuous ways and by many actions appearing to have no bearing upon it, unsuspected by you when not actually mistrusted by you. That your mistrust has wounded me oftentimes and deeply, would have weighed lightly with me had I not perceived that by mistrusting you were deprived of that consolation and hope which you would have found in trusting. The facts afforded ever a justification of your mistrust. This I recognized, and that facts are stubborn things, not easily destroyed by words. Therefore I did not vainly wear myself in any endeavour to destroy them, but toiled on, so that, in the ultimate achievement of your selfless aims for your brother, the Marquis, I might prove to you without the need of words the true impulse of my every action in these past five years. The fame that came to me as a condottiero, the honours I won, and the increase of power they brought me I have never regarded as anything but weapons to be employed in this your service, as means to the achievement of your ends. But for that service accepted in this garden, my life would have been vastly different from all that it has been. No burden heavier than a scholar's would have been mine, and today I might well be back with the brethren at Siliano, an obscure member of their great brotherhood. To serve you, I have employed trickery and double-dealing until men have dubbed me a rogue, and some besides yourself have come to mistrust me, and once I went the length of doing murder. But I take no shame in any of these things, nor, most dear lady, need you take shame in that your service should have entailed them. The murder I did was the execution of a rogue, the conspiracy I scattered was one that would have made a net in which to take you, the deceits I have put upon the Marquis Theodore, chiefly when I made him serve my dear Lord Ficino's turn and seduced him into occupying Vercelli, so as subsequently to afford the Duke of Milan a sound reason for moving against him, were deceits employed against a deceiver, whom it would be idle to combat in honest fashion in his eyes more than any others, for he is not the only victim of the duplicity I have used to place you ultimately where you should be, I am a double-dealing Judas. And it is said of me, too, that in the field as in the council, I prevail by subterfuge and never by straightforward blows. But my conscience remains tranquil. It is not what a man does or says that counts, but what a man intends.
I have embraced as a part of my guiding philosophy that teaching of Plato's which discriminates between the lie on the lips and the lie in the heart. On my lips and in my actions lies have been employed. I confess it frankly. But in my heart no lie has ever been. If I have employed at times dishonest means, at least the purpose for which they have been employed has been unfalteringly, unswervingly honest, and one in the final achievement of which there can be only pride and a sense of duty done. To this if you believe it and the facts will presently constrain you to do so, unless my fortune in the field should presently desert me I need add no details of the many steps in your service. By the light of faith in me from what is written and what is presently to do, you will now read or write those details for yourself. We touch now the goal whither all these efforts have been addressed. Upon this follows his concise account of the events from the moment of his escape from Kinto, and upon that an injunction to her to come at once with her brother to Casole, depending upon the protection of his arm and the loyalty of a people which only awaits the sight of its rightful prince to be increased to enthusiasm and active support. That letter was dispatched next day to Kinto, but it did not reach her until almost a week later between Alessandria and Casole. Meanwhile early on the morrow the city was thrown into alarm by the approach of a strong body of horse. This was Ugolino D.A. Tender's condotta, and Ugolino himself rode in with a trumpeter to make renewed submission to the Lord Bellarion, and to give him news of what had happened in Quinto upon the coming of Barbaresco. Bellarion racked him with questions, as to what was said, particularly as to what the princess said and how she looked, and what passed between her and Comagnola. And when all was done, far from the stern reproaches Ugolino had been expecting he found himself embraced by a Bellarian more joyous than he had ever yet known that sardonic soldier. That gaiety of Bellarians was observed by all in the days that followed. He was a man transformed. He displayed the light-heartedness of a boy, and moved about the many tasks claiming his attention with a song on his lips, a ready laugh upon the slightest occasion and a sparkle in his great eyes that all had hitherto known so sombre. And this notwithstanding that these were busy and even anxious days of preparation for the final trial of strength. He rode abroad during the day with two or three of his officers, one of whom was always Stoffel, surveying the ground of the peninsula that lies between Caesia and Pai to the north of Casole, and at night he would labour over maps which he was preparing from his daily notes. Meanwhile he kept himself day by day informed, by means of a line of scouts which he had thrown out, of what was happening at Vercelli. With that clear prescience, which in all ages has been the gift of all great soldiers, he was able not merely to opine but quite definitely to state the course of action that Theodore would pursue. Because of this, on the Wednesday of that week, he moved Ugolino D.A. Tender and his condotta out of Casole, and transferred them bag and baggage by night so that the movement might not be detected and reported to the enemy to the woods about Trino, where they were ordered to encamp and to lie close until required. On the morning of Friday arrived at last in Casole the Marquis John Giacomo and his sister, escorted by the band of Montferrin exiles under Barbaresco and Casella, and the people turned out to welcome not only the princes, but in many cases their own relatives and friends. Bellarion, with his captains and a guard of honour of fifty lances, received the princes at the Lombard Gate, and escorted them to the palace where their apartments had been prepared. The acclamations of the people lining the streets brought tears to the eyes of the princess and a flush to the cheeks of her brother, and there were tears in her eyes when she sought Bellarion in his room to abase herself in the admission of her grievous misjudgment and to sue pardon for it. Your letter, sir, she told him, touched me more deeply than anything I can remember in all my life. Think me a fool if you must for what is past, but not an ingrate. My brother shall prove our gratitude so soon as ever it lies within his power. Madonna, I ask no proofs of it, nor need them. To serve you has not been a means, but an end, as you shall see. That vision at least does not lie in the future. I see now, and very clearly. He smiled, a little wistfully, as he bowed to kiss her hand. You shall see more clearly still, he promised her. That colloquy went no further. Stoffel broke in upon them to announce that his scouts had come galloping in from Vercelli with the news that the Lord Theodore had made a sally in force, shattering a way through Comagnola's besiegers, 
and that he was advancing on Casole with a well-equipped army computed to be between four and five thousand strong. The news had already spread about the city, and was causing amongst the people the gravest apprehension and unrest. The prospect of a siege and of the subsequent vengeance of the Lord Theodore upon the city for having harboured his enemies filled them with dread. Send out trumpeters, Balerion ordered, and let it be proclaimed in every quarter that there will be no siege, and that the army is marching out at once to meet the Marquis Theodore beyond the Po. 14. The Vanquished Theodore's sally from Vercelli had been made at daybreak on that Friday morning. It had been shrewdly planned, for Theodore was no bungler, and, before he had brought more than half his men into action, Camagnola, startled by the suddenness of the blow that fell upon him, was routed and in flight. After that, this being no more than the preliminary of the task before him, Theodore marched out every man of his following to go against Bellarion at Casole. Thus, by that ancient plan of attacking a vital point that had been left undefended, had Bellarion succeeded in drawing his enemy from a point of less importance in which he was almost impregnably entrenched. Theodore had perceived, as Bellarion had calculated that he would, that it could serve little purpose for him to hold an outpost like Vercelli if in the meantime the whole of his dominions were to be wrenched from his grasp. No sooner was he gone, however, than Camagnola, informed of his departure, rallied his broken troops, and with drums beating, trumpets blaring, and flags flying, marched like a conqueror into the now undefended city of Vercelli. For the resistance it had made, he subjected it to a cruel sack, giving his men unbounded license, and that same evening he wrote to Duke Filippo Maria in the following terms. Most potent Duke and my good lord, it is my joyous task to give your highness tidings that, informed of the reduction in our numbers resulting from the defection of the Prince of Valsassina and several other captains acting in concert with him, the Lord Theodore of Montferrat, greatly presumptuous, did today issue from Vercelli for wager of battle against us. A vigorous action was fought in the neighbourhood of Quinto, in which despite our inferior numbers we put the Marquis to flight. Lacking numbers sufficient to engage in pursuit, particularly as this would have led us into Montferrin territory, and since the reoccupation of Vercelli and its restoration to your duchy was the task with which your highness entrusted us, I marched into the city at once, and I now hold it in the name of your exalted potency. By this complete and speedy victory I hope to merit the approbation of your highness. Meanwhile Theodore's march on Casole had anything but the aspect of a flight. The great siege train he dragged along with him over the sodden and too yielding ground of that moist plain delayed his progress to such an extent that it was not until late on that November afternoon when he reached Villanova, here to receive news from his scouts that a considerable army, said to be commanded by the Prince of Valsassina, was circling northward from Terranova. The news was unexpected and brought with it some alarm. He had gone confidently and rather carelessly forward fully expecting to find the enemy shut up in Casole. Hence all the ponderous siege train which had so hampered his progress. That Bellarion, forsaking the advantage of Casole's stout walls, should come out to meet him and engage him in the open was something beyond his dreams, and but for the unexpectedness of it, he would have rejoiced in such a decision on the part of his redoubtable opponent. It was in that unexpectedness, as usual, that lay Bellarion's advantage. Theodore, compelled now to act in haste, not knowing at what moment the enemy might be upon him, made dispositions to which it was impossible to give that thought which the importance of the issues demanded. The first of these was to order the men, who were preparing to encamp for the night, to be up again and to push on and out of this village before they found themselves hemmed into it. That circling movement reported suggested this danger to Theodore. They came out in rather straggling order to be marshalled even as they marched. Theodore's aim, and it was shrewd enough, was to reach the broad causeway of solid land between Corno and Popolo, where marshlands on either side would secure his flanks and compel the enemy to engage him on a narrow front. What was to follow he had not yet had time to consider. But if he could reach that objective, he would be secure for the present, and he could rest his men in the two hamlets on the marshes. But a mile beyond Villanova, Bellarion was upon his left flank and rear. He had little warning of it before the enemy was charging him. But it was warning enough. He threw out his line in a crescent formation, 
using his infantry in a manner which merited Balerion's entire approval, and obviously intent upon fighting a rearguard battle whilst bringing his army to the coveted position. But the infantry were not equal to their commander, and they were insufficiently trained in these tactics. Some horses were piked, but almost every horse piked meant an opening in the human wall that opposed the charge, and through these openings Jasone Trotter's heavy riders broke in, swinging their ponderous maces. From a rearguard action on Theodore's part, the thing grew rapidly to the proportions of a general engagement, and for this Theodore could not have been placed worse than he was with his left, now that he had swung about, upon the quaking boglands of Del Mazo and his back to the broad waters of the Po. He swung his troops farther round, so as to bring his rear upon the only possible line of retreat, which was that broad firm land between Corno and Populo. At last his skillful manoeuvres achieved the desired result, and then, very gradually, fighting every inch of the ground, he began to fall back. At every yard now the front must grow narrower, and unless Balerion's captains were very sure of their ground, some of them would presently be in trouble in the bogs on either side. If this did not happen, they would soon find it impossible, save at great cost and without perceptible progress, to continue the engagement, and with night approaching they would be constrained to draw off. Theodore smiled darkly to himself in satisfaction, and took heart, well pleased with his clever tactics by which he had extricated himself from a dangerous situation. He had won a breathing space that should enable him to marshal his men so as to deal with this rash enemy who came to seek him in the open. And then suddenly, a quarter mile away, from the direction of Corno, towards which they were so steadily falling back, came a pounding of hooves that swelled swiftly into a noise of thunder, and, before any measures could be taken to meet this new menace, Ugolino D.A. Tender's horse was upon Theodore's rear. Ugolino had handled his condotta well, and strictly in accordance with his orders from Balerion. From Balzola, whither he had been moved at noon so as to be in readiness, he had made a leisurely and cautious advance, filing his horse along the very edge of the bogland so that their hooves should give no warning of their approach. Thus until he had won within striking distance. And the blow he now struck, heavy and unexpected, crumpled up Theodore's rear, clove through, driving his men right and left to sink to their waists in the marshes, and scattered such fear and confusion in those ahead that their formation went to pieces, and gaped to Balerion's renewed frontal attacks. Less than three hours that engagement lasted, and of all those who had taken the field with Theodore, saving perhaps a thousand who fled helter-skelter towards Trino after Ugolino's passage, there was not a survivor who had not yielded. Stripped of their arms and deprived of their horses, they were turned adrift, to go whithersoever they listed so long as it was outside of Montferrat territory. The maimed and wounded of Theodore's army were conveyed by their fellows into the villages of Villanova, Terranova, and Grassi. It was towards the third hour of that November night when the triumphant army, returning from that stricken field, re-entered Casole, lighted by the bonfires that blazed in the streets, whilst the bells of Lyotpran's cathedral crashed out their peals of victory. Deliriously did the populace acclaim Balerion, prince of Valsassana, in its enormous relief at being saved the hardships of a siege and delivered from the possible vengeance of Theodore for having opened its gates to Theodore's enemies. Theodore, on foot, marched proudly at the head of a little band of captives of rank, who had been retained by their captors for the sake of the ransoms they could pay. The jostling, pushing crowd hooted and execrated and mocked him in his hour of humiliation. White-faced, his head held high, he passed on apparently unmoved by that expression of human baseness, knowing in his heart that, if he had proved master, the acclamations now raised for his conqueror would have been raised for him by the very lips that now execrated him. He was conducted to the palace, to the very room whence for so many years he had ruled the state of Montferrat, and there he found his nephew and niece awaiting him when he was brought in between Ugolino D.A. Tender and Gisone Trotter. Bareheaded, stripped of his armour, his tall figure bowed, he stood like a criminal before them whilst they remained seated on either side of the writing table that once had been his own. From the seat whence he had dispensed justice was justice now to be dispensed to him by his nephew. You know your offence, my lord, John Giacomo greeted him, a cold, dignified, and virile John Giacomo, 
in whom it was hardly possible to recognize the boy whom he had sought to ruin in body and in soul. You know how you have been false to the trust reposed in you by my father, to whom God give peace. Have you anything to say in extenuation? He parted his lips, then stood there opening and closing his hands before he could sufficiently control himself to answer. In the hour of defeat, what can I do but cast myself upon your mercy? Are we to pity you in defeat? Are we to forget in what you have been defeated? I ask not that. I am in your hands, a captive, helpless. I do not claim mercy. I may not deserve it. I hope for it. That is all. They considered him, and found him a broken man, indeed. It is not for me to judge you, said John Giacomo, and I am glad to be relieved of that responsibility. For though you may have forgotten that I am of your blood, I cannot forget that you are of mine. Where is His Highness of Valsassana? Theodore fell back a pace. Will you set me at the mercy of that dastard? The Princess Valeria looked at him coldly. He has won many titles since the day when to fight a villainy he pretended to become your spy. But the title you have just conferred upon him, coming from your lips, is the highest he has yet received. To be a dastard in the sight of a dastard is to be honorable in the sight of all upright men. Theodore's white face writhed into a smile of malice. But he answered nothing in the little pause that followed before the door opened upon Balerion. He came in supported by two of his Swiss, and closely followed by Stoffel. His armor had been removed, and the right sleeve of his leather hackton, as of the silken tunic and shirt beneath, had been ripped up, and now hung empty at his side, whilst his breast bulged where his arm was strapped to his body. He was very pale and obviously weak and in pain. Valeria came to her feet at sight of him thus, and her face was whiter than his own. You are wounded, my lord. He smiled, rather whimsically. It sometimes happens when men go to battle. But I think my lord Theodore here has taken the deeper hurt. Stoffel pushed forward a chair, and the Swiss carefully lowered Balerion to it. He sighed in relief, and leaned forward so as to avoid contact with the back. One of your knights, my lord, broke my shoulder in the last charge. I would he had broken your neck. That was the intention. Balerion's pale lips smiled. But I am known as Balerion the Fortunate. Just now my lord had another name for you, said Valeria, and Balerion, observing the set of her lips and the scorn in her glance as it flickered over Theodore, marvelled at the power of hate in one naturally so gracious. He had had a taste of it, himself, he remembered, and perhaps she was but passing on to Theodore what rightly had belonged to him throughout. He is a rash man, she continued, who will not trouble to conciliate the arbiter of his fate. My lord Theodore has lost his guile, I think, together with the rest. Aye, said Balerion, we have stripped him of all save his life. Even his mask of benignity is gone. You are noble, said Theodore. You gird at a captive. Am I to remain here to be mocked? Not for me, Faith, Balerion answered him. I have never contemplated you with any pleasure. Take him away, Ugolino. Place him securely under guard. He shall have judgment tomorrow. Dog, said Theodore with venom, as he drew himself up to depart. That's my device, as yours is the stag. Appropriate, all things considered. I had you in my mind when I adopted it. I am punished for my weakness, said Theodore. I should have left justice to wring your neck when you were its prisoner here in Casole. I'll repay the debt, Balerion answered him. Your own neck shall remain unwrung so that you withdraw to your principality of Genoa and abide there. More of that tomorrow. Peremptorily he waved him away and Ugolino hustled him out. As the door closed again, Balerion, relaxing the reins of his will, sank forward in a swoon. 15. The last fight. When he recovered, he was lying on his sound side on a couch under the window, across which the curtains of painted and gilded leather had been drawn. An elderly, bearded man in black was observing him, 
and someone whom he could not see was bathing his brow with a cool aromatic liquid. As he fetched a sigh that filled his lungs and quickened his senses into full consciousness, the man smiled. There, it will be well with him now, but he should be put to bed. It shall be done, said the woman who was bathing his brow, and her voice, soft and subdued, was the voice of the Princess Valeria. His servants will be below by now. Send them to me as you go. The man bowed and went out. Slowly Balerion turned his head, and looked up in wonder at the princess with whom he was now alone. Her eyes, more liquid than their wont, smiled wistfully down upon him. Madonna, he exclaimed. Do you serve me as a handmaid? That is not. You are thinking it an insufficient return for your service to me. But you must give me time, sir, this is only a beginning. I am not thinking that at all. Then you are not thinking as you should. You are weak. Your wits work slowly. Else you might remember that for five years, in which you have been my loyal, noble, unswerving friend, I, immured in my stupidity, have been your enemy. Ah, he smiled. I knew I should convince you in the end. Such knowledge gives us patience. A man may contain his soul for anything that is assured. It is the doubtful only that makes him fret and fume. And you never doubted, she asked him, wondering. I am too sure of myself, he answered. And God knows you have cause to be, more cause than any man of whom ever I heard tell. Do you know, Lord Prince, that in these five years there is no evil I have not believed of you? I even deemed you a coward, on the word of that vain boaster Carmagnola. He was none so wrong, by his own lights. I am not a fighter of his pattern. I have ever been careful of myself. Your condition now proves that. Oh, this, today, that was different. Too much depended on the issue. It was the last throw. I had to take a hand, much though I dislike a rough and tumble. So that we won through, it would not much have mattered if the vamplate of that fellow's lance had brought up against my throat. There are no more fights for me, so what matter if I left my life in the last one? The last one, Lord Prince. And that is not my title any more. I am a prince no longer. I leave the rank behind with all the other vanities of the world. You leave it behind? She found him obscure. When I go back to Siliano, which will be as soon as I can move. What do you go to do at Siliano? What? Why, what the other brethren do? Pax Malta in Sella. The old abbot was right. There is yonder a peace for which I am craving now that my one task here is safely ended. In the world there is nothing for me. Nothing. She was amazed. And in five years you have won so much. Nothing that I covet, he answered gently. It is all vanity, all madness, greed, and bloodlust. I was not made for worldliness, and but for you I should never have known it. Now I have done. And your dominions, Garvey and Valsassana? I'll bestow them upon you, Madonna, if you will deign to accept a parting gift from these hands. There was a long pause. She had drawn back a little. He could not see her face. You have the fever, I think, she said presently in an odd voice. It is your hurt. He sighed. Aye, you would think so. It is difficult for one reared in the world to understand that a man's eyes should remain undazzled by its glitter. Yet, believe me, I leave it with but one regret. And that. The question came breathlessly upon a whisper. That the purpose for which I entered it remains unfulfilled. That I have learnt no Greek. Again there was a pause. Then she moved forward, rustling a little, and came directly into his line of vision. I hear your servants, I think. I will leave you now. I thank you, Madonna. God be with you. But she did not go. She stood there between himself and the fireplace, slight and straight as on the first evening when he had seen her in her garden. She was dressed in a close-fitting gown of cloth of silver. He observed in particular now the tight sleeves which descended to the knuckles of her slim, tapering hands, 
and remembered that just such sleeves had she worn when first his eyes beheld her. Over this gown she wore a loose hoopland of sapphire velvet, reversed at throat and wide gaping sleeves with ermine, and there were sapphires in the silver caul that confined her abundant red-gold hair. Aye, he said wistfully, dreamily, it was just so you looked, and just so will I remember you as long as I remember anything. It is good to have served you, lady mine. It has made me glorious in my own eyes. You have made yourself glorious, Lord Prince, in the eyes of all. What do they matter? Slowly she came back to him. She was very pale and a little frown was puckering her fine brows. Very wistful and mysterious as deep pools were those dark eyes of hers. She came back, drawn by the words he had used, and more than the words, by something odd in his gently musing tone. Do I matter nothing, Balerion? He smiled with an infinite sadness. Must you ask that now? Does not the whole of my life in the world give you the answer, that never woman mattered more to a man? I have known no service but yours. And I have served you, Pafaz at Nefers. She stood above him, and her lips quivered. What she said when at last she spoke had no apparent bearing upon the subject. I am wearing your colours, Balerion. Surprise flickered in his eyes, as they sought confirmation of her statement in the azure and argent of her wear. And I did not remark the chance, he cried. Not chance. It is design. It was sweetly and generously courteous so to honour me. It was not only to honour you that I assumed these colours. Have they no message for you, Balerion? Message. For the first time in their acquaintance she saw fear in his bold eyes. Clearly they have not, no message that you look for. You have said that you covet nothing in this world. Nothing within my reach. To covet things beyond it is to taste the full bitterness of life. Is there anything in the world that is not within your reach, Balerion? He looked at her as she smiled down upon him through her tears. He caught his breath gaspingly. With his sound left hand he clutched her left which hung at the level of his head. I am mad, of course, he choked. Not mad, Balerion. Only stupid. Do you still covet nothing? Aye, one thing. His face glowed. One thing that would change into a living glory the tinsel glitter of the world, one thing that would make life. Oh God, what am I saying? Why do you break off, Balerion? I am afraid. Of me. Is there anything I could deny you, who have given all to serve me? Must I in return offer you all I have? Can you claim nothing for yourself? Valeria. She stooped to kiss his lips. My very hate of you in all these years was love dissembled. Because my spirit leapt to yours, almost from that first evening in the garden there, did it so wound and torture me to discover baseness in you. I should have trusted my own heart, rather than my erring senses, Valerian. You warned me early that I am not good at inference. I have suffered as those suffer who are in rebellion against themselves. He pondered her, very pale and sorrowful. Yes, he said slowly, I have the fever, as you said a while ago. It must be that. The end.